I'm going to choose my sister, I think I would make some curse with her. That's when I first met Brother Carl, and I was so impressed. A young person who knows so much about our history and who said it in a way of understanding. Okay? And he's known far and wide, coast to coast, in and out of the country. And he belongs to us. Isn't that wonderful? He belongs to us. So, uh, Brother Cobble, uh, you and your family know that I have a habit of bragging about people I know. All right, I make them blood relatives of mine. So, uh, the people, when he used to come to your college to speak, I said, This is our brother Cobble. And as soon as they see your blood brother, said, Yeah, you're the same person, right? yeah. So, I want you to welcome our uh, educator and resident, someone who loves our children, who loves to teach. in this century. Because before this century is over, things are going to change. I can feel it. Can you feel it? And I know that we face daunting challenges. I know that we're looking at it constantly. But if you study your history, you know that we have overcome even greater challenges than this. Yeah, yeah. And I often reflect back on our ancestors when I'm wondering how I'm going to get the strength. Yeah. I always call on our sister Harry. She's my hero. Yeah. I just call on sister Harry and I say that whatever spirit got into you, just the second trip, forget about all the 19 trips, just the second trip, after you were free and everything was all right, to come back down and to do it again. Whatever that spirit was that made you do it two times, just give me a piece of that. But then to think she did it a third, a fourth, a fifth, I am ashamed to talk about rough times. But that's real. If she could do what she did, I have no right to talk about what we're facing. I think of uh, R. Kelly's song, I Believe I Can Fly. And I often tell the story to young people in particular, but us in general. Because put aside that it was a soundtrack for a movie called Space Jam. Put that aside and just listen to those words and realize that back in the 90s, I had the opportunity to be a part of a rite of passage program at Rikers Island. And there was a brother Part of the program was a song. The brother stood up and he sang a song, and he didn't sound like R. Kelly, I'll tell you that. He had a very sad, moaning, droning voice. 
But for the first time, because of the, the quality and the content and the character of his voice, it gave me a chance to listen to those words from a different perspective. And since I was sitting in the chapel in Rikers Island, looking out at high school students, because you know the board of ed has a school in Rikers Island, yeah. I was able to set myself back in time to a plantation. And to picture those words being sung by African people, male and female, on a plantation. And I encourage you, the first thing that you do, if you get the opportunity tonight or tomorrow, listen to the song, listen to the words, but listen to it as a, an anthem that was sung by our people on the plantations of not just the United States, but of the Caribbean, of Central and South America. And you'll get a totally new meaning for those words. But I tell you this story because in the song, he talks about what he believes he can do. He believes he can fly. You know, black folk believe they can fly. In fact, listen. Oh, well, that's a whole other time I'm going to come down and talk to you about that. But the idea is, is that when they talked about what they envisioned as their greatest dream, we are that dream. We are the walking, living image of what they said they could become if just given a chance to fly. And so in connection with what we said earlier, and what Reverend Oliver has informed us, and what our sister Cody has told us is about to come. Looking at Harriet Tubman and understanding that the Freedom Retreat will begin this week and for the month of July. Studying our history, because you know, I've often believed that historians, you know, the funny thing about psychics, everybody go to psychics to get information. And they have prophets that they believe are psychics. But the reality is, is that a, a, a prophet is not a psychic. A prophet is just a good historian. Because if you know what has happened in the past, you can interpret your future. If you can understand your past, you can understand why your present is what it is. Because nothing happens in a vacuum. Nothing happens as if steps are jumped. Everything is led up to by the step just before what happened. And so prophets, in understanding the past, can interpret the present and project and foretell the future. And so while we think that they are pulling in this information from a cosmic reality, which is the second presentation I got to come back and talk to you about, they are really just good historians. So probably we as a people in studying our history, being denied our history, has made us get deeper into our history as Arturo Schomburg said, when he was told that he was told in Puerto Rico that his people did not come from anything, he made it his business to find out exactly what they had done. And in doing so, he uncovered chem mystery, as Dr. Evo teaches us. Chem mystery, black mystery, black magic. And so living amongst us, we have had some of the greatest prophets that have ever walked the planet. And I can go through a whole litany of names, and I'm sure that our libations do this, but we honor Professor John Henry Clark for being a great prophet. We honor our sister, a name whom we do not call that frequently, but should be up there with them all. Our sister, Dr. Sharshi Charlotte McIntyre. Yeah. You should understand and, un and understand that one of our greatest prophets was none of four, also known as Dr. Asa G. Hilliard the Third. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had our Dr. Benjamins. And again, I could go through all the names, living and those that walk amongst us today, as some of the greatest prophets that have ever walked this planet. But not just that, each and every one of us who comes here this evening is a prophet 
because you understand your past and that's why you're here this evening in order to prepare for your future. And to prepare for our children a better way. Because they deserve the best, even if they don't see themselves as the best. And I try not to talk about superiority and inferiority because I do believe that it's the content of your character that makes you who you are. But when an individual, no matter what their cultural background may be, is held down, and everything they attempt to do, they are held down. Yet despite and in spite of that being held down mentally, physically, and spiritually, and still they rise. For those who did not have to go through that, they are superior. By the nature of their experience, they are superior. Not because they are born superior, but because they became superior. And as an African people, I'm sure our parents, I know my parents told me, to be equal you must be superior. If your teacher gives you five math problems, you do ten. If she gives you one chapter, you do two. But whatever you do, you do more than what's expected because when all is said and done, they're only, they only going to test you on what they expected you to do. So brothers and sisters, we come here this evening to talk about us as a people. We are a great people. And I respect our faith systems. But if we don't get to the bottom line of the fact that if in fact, as Sister said, we are born in the image of him and her. But I can't deal with that male God thing, I'm sorry. I have cognitive dissonance on that. that you, know, you know, that's in shivers of my, of my spine to ever think that we would say that God created us in his image and yet the most of the world is female. I just have a problem with that from a fundamental perspective and I'm very comfortable in my maleness to understand the power of the female. And if I can take it one step further, I stand in front of you as an individual who is half man and half woman. And so when I celebrate Women's History Month, I'm not celebrating the women in my life, I'm celebrating the woman within. And I'm comfortable to say something like that. I have no problem saying it. Because I understand what I mean when I say it. And we have to understand this as a principle because each and every one of us, to complete this thought, each and every one of us from an African perspective is in fact God having a human experience. We are God. So don't look for God out there. Don't even look for God in here. If you want to see God, go to your mirror and say hello to your God. And the measure of our life is when we look to each other and how we treat each other. Because how I treat another individual, no matter in what station in life, I am in fact treating God. No matter what station in life. And as I look at God's creations, from the ants to the elephants, how I treat that animal is how I treat God on earth. As I look at plants, how I view that plant is how I view God's presence on this earth. And as an African person, in the research I've done, as much more as I have to do, what I have come to realize is that our people are very comfortable with who they are, for the most part, if they're conscious. Not only conscious, but you must be conscious of your consciousness. You must be able to not only know, but know that you know. And then act from that principle. And brothers and sisters, we are all learning. By matter of degree, we're all learning. And that's the, the wonderful thing about education is that the more you learn, the more you learn how much more there is to learn. And so I'm very comfortable with knowing that. But in many ways, brothers and sisters, 
the great majority of us do not realize exactly who we are as a people and where we are. And why what is happening to us is happening to us. Because my mother used to always say to me, God bless the person that can view the world from someone else's perspective. As opposed to always staying within and talking about what you are perceiving. Step out and look at you from someone else's perspective. And view you from someone else's perspective. That's a great deal of power. And as I view peoples of European descent, I don't blame them for doing what they're doing. Because I would do it to us if I were them. I would never let us do what we're going to do soon. My only thing is I wonder why they just didn't kill us all right after 1865. Because if I were them, I would have just lined us all up. And that would have been the basis of inventing the cannon. The Samoas, all of that. If I thought like them. If you read Bobby E. Wright's work, The Racial Behavior of Psychopath. If you read Joy Degree Leary's work, Post Traumatic Disorder. If you read the work of Edwin Nichols and his axiology and his, per his perceptions of life, it allows you to have the, the personal ammunition to go out here and understand why you are experiencing what you're experiencing. It'll help you understand why you're on a train reading a book where everybody got to know what's that about. But they can't imagine you read it. And forget about what you read. This is a reality. Come on, brothers, get on an elevator. With people outside of your own culture on the elevator, and somewhere on the ride, go like this. And see what will happen. They will make new doors and pathways onto the floor, even if there was no floor there. Brothers, think about what I'm saying. I'm sorry. The natural fear that they have. So when you're walking, and when I work with our young people, I try to get them to understand they don't hate us. They fear us because they so admire us. And as Francis Quest Wilson says, they wish they were us because we have a chemical substance that is not taught in education and yet is the foundations of organic life. Talk about melanin. The foundations of life is not taught. When we're in our schools and we're learning biology and they do not teach you the function of melanin as a molecule, the melanocyte as a cell, you melanin in the body, neuromelanin in the brain is equivalent to teaching somebody car mechanics and never teaching them the role of gasoline. That is what makes the car run. You can build your car, you can fix the car, but if you don't know what gasoline does in the car, what's the purpose of the car? And that's the role of melanin. Brothers and sisters, we don't know who we are. As Sister Cody spoke of those that will lay in the sun, they will lay in the sun and they lay in things that look like caskets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Knowing full well that if you stay in there long enough, you're going to get melanoma. Yeah. They will risk their lives to look like us. Yeah. They will risk their lives. Many African American peoples, when you study the psychology of well melanated people as to why they will carve up their nose and bleach their face and, and do things to their bodies to look other than themselves, it is because they want a particular station in life. They want to be treated a certain way, and they've been taught if you look a certain way, you will get something out of life. We don't do it because we're not happy with ourselves. We do it, but we're not happy with the way in which our lives are going because of the nature of what they've taught us about the characteristics of being the original human being. They, in turn, when they are getting larger parts of bodies and cutting up their faces and their bodies, and when the peoples in the Elizabethan period 
used to put on one of them corsets and yeah. have somebody get behind them yeah. and just put their foot in their back and pull it back yeah. and almost choke to death. They did it because they wanted to look like it. Yeah. They wanted it to flare out, flare up, flare over, to look like you. Because it would be only natural that since we were the first human beings on the planet for millions of years, that we would in fact be in the image of God. But God made a mistake by going north of the 51st parallel and getting caught in what we call the fourth ice age or the Wormian ice age. That is where the story of the prodigal son comes from. Leaving the Garden of Eden yeah. with all the riches that you had to venture into another land only to find out to really find yourself you just had to come on home. And when you think of coming home, I think of F. Uh, uh, um, L. Frank Baum's story of The Wizard of Oz, which I teach as a psychological dimension of the human being. He was a brilliant man, he was a white supremacist. But that story is dynamically psychological when you stop and think about it. When you think of the African traditions of the Osarian drama and those things that we seek in life. Because what really are you looking for in life? You're looking for intellect. Intellect, knowledge, wisdom represented by Ma'at and Tehuti. You're looking for a heart represented by Ma'at. You're looking for courage represented by the Jed column. Lots of hair. And the bottom line is, life is celebrated when you go home. And that's all Dorothy wanted to do was to go home. And yet she's thrown into this horrific cataclysm that sends her in her house reeling through space. She ends up in this land where she hears these little voices. These little voices in our head. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the path of Ma. And where are you going? To Emerald City, the land of Saul, the green land. And there you'll find the whiz. She goes and she on the road, she want to go home. She got those special shoes on that keeps her walking. Because she's killed one of the witches. And on the way, the first thing she comes upon is a scarecrow. A scarecrow that is meant, because it's not the scarecrow that's stupid, it's the crow that thinks the scarecrow is real that's stupid. <laughs> So it's not the person that's stupid, it's the people that perceive you as being stupid. All he wants is a brain. He said, well, I want to go home. If the whiz can help me go home, I'm sure the whiz can give you a brain. And then they follow the yellow brick road, the path of ma'at, righteousness, justice, reciprocity. And who do they come upon? The Tin Man. Or Nipsey Russell. Yeah. That's the yeah. And they meet this Tin Man, and the Tin Man, all he wants is a heart. He wants to be able to feel. He wants to be able to feel, because he can't feel because he's made of tin. Scarecrow can get me home, can get you a brain, I'm sure, that Wiz can give you a heart. Follow the yellow brick road. Come upon. The lion. The lion wants courage. Now, we know that courage is symbolized by the lion. Mm -hmm. Courage, power, majesty, royalty. He wants courage. Because they found him out when the dog jumped on his case. <laughs> Not too much courage there, but he's supposed to be afraid. He's afraid of a little dog named Total. The Total. So we're going to get back to Total down the road. We're going to find out why that little dog had the answer to the whole problem. Little black dog, too, right? 
<laughs> so everything happens. They get to the uh, uh, to the uh, castle, and the whiz comes across as this majestic symbol on the wall. Can't see him. Just an image. Just an illusion. They all get scared. First one out the door is the lion. Everybody else follows. <laughs> But the bottom line comes is that he's supposed, to, she is supposed to be able to get the other witches, uh, she's supposed to kill the witch, and the only way to prove that you killed the witch is to take a broom. Her shoes that help her walk, her broom that helps her fly, is what you can do in order to go home, get a brain, get a heart, get your courage. Now, you know, my first question to the whiz was, well, if you whiz, you should be able to do all this yourself. Why you need us, who lost, don't have no sense, don't have a heart, don't have no courage. Why are you dependent on us to defeat the one person standing in your way to being the Fuhrer of Oz? Not the Wizard of Oz, because he was after being the Fuhrer of Oz. Long story short, they get the broom, they go back, and his total. Here come the Wiz projecting himself as this big illusion on the wall. And here's Toby, the little black dog. Little black. Little black. Little black. Little black. Well, pull the curtain back, and everybody sees what's supposed to be a huge, magnificent person as a little bitty man by the name of Richard Pryor. A comedian. Jokester. The Wiz goes about explaining to the individuals. Well, Scarecrow, you would have wanted to devise the plan so you have a brain. Automatically, he starts doing all these mathematical calculations in his head. He tells the Tin Man, you were the one that was willing to give your life out so you had a heart. And Lion, you were the one that defended everybody at the end so you always had courage. So they get into this hot air balloon. Hot air is a very special symbol, particularly with this fewer of Oz inside who's about to come up, and all of a sudden, Dorothy neglects to get in. They're going back to Kansas. Land of Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> they miss it, though. And she crying, now out of the heavens comes Lena Horne. And what does she do? She sings a song. Believe in yourself. Dorothy. All you have to do is click your heels three times and say, I want to go home, and you have been home. Isn't this what we're telling our brothers and sisters out on the block all the time? They're telling you you're illiterate in school, yet you have devised the number one economical system in the world known as rap music. You have invented it, selling your cassette tapes out of the back of your cars on 174th Street and Weeks Avenue in the Bronx, or phrases to our brother, Africa Mumbai. Yes. Right. And to Kuhn Hurt. And to Pee Wee Reese. Grandmaster Plan. Melly Mel. This is the origins of rap. We try to talk to our young people about this. See, this is not rap music. Rap music ended in 1985. Gangster and sex rap started from 1985 to 2005. What we're dealing right now is chaos. Waiting for order. Because I'm not far from my son, who is 14 years old, who got this album, Jim Jones, Paul Mouth. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Lil Wayne, making much money but don't have sense enough not to have drugs, guns, and a license that don't work in his car while he drives. <laughs> he making all this money, but he driving with a gun and drugs. You know, Arthur Maddox often says the difference between a smart criminal and a stupid criminal is stupid criminals get caught. So I'm not advertising anybody to be a smart criminal. I'm just saying if you're going to be a criminal, be smart. <laughs> So we are people living in the land of Oz, looking for a brain, hoping for a heart, and trying to have courage, and all we want to do is go home. We are walking geniuses 
with hearts of gold and courage that cannot be beat, and we're already walking in our house that we call the planet Earth. Yet, we are not conscious of this consciousness. And this is something we must start a curriculum for our children. And that's what I've come to talk to you about. Because this curriculum is extremely real. And none of this curriculum is new. It's been here. Carter G. Woodson talked to us about it. You can even go back to Martin Delaney. He talked to us about it. That brother was dropping facts on melanin. We know this. We've had brothers who have come to us constantly and consistently. And if you want to know a brother that was absolutely genius, that people flocked to Harlem in the early 1900s just to stand on the corner and listening to this brilliant brother, just study the life of Hubert Harrison. Hubert Harrison, probably a name that many of us don't speak of yet, this brother was one of the phenomenal philosophers of the world. Not just black folk came to hear him, white folk came to hear him. He was a genius. Earlier speaking of Charles Drew, Jan Messinger, all of our brothers and sisters who have come before us, we have to understand this, we're already home, this curriculum is already here. What's not making it happen is that we are in the land of Oz listening to the Fuhrer of Oz, telling us who we are and what we are, and not realizing that once you shut that voice and start to listen to your ancestors that are housed in your body, going back to the origins of humanity, you carry the DNA structure of every one of your past ancestors from the origins of life in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania yes. to this very day. Not just your grandparents and your great grandparents. You have the DNA structure of the original human being. And the original human being was called into being, if, if, if you want to get into certain amino acids, because this is where people teach us about the ACGT, agonine, right, guanine, cytosine, and well, cytosine and the T is thymine, thymine, the T, ACGT. That is the voice of God. That's what organized all this on Earth. This is chemistry. This is why we need to understand chemistry. We need to understand biochemistry, biology, chemistry. Our young people sitting in their classrooms have to understand biology, chemistry, and physics as it applies to our eyes. I have no problem looking at the world through European eyes. If you're European. It's not your business. But I, as an African, have a right, not a man-given right, but a God-given right, to find the God within me. And I can only do that if I look at the God through my own eyes, realizing that I am that God, having this human experience. And as educators, as parents, when we're sitting in these classrooms, we have to come into the classroom with this knowledge and then begin to facilitate a learning experience in that classroom that our children can understand who they are in this world, where they are in this world, and how in the world did you get it? But also, where in the world do you have to go? And what in the world were you divinely destined to do? You cannot do this as long as white supremacy reigns supreme on this planet. So you must murder white intellectual superiority. Come on, understand what I'm saying? Because I'm not talking about any human murder. I'm talking about intellectual murder because Nana before tells us miseducation is invisible mental violence. He called it menticide. We are murdering our minds in our classrooms. 
we are taking away our ability to see ourselves. We have to understand that the principles of melanin tell us that according to Glosius law, but according to natural law, for life to come into existence as it did on the planet, it would have to have come in a hot climate. In a hot climate, the reaction of the sun to the carbon atom is what kicks into being what we consider to be the process of melanation. Carbon. Carbon is one of four major atoms in our world. Sulfur is important too, but the major ones basically oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. But John G. Jackson, in Introduction to Civilization, teaches us that you can only put no more than four of these together in order to create something. You can put two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, have H2O, have water. You can put two parts hydrogen, two parts oxygen together, you have hydrogen peroxide. But you can't put no more than four of those together in order to make something happen. Once you introduce carbon, carbon is a sticky atom. It is a magical atom, it is black magic, it is, it is the foundations of chem, mystery, that allow you and allow the world to develop the millions upon millions of molecules that exist because carbon is what brings millions of atoms and elements together in order to create the many millions of molecules that we have. Carbon is so bad, it can bind with itself. Carbon, if extracted, is a black substance taken from the cosmic universe that is black. Stars come from, according to Dr. Richard King, what he calls nanodiamonds. Nanodiamonds in the cosmos is the coming together, the forcing together down into one deep, strong, hard, heavy, black magic that explodes and creates a star. That same concept happens on Earth when you take carbon and you crush it down, put it under pressure, and it explodes crystallizes and becomes a diamond. For human beings, you take a human being, black in nature, put it under pressure, and it will explode into an African American. The star, the masterpiece of the cosmic reality. Now I'm not saying this to make us feel that we're more than we really are, I'm saying it because if you are conscious of your consciousness, if you know who you are, the sky is not the limit. You can go beyond all things ever imagined if you just can imagine yourself as God having a human experience. But as long as you're kneeling down, or standing up, or doing anything that is worshiping the greatest thing than yourself, outside of yourself, you will never know yourself, because how can you look for God where God is not, because God is in you. You are God. And how then could you understand God in the universe if you don't see that how you treat other people is how you treat God? How you treat the least of people? is how you treat God. Even if you pass the brother or sister on the street who may not have much asking you for something, even if you don't have much and don't have anything to give them, you can at least say, have a nice day. Can't help you today, because I need some help myself. But if ever I get a little something and I pass you away again, I'll drop it to you. But have a nice day. Because even if I don't have something to give you physically, I can at least give you the word. We must understand that humanity was born, nurtured, and raised, cultured, civilized, educated in Africa, and as Dr. Clark taught us, after Africans got their show together, 
Then they took it on the road. And because of the climate, as they traveled north of the Hapi, or the Nile River, they began to create civilizations that if you do not have it, I encourage you, get the DVD on Nubia, that is the Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. That's a very good DVD. Get that DVD. Because one of the missing links in understanding Kemet or Egypt is the fact that we don't quite understand Kush, Meroe, Napata. Because when you don't see the missing link, you skip, and then you can believe that people from outer space came down and built the pyramid. Because when you don't believe in yourself, you can fall for something. And so Africans traveled through the countries that we today would call Kenya, traveling north into Ethiopia, that we call it geographically Ethiopia, going through Ethiopia to Sudan, Somalia, Djibouti, Eritrea. And in Kemet, these Africans found a unique climate that allowed them to build forever. Very dry. The Sahara had already begun to become a desert, and they found it that they could build. And these Africans looked at the heavens and understood that they could chart the earth by the heavens. So sisters, who invented mathematics, brothers didn't do it, sisters did it. All praise to our sisters, because necessity is the mother of invention, and there's no reason why a man needs to count. There's no natural reason for a man to count. For women, who are going through a natural cycle of life, it demands on them eventually that they prepare for this cycle and in so doing begin the concept of counting, which is the beginning of numbers, which is the beginning of mathematics, which is numbers. It's called number sense in the Board of Education. Makes sense. Makes sense. Because nature, if you ever have a question about anything, just look to nature. You get sick, don't feel good, look at a dog. Dog don't go to the doctor. You may bring him to the vet, but the doctor don't say, yo man, I'm not feeling good. Can you take him to the doctor? Doctor, eat grass, drink water, and rest. Gets better. We, we go out, take all this medicine, get sicker, sometimes die, and we say, well, I have coverage. You know there's something wrong with us fighting for medical courage. Psychologically, if you fight for medical courage, it means people plan on keeping you sick. See, I want to go to Dr. Sayer, Dr. Africa, Sister Ma. I want to go to people who will prevent me from getting sick and not cure me once I'm sick and then they're dying. Something wrong with full coverage. <laughs> These Africans, perfecting their craft, traveling along happy, build situations that allow them to chart the heavens. We once again thank our sisters for inventing science. Because the foundations of science is astronomy. Sisters going through this cycle, this 28, 29, 30-day cycle, looked up into the heavens, and noticed that there was a celestial body that also went through this 28, 29, 30-day cycle. And as she prepared for her cycle, she looked at the lunar cycle, and that is why every calendar, no matter how many years it may be, even the 26,000-year calendar, the great year, developed by Africans, in Africa, by the way, there is a place called Nabta Playa, that shows you that Africans were aware of a 26,000 year cycle. There were 12 houses that lasted somewhere approximately for 2,160 years. And there were 12 of them. 
multiplying that out, if my math is right, 25,920 years, and what they did is they just evened it off by giving it 26,000 years. That evidence is found in Napster Playa, west of a swamp. By the way, don't believe anything I say. Check it out for yourself. I think the most important thing that we could ever do is to come before us and not speak to you for the end result for you to believe me, but to encourage you, excite you, and, and get you motivated to study this for yourself because the results that you come to are going to be different than the results I came to. And we need to have think tanks that can talk about this, and these become the foundations of our educational institution of what we call the Quran that meets on Thursdays in Harlem every Thursday at 7 o'clock. Because you see, like Attorney Alton Madhouse, he wasn't waiting for no one to start a freedom retreat. 14 years ago, brother started it for himself. You know, I admire folks. See, my mother used to, you know, again, I always go back to my mother because my mother was my Hatshepsut, philosopher, African queen. And she used to always prepare me for what was to come. And even if it wasn't there, just prepare yourself for when the door opens, you'll be ready. And she never allowed me to come to her with a complaint or a problem if I didn't have a solution. She always, she said, you know, you can come to me with any complaint you want, but just have a solution to your problem. Don't come to me with no problem, I don't want to hear it. But if you have a solution, I'll think about it, maybe we'll talk about it, maybe we can solve the problem. And so I've always been, and when, you know, I, you know, I got hit, I thought I was here. Okay, I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with Hatshepsut sit here, and here I am, little King Tut, thinking I'm all that. So I, eventually I go to it now with, a problem and a solution. She said, what's the solution? I give it a solution. She said, that's interesting. Now go out and find me three more to say the same thing. Because now she wanted me to be well-rounded in my solution. Not just one solution. What's your plan A, B, C, and D? Because see, sometimes in our quickness to do great things, we normally only have one solution and no backup plan. You're gonna have a backup plan alternatives that you can Go. You know, Bob Marley say it's a smart warrior who run away to come back and fight another day. Yes. So that's important that we understand this and put these kind of plans in place. This African, according to Drusilla Dungy Houston in her book Wonderful Ethiopians and their Kushite Empire, then says that these Africans then traveled across east, north, west, and into Europe, but she focuses on the ones that go northeast. And she comes up with a people that are in countries that we today geographically call, well today we call it Israel, yesterday we call it Palestine, the day before that it was the African land we call Canaan. Now I gotta tell you this, because for those of you who haven't been here last time I say this, I always say this, be careful whose side you take in this conflict, in the illusion of the Middle East. Because it's important to understand that the Palestinians are the descendants of the Philistines who were the murderers of the Canaanites. You shall reap what you sow. You said God told you to kill all these Africans, and now there's a people on that land saying God told me to kill you. Now if African folk get in the middle of this argument, we're going to get killed. So I caution us. Be careful whose side you take. And also, as African folk, we have to know the difference between a friend and an ally. And a lot of times we make mistakes with our friends and allies. Because, see, we think our allies are our friends. Allies are people you align yourself with to get a job done. Once the job is done, they very well will turn into your enemy. But if you keep looking them at a friend, then you're going to get yourself in trouble. And so the bottom line is to know the difference between an ally and a friend and to deal with friends as friends and allies as allies. When the job gets done, we don't hold hands and sing songs. In the countries we today call Lebanon, ancient land of Phoenicia, where the capital of Biblos is where Greeks went to get paper. 
and they wrote, rewrote the books that they had plagiarized from their African teachers, the Chemites or the Egyptians. They rewrote books like the Book of the Dead, the Pyramid Text, the Coffin Text, the Bremerin Papyrus, the Osarian Drama, and they wrote it in Greek. And they named the book, or the book came to be known, named after the capital where they got the paper. So now we have a book that we call the Bible, not realizing it comes from the word Biblos, which was the capital of Phoenicia, where the Greeks who stole the legacy rewrote African books. So don't be surprised when Cain and Abel sounds like Asar and Satan. Don't be surprised when Genesis sounds like the origins of life, the primate of the essence is coming out of the Shabbat stone. Don't be surprised when the product of sun sounds like the destruction of the African community by the sun that came home. Don't be surprised when you hear stories like Psalm 104 that sounds so much like the Aten text, Adoration of the Sun. Because all of these books, whether you're dealing with any from agnostic to Zoroastrianism, from A to Z, not one spiritual thought was born in a mind other than an African mind. As it traveled the world, environment changed its structure, changed, I'm sorry, changed its form, but the structure remained the same. To the point that we even now speak of a Christ, not realizing that the word is caress, Ka means spirit, res means to rise, ka res, karise, for the spirit to rise or resurrect itself, and that is why George G.M. James says that the purpose of life is soul salvation, to resurrect your soul, to make it live for all times. That's the purpose. And the road to that allows you to become conscious of your soul or your body that unites with your car, that then joins the greater ancestor or God, the collective unconscious, the collection of all thought and presence in the universe. They went from Lebanon to Assyria, from Assyria to what we call Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. See, you have to ask yourself, why are they so interested in Afghanistan? Do, do they really want to go after that man that's been dead about five years? Yeah. Uh, uh, or do they really want to surround Iran? Because if you got Iraq and you got Afghanistan, go to the art of war by another African, Sun Tzu. Surround your enemy. Cut off his links. From Afghanistan, they went to Pakistan. From Pakistan, these Africans went to India, created the great civilizations that we know as Harappa and Mohenjo Daro, created a number system that they had invented from the Ethiopian that brought it in there. The general by the name of Ganges, and that's why the major river is called the Ganges River. They went across into China, and they went into Korea, north and south, into Vietnam, but in South Korea, these Africans brought some South Koreans onto the island to their east, met a short African people known as the Ainu people, and they created the people we today call the Japanese. These are things we don't know. And yes, it is unfortunate. Because we did this before Europeans who were Africans who depigmented themselves in the Ice Age had returned south approximately 2000 BC. The European as we know him and her today is not a mutation of an African. No. 
The peoples of European descent that we know today are a people born of the people that we call cro magnon cro magnon found in Monaco is a people, and in fact, if you read the African origins, um, uh, I'm sorry, the African presence in, in Europe, uh, by, uh, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, you'll, you'll read an article in there uh, by Charles Finch and Legrand Clay that talk about this and about what they found in Monaco. And they found in Monaco, um, they, they came up with human bones. They were trying to build a building, and uh, the, the uh, leader of, um, who I believe was the father of, um, of the man that married um, Grace, uh, Prince Rainier, his father, Prince Albert of Monaco, I believe that was his father or grandfather, uh, came, uh, they, they, they were doing excavation, came upon these bones, and they stopped the digging. And what they did is that they brought experts in history, archaeology, anthropology in because they knew these bones were very special bones. And so in researching these bones, they came upon the fact that these people were a very unique people. These were different from the Europeans of France and Italy and, and Monaco and things like that. They were different people. In fact, they were like a blend of African Eurasian, very different from what they call the Europeans today. And so they continued, and they went into something known as the uh, Grotto des en Les Enfants which means the children's cave. And in the children's cave, what they did is they came down and they were able to dig 12 layers down into the earth. And on the top layer, they found the same people they found in this other place, the pro magnet mixture of both African and Eurasian, body type, blood type. But when they went down nine layers, they came upon a people totally different from the people on top. So much so, they renamed them after the family and they called it Grimaldi. Grimaldi was an African human that brought what is known as the Aurignacian tool-making culture. Whoever civilized Europe brought this Aurignacian tool-making culture into Europe and it was said to be these Grimaldi, nine stratified layers underneath. You're talking about thousands and thousands of years prior to the people found on top. So the pro the Grimaldi is all African, pure African. cro is a mixture of the pigmentation of this African over the stratified thousand year layers that landed on top. The cro in being exposed to the sun, not only depigmented itself over the thousands of years that it was exposed to extreme cold. See, we think it's cold. Ice Age, I once did a presentation on melanin in a Catholic college. <laughs> and uh, the um, professor of, um, of, of um, anthropology and whatever else he was a specialist in came to me and said, you know, you're, you're exaggerating. <laughs> When you say that the ice age, the temperatures went down to 2,000 degrees below zero, you're exaggerating. I said, well, in your interpretation, in your research, how cold do you think it went? He said, it went, it didn't go no, you know, it didn't go no lower than 1,200 degrees below zero. I said, well, that's cold. So 2,000, 1,200, 1,200 is cold, man. So I don't, okay, good, thank you. Thank you for your information. I won't say 2,000 no more. I'll say 1,200, particularly when I see people like you in it. <laughs> so it was cold in this ice age. Four ice ages that we can clock. Starting about 1.75 million years ago, you have the Guns, the Mindel, the Riss, and the Worm. Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop tells us that we do not have to be worried too much about the other three because humanity, African humanity, had not ventured into Europe up until the mid-worm ice age when there was an interstadial, and this interstadial was a warming period that Africans moved in, and then all of a sudden, from Greenland, where all ice ages emerged, this ice age covered the cap, the north cap of our world, and it locked Africans into this area because ice 
the water rises and it created ice mountains that did not allow Africans to return south. It only made them go into caves and put on clothes. And in so doing, it disconnected the relationship between the sun and the human, which is the primary reason why vitamin D. You have something on your skin known as 7-hydrocholesterol that when the sun touches your skin, you have four types of vitamin D. One, two, three, four. See, this is the curriculum now. See, here we know we're talking science here now. We're talking biology, we're talking... This is what I mean when I say the, the African-centered curriculum doesn't have to have the word Africa every other word. It just have to, it have to have an African perspective. So, vitamin D1 and D2 is a is a inactive form of vitamin D in your body. When the sun hits it, the seven hydrocholesterol acts with the vitamin D1, D2, activates it, pulls it down into your skin, and that's what creates vitamin D4 that is actually what nourishes your body and allows and acts as a merchant of transfer of calcium throughout your body that allows your body to function. D3, D4. D1, D2. When the sun hits the skin, this particular chemical, this biochemical that you have that's called 7 hydrocholesterol is active. It starts a process of transferring an inactive vitamin D1, 2 into an active D3, D4 and starts the process of life in your skin that pulls it down and nourishes it and through the constant reaction it then pulls it into your body, sends the melanin to your muscles, sends it to your love, uh, liver, sends it to your pancreas, sends it through your blood system, sends, sends it to the neural melanin in your brain, sends it to your toenail, sends it throughout your body and your body starts to animate itself. In Europe, when this did not happen, this relationship didn't happen, the body had to compensate for being able to get a little bit of sunlight to create the vitamin D. And before they used to put the vitamin D in milk, what the body did naturally was to begin to depigment itself to allow a little bit of sunlight to be able to get into the body. However, in this process, it also suffocated the spiritual life of this human by calcifying the pineal gland. Dr. Richard King talks about it. Pineal gland looked like pine. He made a comparison between a calcified pineal gland and a healthy pineal gland. And the difference is that it's equivalent. The same relationship of a calcified to a healthy is a raisin to a grape. A raisin is hard. It's, had its, it's actually a grape that's had its life system sucked out of it. And it stays there as a hard, calcified gland that can't dance, can't sing, got the go American bandstand, stay away from Soul Train. <laughs> this is reality. Your inability to dance means you are not one with your environment. In fact, black folk, we used to have a dance back in the day. We used to call it the Patty Duke. And the Patty Duke was our dance mimicking Europeans. And to tell you how bad black folk are, we dance off beat better than they do. <laughs> we are a great people. <laughs> we just don't understand our flavor, and because of that, we don't understand why they fear us. And because of that, we put ourselves in harm's way because we put our guard. We just, I, mean, I love us, and the more I study our history, the more in love I fall with us because we are a great people. We have put up with a lot of stuff, and yeah. despite and in spite of that, still we rise. Right. Right. And you know, but it, it's more than just an applause, it's more than a feeling. You have to walk the earth knowing this. You come from royalty, you come, and not the royalty that you're born into, the royalty that perseveres against all injustice.
as Brother Reverend Quentin Brown said earlier, when Alton warned us last year what was going to happen, none of us should have at that point wondered what was going to happen. The prophet spoke. Because he's a historian. Dr. Clark would tell us, I'm surprised that you're surprised. <laughs> this cal uh, calcified pineal gland coming back down created a law that we call xenophobia. It became fearful of everything other than itself and it began to inbreed. In other words, Cro Magnon with Cro Magnon. Cro Magnon with Cro Magnon. Wouldn't go with anything else. Only with itself. And because of that, what we today call the European reform. And that is, and that is the result of the Cro Magnon inbreed. So Europeans are not mutations of Africa. They're mutations of mutations. They are mutated mutations. Because I was looking just a moment ago, I have pictures of this um, gorilla called Snowflake. Yeah. And, and an albino gorilla he died of melanoma. That gorilla would not mate with another albino gorilla. The gorilla knew, Snowflake knew, that if I mate with an albino female gorilla, I am working my descendants off the globe. An albino peacock will not mate with an albino peacock. An albino cockroach will not mate with an albino cockroach. Even an albino plant won't mate with another albino plant. Yet free will, the power of negation, allowed this masterpiece of our God to say no. The first thing that every pro magnon should have done when it left the mountains of Europe should have found the largest, blackest individual and mate with that individual in order to keep itself in the evolutionary. Right Be careful, brothers and sisters. They always talk about black men are extinct. No. We are not. They are. <laughs> Whenever they tell you you something, just look in the mirror. We are not. And if you don't believe me, go to a book written by Patrick Buchanan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Minister um, Louis Farrakhan, during one of his savior um, addresses, told us to make sure that we read this book. Mm -hmm. And this book talks about, even Patrick Buchanan understands what's for the future. For every one of them, and he talks about, although I would disagree with him, he talks about for every European born, one is, uh, for, for every European dying, one is not born, that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. For every one of them that dies, six are not born. That's why they need this test tube thing. And, and also, this is why they have this promiscuity. That's why they like this Britney Spears. And they like all these women that take their clothes off because they are willing to have white children come into the world any way they can get there. And, and they, they don't have no problem with, with getting people just buck wild crazy, going to their lower pageants, having all these children because the only individual that can bring into the world a European child is a European female. Right. Say again? Well, the, the witch hunts were based on the fact that, well, you, well, you got to look at, and we're going to get into the Moors, but you know, I need someone 10, 12, now, please tell me how much time, because I can go all night, but you know how I get so, so, so please give me a, 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 a signal when I should be winding things. Give me at least uh, maybe 15 minutes, because I need time to... You know, when you exercise, you warm up, but you gotta warm down. And once I get started, I'll be warming, warming down on my way home, and I don't want to be driving, warming down from this situation. Not UAM. So the whole idea of the witch hunts, when you look at it, you look at the role of the Moors coming to America. Read a book called Othello's Children by Jose V. Pimento Bay. He wrote a book called Othello's Children. And what happened was, and understand the role of this so-called St. Patrick, of Ireland, because St. Patrick really was the one that drove the Druids, the African priesthood and priesthood out of Ireland and Europe. But and, and how did he do it? He was stepping on a snake, and the snake is a feminine principle for authority, and that's why in Kemet you have the Uraeus, Irta, the cobra, and the vulture, Mut. Mut, the root word of mother. The feminine principle of royalty is a feminine principle. I said it's a throne. And that's why you have 
the, the child and Ru or Jesus sitting on Mary's lap or Aset's lap because it is the man that ascends royalty by sitting on a throne which is feminine. The queen makes the king. The king don't make the queen. This is a legacy from Africa where we as men are very comfortable with this. See, but when you're bit by the vampire, you start acting like the vampire. So when the African woman brought in royalty of the woman into Europe, the patriarchal system coming out of the symbolism of St. Patrick came the patriarchal system of stepping on the snake and crushing the power of the female. However, Africans have brought this concept of women rights mother right across the globe. And one place they happened to come was Massachusetts. And when they got to Massachusetts, they built the town that they call Peace. Salam, or we call it Salem. When these European men got off Plymouth Rock, came to this part of the world and saw how women were treated, they said, oh no, we're going to kill these women. Because these women don't have power over us and we're going to rule. So it became a place where they did witch hunts. And if women stood up to men, you were burning tonight. Because women must be submissive to men, according to the Europeans. I'm afraid of a submissive woman. Because a submissive woman ain't going to make me a man. I need a woman that's going to tell me, brother, I don't think you're on the right track. Oh, come on, let's sit down and talk about this. See, that's what an African man, comfortable in his masculinity. See, we got to be comfortable in our masculinity. Because if we're not, we're going to fall for anything. And it's not that we want women up, ahead, or behind. We want them beside. And I believe that's all sisters want. They don't want to pedestal. They don't want to walk behind. They want to walk beside. And if you look at the comedic messages in, in, in the statues. It's funny how Europeans interpret this and, and Eurasians in general, because a lot of times the feminine principle is smaller than the male, but she has her hands around his knees. The largest, most powerful man, if you ever wanted to bring him down, how do you bring him down? You bring him by the back of the knees. So that sister symbolically behind the knees is showing to this brother, I got your back. They will not get you from the back, because I got you covered. This is the power of symbolism. But looking at this symbol from another set of eyes, you see man big, woman small, man important, women not important. And that becomes a great challenge for us when we're looking at these concepts. So we look at the empire of the Moors. We have to understand the empire of the Moors. But the way to do that is to look at, of course. And what I'd like to talk about is the booklets about the Moors. It's a very simple book. Simple, I mean, I don't list a lot of books, but I list important, very simple but concise and clear books. And one book to read is The African Presence in Early Europe edited by Dr. Ivan Van Serva. And the second book is The Golden Age of the Moon, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Serva. But to do this, you have to break the book up because what's interesting is that a curriculum, when you develop it, it's, it's not about sitting down and just reading a book. It's almost like shuffling a deck of cards. There are certain chapters that go with certain chapters, and there are certain concepts that are there that you study so sometimes it may make you go into one book on one chapter and another book in another. So a curriculum allows you to do this. And the first lesson that you want to look at when you're understanding this is the creation of the European. Because before you can even talk about Africans in Europe, you have to understand who the European was that this African met. Because the African, in medieval times, when he went into Europe and he saw this depigmented African, he said, who are you? He said, you look like you've been scared by a ghost. Because it was so different from himself, but he knew it was him, but in another state. 
So the question becomes, what, are, what is it that you should know about the origins of life, the moving into the northern climates, the depigmentation process and the role of melanin? You then would look at the race and origins of Africans in early Europe. You would go to the African presence in early Europe, and you would read the introduction, Race and Evolution in Prehistory by Charles Finch, The Evolution of the Caucasoid by Charles Finch, and then LeGrand Clay talks about the first invaders. Give you sort of kind of like a over. You, you would look at the introduction by Ivan Van Sertema, Race and Evolution in Prehistory. All of these come out of the African presence in early Europe. Race and Evolution in Prehistory, and the evolution of the Caucasoid, or the Caucasoid by uh, Charles Finch. You then would go to the next article by LeGrand Clegg, it's entitled, The First Invaders. The question that you ask yourself before you move on is, how did life, human life, emerge from Africa and migrate to Europe? From there, the third topic would be the origins of Africans in Europe. You would go to the African presence in early Europe, and you would read the article <coughs> by Ivan Van Sertema entitled, The Definitional Problem. Very interesting problem mm -hmm. that we have in understanding. <coughs> and once you read this, I'm telling you, if you should take it, that you say, you know something, I don't believe a word really covers it. But I'm going to get these books you talked about, and I'm going to read them. You would come forward with an understanding of who you are and who they are that would allow you to sustain your life from now until the day you transition out in a whole new way of looking at yourself. You said the definition of problem? The definitional problem is a title of an essay written by Ivan Van Sert in the African presence in early Europe. You then would go to an article by Don Luke. It's entitled, African Presence in the Early History of the British Isles and Scandinavia. Yeah. Now that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah. Because these are concepts that we very rarely ever think about. Next article by LeGrand Clay. Now you're going to look at the mystery of the Arctic Trois. The little short statured African found in the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. Don Luke, the African presence in the early history of the British Isles and Scandinavia. Le Grand Clay, in African presence early Europe, has an essay, The Mystery of the Arctic Trois. Renoko Rashidi then followed with a review of the book by McRitchie, David McRitchie, yeah. entitled Ancient and Modern Britain. Yeah. And then the article Blacks in Pre Revolutionary Russia. Where he talks about the importance of somebody. Like, well, first he, he deals with his grandfather, Abraham Hannibal. See, so you got to understand who Hannibal is. Abraham Hannibal. See, because when you study a person, if you study their lineage, you understand a lot more about them. Say again? Yes, yes. Okay? Because Pushkin now is going to come out of the lineage of Abraham Hannibal. Okay, a, uh, a Pushkin. Pushkin who did for the Russian, because at this time, the people of Russia were speaking French. Yeah. Remember Gaul. Right. See, this is where history comes in, if, if, if you understand history. And what happened was, is someone like Pushkin comes in and does to the Russian language what Shakespeare did to the English language. Mm -hmm. He gives it syntax and grammar. He makes a common sense of it so people can express themselves in a way that is understandable by the masses of people. Pushkin was honored in Russia. And then the final person that's honored, although he's a New Yorker, 
he, he revolutionizes drama. The New Yorker, he, he revolutionizes drama in Russia and in Europe. Ira Aldridge. Ira Aldridge. One of the premier actors of Othello. And what the Russians said about him when they would observe his play, he said, when Europeans come here, when actors come here, they get into their part and they act the part. They said of Ira Aldridge, when he comes in, he takes himself and becomes the part. And so it's not acting. It's just being who he was. He revolutionized acting in Russia. <laughs> and when Ira used to go to Europe, guess who we used to hang out with? Alexander Dumont, another brother. Oh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> in France. Okay? <laughs> Alexander Dumont, another family lineage. Yeah. Brother, brother uh, Thomas. Yeah. Thomas. Uh, um, Alexander Dumas was son to, if you want to get to world's great men of color, right. there are essays on these three. Yeah. Yeah. Grandpa, pair, and feet. Grandfather, father, and son. Thomas Dumas, French nobleman, comes to Haiti, marries Marie Dumas, has a child, Thomas, mother died. Father takes Alexander to France, gives him the best of everything, but he remarries. Thomas gets upset. He renounces his father. He takes on his mother's name, and it becomes Dumont. Because that's his mother's name. Mother Wright took his mother's name. Became one of the fiercest warriors, and there are people who believe Dumont was the one that opened up Egypt in 1797, for what Napoleon III would do later. Napoleon was jealous and fearful of Dumas because they said Dumas was so big and strong, he would pick a man up when he was on his horse, pick him up and fling him in the air. Pick the horse up too. That's what they said, pick the horse up too. But that's how big he was. This man, Napoleon Bonaparte, was, it, was intimidated by Dumas. So what he does is that as the lead general, he sends Dumas back. But in sending him back, he warns the enemy where Dumas is going. They capture Dumas, keep him in prison four years. In that four years, Napoleon returns back to France, becomes emperor. There is word that if Dumas had gotten back first, he would have been the emperor of France. Thomas Dumas gives birth to Alexander Dumas. Alexander Dumas, in honoring his father, writes a book entitled The Three Musketeers. But his father is not one of the Three Musketeers. His father is D'Artagnan, who was said to fight upwards of three men a day and beat him. That's how bad he was. D'Artagnan is Dumas. The Three Musketeers is a symbol. And this is why in the beginning you see D'Artagnan fighting. Okay? But don't get caught up in Dumas, because there's another brother, Chevalier St. George, oh, yeah. Yeah. who is the greatest fencer of France, elder to Dumas now. He's an elder to Dumas, Thomas Dumas. Not only is he the top fencer of Europe, he is also the number one violinist in Europe. And let me just throw this on. You know what George Edward Tate? He wrote a poem called The Black Brigade. Hit it on the internet. He wrote that over 30 years ago. The Quiet Lion, I call it. Brother got all them dreads and tall and big. Wonderful brother, brilliant brother. He wrote a poem called The Black Brigade, and when I read this, I often thought about because Chevalier St. George and Alexander Dumas was dispatched from France to go to the Caribbean and round up African French men to come back and fight in the revolution. And when they were not fighting and winning, they were a musical man. Fight in the, in the American fight? Revolution? No, no, in the French Revolution. Oh, okay. French Revolution. Okay. 
And when they weren't fighting, they were a musical band. And I've often thought of the Black Brigade. When you read the Black Brigade, you'll understand what I'm saying if you haven't read it. Now this is Chevalier St. George. Now, Chevalier St. George, number one fencer. Alexander Dumas, said to be number one fencer. They made an agreement. We ain't fighting. Because that means one of us got to win. Like the Williams sisters. When they play tennis, somebody got to win. Well, with Chevalier St. George and Dumas, Dumas gave deference and respect to his elder, Chevalier St. George, and said, look, you can remain the best fencer. I'll take second place out of respect for your eldership. This was an African tradition that these brothers brought into Europe. We don't know this about ourselves. The other brother, when you're looking at the arts of Europe coming from Africa, in medieval Europe, you can't forget Goff. Goff said to be one of the greatest poets and writers was a black man. Mozart's teacher was a black man named Suleiman. Beethoven, Ludwig von Beethoven. He had a he had a he has a plaque in front of his house, not just in Vienna, Austria, but in Bonn, Germany, and it says Schwarze Spaniel House. The Black Spaniards house. Because he was a Moor that left Spain, family went to Holland. From Holland went to Germany, and the musical side of the family then moved to Vienna, Austria, to make sure that Ludwig could stay close to Amadeus Mozart, Wolfgang. And what's interesting is just look at his name. See, because the brother knew he wasn't going to survive in Europe with a name like Thoven Bay. So what he did is he took the bay from the end, put it in the front, put an E instead of the Y, and it became, because we don't call him Beethoven, we call him Beethoven. His, his Moorish nature is right in his name. And we don't see. This is our history. He revolutionized. Let me tell you something else to do. See, these are all things that I'd like you to actively do once you leave this area. I want you to go and I want you to listen to either Oscar Peterson or Thelonious Monk and Beethoven. Listen to them all and see how close they sound. Listen to Moonlight Sonata. Listen to the Ninth Symphony. And then go to Oscar Peterson. Or go to Thelonious Monk and listen to Straight No Chase. And then go to Miles Davis and listen to the horn. Miles Davis wrote in his um, autobiography that was written also by Quincy Troop. He wrote a piece where he talked about when he wrote uh, a, 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 um, a piece um, um, that was dedicated to the Moors. He had a whole album dedicated to the Moors. John Coltrane, who became part of the Moorish Science Temple, he had a, a piece called Ole. Okay? And both of these were impacted by the Moors in Spain. And there's a conversation that um, uh, Miles Davis is having where what he did is he took the cantatas of Spain, the voices that he heard females sing on the verandas, and he turned the horn into their voices. Sketches of Spain. Sketches of Spain. Thank you, brother. Because you must have read my mind. I was searching for that title. Sketches of Spain by Miles Davis. Listen to it. Download it. Whatever you need to do. But understand your greatness because all that is in them is in you. There is nothing that was in them that's not in you. Collectively, we are the libraries. Some people want to call it the Akashic field, the Akashic record, which is a collective record of all things that have happened in the universe, are happening in the universe, and will ever happen in the universe. And you have access to that information if only you would touch the right button or tap your heels three times and say, I want to go home. Yeah. It's there. It is there. And this is no hocus pocus mumbo jumbo. It's there. Access it in your quiet time. Pull it down. When you go on and you start looking at Africans in the ancient Mediterranean Isles, and mainland Greece. 
That will then tell you about how George G.M. James could have written Stolen Legacy and why Martin Bernal, although it had an agenda, he was right in Black Athena. And also why Frank Snowden, when he wrote his book on Blacks or Africans in Greco antiquity, he was right. What about Stonehenge? Stonehenge. Stonehenge from Britain, from, from the island, well, well in, it's in Scotland, Wales, England, it's in that island. Stonehenge is an African astronomical site. And it's important that we understand this and know this. And again, it goes to astronomical. Uh, National Geographic just had a, uh, I think the month before, soon, they uh, had an um, article dedicated to Stonehenge. Bring it down on the internet if you need to, because I don't think they have it out anymore. John Baldwin was so Say again, brother. John Baldwin. Eight, uh, uh, John Baldwin, John D. Baldwin, prehistoric nations. Prehistoric nations. See, because what I like to do here, this is all uh, uh, information gathering sets. Right on. So, so if you got it, send it up here and I'll give it out there. Because I think what we have to do at this point is we have to get very scientific. And by science, I don't mean science as we know it. I mean consciousness, to become aware of this and to walk with this and walk with this in knowledge of it so that every step you take, every step you make, carries this legacy with you. And then it goes to our children. And then after you look at Mediterranean Island and mainland Greece, then you want to look at the Moors, and this is where we get into the golden age of the Moors. Who are the Moors and where did the Moors come from? You look at the articles in uh, the golden age of the Moors and just read them through. But there's a particular one that talks about Othello that was written by Rosalind Johnson. In fact, I believe she's a teacher in Brooklyn. That's the, 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 the bio-information about her, and I tried to contact her, but uh, what, what, what was so interesting is that uh, Shakespeare Othello, based on Moore, um, that, 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 that they call the Moore, I, I purchased the DVD, the one that was played by Lawrence Fishburne, the recent one by Lawrence Fishburne. For the young people, I bought the DVD called Old, Yes, yes. Okay, about a basketball. You know they're gonna make it basketball. Yes, yes. Uh, but oh, and uh, also I tapped into one of the most brilliant actors, Paul Robeson. But they, but they don't have his visual, but they have it on DVD. Okay. But not just that. I also got William Marshall. Mm. And William Marshall is an actor. Yeah. Blacker. Yeah, yeah. Scream Blacker. Yeah. That brother bought Africa into Dracula. Yeah. He out Dracula, Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because he brought the whole flair of, of, of his, his Othello into the character because certainly that's who he was. Go into the beginning of that movie of Blacker where he's there with that European count. And he disgraces and starts to disrespect the African woman. And William Marshall says, You must be out of your mind. Of course, he's Dracula, so you know how that went. Say again. Was he? I'm not sure, but he very well could have been. But William Marshall, you know, these are people that we just don't tap into. William Marshall, in, in his role of a fellow, was, was a very powerful. And you can buy that on DVD. They they, they filmed him on DVD doing that. He did Lydia Bailey also. Say again. Lydia Bailey. Lydia. 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 Lydia Bailey. Okay. So you read Othello, but also read Rosalind Johnson, but also get an excerpt from Paul Rosen when he's discussing what he brought into the role as a conscious black man. Right was saying to walk in a spiritual life. You then look at the war of science, African faith systems in medieval Europe dealing with Africans in the birth and expansion of Islam. Because you've got to understand, Muhammad comes from a line of African people. But not just that. The great majority of the people who institute Islam came from the eastern coast of Ethiopia. That's why he sent his second adopted son, Bailao, to Ethiopia when he retreated to Medina the first time he was repulsed from Mecca. He went back to Medina where he was from and he sent Bailao to Ethiopia and said, I'll call for you soon, son. 
bring your boys with you when you come. And what happened when Muhammad, the prophet, was ready to return back to Mecca to take it over, he sent for Bailao, and Bailao returned with thousands of Ethiopians. What does that mean? 15 minutes, brother, or 10? 10. Ten. Came back with over 10,000 Africans from Ethiopia that had in place a faith system and a way to express it. The faith system became Islam, the way of peace. The people became Muslim, which are people of peace. And the language they expressed it today is called Arabic. Or Afro. Because you can't be Arabic and not be black. Because what makes you Arabic is that fact that you're black. So, and I know there are times, just like sometimes people that follow particular faith systems, sometimes challenge. I say, I am more than willing to sidestep my opinion if you prove me wrong. Right but you've got to bring documentation. No investigation, no right to speak. Because I'm coming from science. And either Bailal historically brought them from the mountains of Ethiopia, or he didn't. Because all I need to know is how come this faith system and this way of living came to this land almost overnight? How could that be? With no trial and error, no belief system, it just appears. Yeah. And it unites these tribes. And those of Eurasia descent who've been doing battle with Africans upon the death of the prophet, they say, I don't think I want those black people now to leave Islam after Muhammad. So, we're going to split. You Sunni, I Shia. And that's the split of Islam. And this is why when we got into Iraq, all of a sudden, see, we always talk about Islam. I'm speaking of us as a collective people. Now, all of a sudden, we're hearing these wars between the Shiite and the Sunni. They're saying, but wait a minute, what about the Shiite? You know, but do you have, do you have a Protestant movement too? You mean what? You know what? Orthodox protest, uh, uh, protest uh, you have Shiite, you have Sunni. What is the difference? Well, the difference is along color lines. Sunni is African, original, Shiite is the adopted. And once we understand this, and just read the article, don't believe a word I say. And if I am wrong, I am willing to take a side step, but just show me where I'm wrong. Show me where Chin Wei is wrong when he talks about the role that Africans play in the expansion and development of Islam. Now you can't go without looking at African women in Moorish Europe. Yeah. The role of women was totally equal to men. They could own land, they were doctors, they were lawyers, they ran things, yeah. just like men. Yeah. I'm sorry? Generals yeah, in the army. Yes. Generals in the army, exactly. They, what they could do, they did. But they had to do it. When you look at the article written by our good brother, may I call his name out, Dr. Edward Scope. Yeah. He wrote an essay called African Popes. Yeah. And then you understand why the Christian church split on the Militavis, who was an African Pope, and Constantine was trying to unite the European Christians of the Roman and the Eastern Orthodox from Constantinople. And then you understand why the split occurred and what the fundamental difference between an African faith system is from a European faith system. Because to Africans, Jesus the Christ was an extraordinary, supernatural person, but was not the only son of God. Not to mention that African Christians looked at Jesus the Christ more as a symbolic metaphor for the path of life than an actual human being that lived that we can track down Pontius Pilate, we can track down everybody in the whole issue, but we can't find this man called Jesus Christ. We can find everybody else. 
Not to mention, of course, the letter J didn't exist back in those days. So that's a whole other thing. Yeah, right. Because they said it looked like a phallic symbol, so we weren't going to put that in the album. That's why I call this Christian cross, it says INRI. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's why the name was not Jehovah, it was Yahweh. It was not J-H-V-H. It was Y-H-W-H, which is the symbol in mathematics of the trapezoid, or the crossing over of the sides. We don't know this. See, you see, we gotta get into this discussion, and again, I respect every faith system. Because, you know, quite frankly, I believe that for all of its intentions, if it wasn't for Christianity, we might not have been able to deal with that situation. Christianity came to us at a time when we needed to be able to hook into something or someone. When we were treated so horrifically that we needed to find another person that went through something like that. And not only that, but split history in half. He became so great. And so in this story of this resurrected Savior, we didn't want this life just to be a life lived and gone. We saw in this Jesus Christ, in this Christianity, not only our own faith system of hominism, but we also saw a way to get to tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And without a mental crutch to get us there, we may not mentally have been able to do it. So Christianity in its place was a most powerful situation. So I respect it. I respect every faith system. Just live it. Don't tell me your religion and then act like a heathen. Don't tell me God told you to kill somebody. Because God never tells you to kill somebody. Another force. That's why in ancient Egypt you had Heru and Heru Kuti. The righteous inheritor and the righteous warrior. So when it was time to go to war, Heru Kuti came. When it was time to have peace, Heru came. When it's time to go to war, Malcolm comes. When it's time to have peace, Martin Luther King comes. But don't mix Martin and Malcolm. When it's Malcolm's time, act like Malcolm. When it's Martin's time, you act like Martin. When it's Heru's time, you act like Heru. When it's Heru Kuti's time, you act like Heru Kuti. We got to get this together. We have to look at ourselves. And uh, brothers and sisters, I am just really, I love us. I love you. I love our children. And I think we need to tell each other this more and mean it. Tell our children, I love you. And because of that, I'm going to have mercy on you. And sometimes mercy comes through tough love. But know that I love you. And what I do, I do because you need to have mercy. You need to pull your pants up, put a belt in them loose. I'm tired of seeing them dirty drawers. I understand it's the prison mentality. I understand that. I understand the word nigger. And I personally don't have a problem with the word nigger because nigger means God. The word nigger historically is the word that when, during the Punic Wars, when the Romans came upon Africans, they said, who are you? And they said, Inja, Inga, Negus Negusti. I am a God, I am a leader, I'm the king of kings, lord of lords. I come from Niger, Nigeria. The Romans took that word and put it in their vocabulary. It became Negro, Nigro, Negro. But I must also tell you this. There is a symbol that a lady by the name of Madame Blavatsky went and studied Buddhism and looked at a symbol that meant the universe, the law of opposites, all things and everything combined. She brought it back to Europe and there was a young man living in Germany that took that symbol and he made it the emblem of the party he was about to create. He took a sacred symbol and his dirty, filthy, trashy hands made it dirty. He took a sacred symbol and made it dirty. And if I should put that symbol on the board, and there would be people of different faith systems observing it, they'd get upset with me 
but they wouldn't hear me when I say this is an ancient sacred symbol that you can find in Ghana, you can find in Nigeria, you can find in Egypt, you can find in India, but because a dirty man touched it, he dirty what was good. The word Negro is not a bad word, but white supremacists put their dirty, filthy hands on it and made it dirty. So when I talk to our young people about that word nigger, I don't have a problem with the word nigger. Just understand that a dirty man put his hands on it. We put it in the garbage. Why are your hands in the garbage? Why are you picking that word back up after we threw it away? Not because it's a bad word, but because somebody dirtied it. So brother, I tell the young brothers, and see as older brothers we got to talk, and as older sisters we talk to them historically about the word. I don't have a problem with that word. It's the social connotation that was put on it by dirty people. The same way people of various faith systems have a problem with a sacred symbol that means everything and all. It's a wonderful symbol, but it's been dirty. Negro, nigger, is a beautiful word, but it's been dirty by the social connotation that's been put on it. So when we talk to our children about this word, I encourage us to be historically accurate and explain to them, it don't make a difference how you spell it. You can put an A-H on it, you can leave it with an A, but no matter what, it still will conjure up in those who put their life on the line during the social context. Why we as elders have a problem with this word, just understand it. And tell them, young brother, that our sisters aren't bitches. <laughs> tell them what a bitch is. Explain it to them. Because when I talk to them, they say it's a female dog. No, it's not. It's a female dog in heat, which will go with anything and anybody. It'll hump itself up against the wall. It'll touch things that it shouldn't touch. That's a bitch. And when you call a woman a bitch, you call your mother a bitch. You can't call one and not call them all. So young brothers, I say be careful. If you want to keep using that word, that's your business. But now that I tell you what it means, just keep in mind every time you use that word, put your mother's face in the face of the woman you're talking to. Because that's who you're calling a bitch. And you see, you know, you know, I use these words. I hope to the elders know, I hope I don't offend you. But I use these words because we hear them all the time. We hear them on the bus, we hear them on the train, we hear it in a rap, we hear it amongst themselves, and they say because the word doesn't mean anything, I can say it, but it does mean something. Because what you call into the universe, you can't call back. The word is supreme and it is sacred. And once we know this, we shall overcome it by any means necessary. We are a mighty people who will rise by the will of our wills because Bob Marley teaches us that no one can curse who job bless. And the fact that we stay here, Jah has blessed us. Shemem Hotep Amu. The prophet has spoke. Yes, he did. There is no need for another word. We are not the people. We are not the people. Robbed from our homeland. Robbed of our history. Robbed of our history. The knowledge of our greatness. The knowledge of our greatness. But men like Dr. Power. Men like Dr. Power. Is restoring that greatness. Our consciousness. Reawakens our greatness. Up, you mighty people. You can accomplish what you will. Let's will ourselves back to ourselves. No justice, no peace. No justice.
Um, have we finished off that pizza, I hope? Yes. Good. We shouldn't even be frequenting pizzas, you know? The difficulties Italians gave me in my growing up, and what they give black folks now, they got to do their own pizza. And selling drugs out of the pizzerias and, and whatnot, mafia connection. In fact, you should stay away from Chinese food too. And Japanese. Yeah. Sushi, Jeffrey Can we uh, um, have an attention, please? What that Japanese man said. Um, our brothers in Westchester have produced another issue of the paper, and um, on the network. And you see, some of us are featured. The workshop is featured. And uh, we need to congratulate them because, you know, they've done a very good job. Here's the inner, inner uh, the battle for curriculum wages on. And then they have a shot of myself. Then they have Professor Scobie speaking to us. All right. Gary Price and myself. And then they have uh, Sensei. Uh, great, come out. When right. he was uh, dealing with it, so um, they have been doing what the African media should be doing in projecting as uh, some serious work done by by our, our community. So that let's support them as as much as we can uh, in terms of the paper, so that they can grow and expand. Um, so we have some outside uh, on the desk. There's some here that we can. Uh, now, the young man, young African warriors, this is some of our African community series in trying to develop a curriculum, not a curriculum of inclusion, we're going to include it, but they're developing a curriculum of liberation. And they're working on it not from the point of view of putting it in the school system only, but putting it in the home, putting it in the playground, putting it in the community center, putting it in the church, and then marching it into the school. Uh, because it's going to be difficult for the school teachers to deal with what we're talking about in terms of the significance of uh, the African Foundation of Human Experience and us taking control of our, our education and our development. Um, but that's a responsibility we have. And so this group has been meeting for months uh, working on these type of uh, things. I'm glad to see we have our sister, uh, Diane Glover, here, who is uh, a crucial part of the struggle for African education liberation. She works closely with Adelaide Sanford and has tried to put a support system around Adelaide. And she's supportive in the different struggles that we are involved in. She was also selected to be a member of the distinguished 23 member committee put in place by the Chancellor Sobel oh. to revise the curriculum. And of course, she's one of our most distinguished members of the committee because she's got to keep a watch on Schlesinger and whatever Diane Ravage may try to do working in and around them and and even Ali Maziri can't be trusted for so much uh, so she, Diane has an enormous job uh, and but Sister Glover is up to the task but she needs our support and anything she wants um, we've got to uh, help her with so uh, Diane feel free that you can uh, hook into this group and its larger extension uh, to get anything that you need, any type of support. If you need us to come up there and bring 200 people up there to look like we represent two, you know, 200,000, then we'll do that. And these brothers are serious about their growth and development. And so, um, they were just in my office looking at some of the books. They were, we had to hook up with Professor Scobie so that he can be invited out to participate with them. And uh, one of the brothers is at Bronx Science, so he wants us to possibly come later in the year with some of the students at Bronx Science who's had his leadership group there. And also, um, they understand that they need to form study groups. It's not just a matter of grappling 
uh, or getting the message across, but it's also growth and development. And so just as we are organizing in study groups, um, they realize that it's got to be done. Somebody approached me today and mentioned that Kermit Ely, the head of um, the Black United Fund, uh, wants to work with setting up study groups in the buildings that they're working with. So that's eventually where ASCAP wanted to go. Study groups on every corner, uh, in every community center, in every youth center. And this is something that they, white folks can't control. You, Diane Ravitch can't do nothing with this. Even Tom Sobel can't put any parameters in it. And certainly Mayor Koch and uh, Governor Cuomo can't deal with it. So the whole study group process is our way of, of setting up a foundation under our community. And as you know, uh, those of you who don't have the Power <laughs> Pack, the African Power Pack, you better get a hold of the African Power Pack. Right. Otherwise, you won't know about the Statue of Liberty. You won't have the documentation. Right. Uh, you won't have the documentation of putting white folks in those caves. So you've got to put the white folks in the caves at least 25,000 years. If you don't put them in 25,000 years, you're in trouble. And, uh, but it's a documented 25,000 years. It's not something that we just fathom down of our imagination. So you go to the videotape, go to Newsweek. Uh, the way they were. Put them in the cage 25,000 uh, years. That's why they're upset with me. Because the documentation is there and the analysis is there. And also the Black Adam and Eve is, uh, is here. And then, uh, of course, in the Power Pack, we have a study on South Africa that I did, uh, which a lot of you should get into uh, because there's some serious analysis in terms of really what's happening in South Africa in terms of the land, in terms of that value system of debt that chosen people value system that comes out of the Africana church. You know, we had talked about the church yesterday and the role that the church can play in devilishness. And if you want to see what Christianity can do in terms of devilishness, you need to see it in South Africa. On the black side, as well as on the white side, as well as on the Dutch side, as well as on the English side, as well as on the colored side, as well as on the Asian side. The devastation of the Christian ideology of death and white supremacy is right there for everybody to see. And when I was with the World Council of Churches in 83 in Geneva, I had it firsthand uh, to get the knowledge of me. So the brothers, I want to give them uh, the power pack. And this is for some serious study. And out of this, some of your inspiration and some of your Already Maurice is doing some heavy work, I tell you, with some of the the uh, material he's already uh, presented in terms of the conspiracy and free your African mind and Asiatic static. So uh, hopefully they can be a model of what some of the other uh, groups can do. And it's happening. I was in the post office a couple of weeks back, minding my own business, about 1 o'clock at night. And a young fellow came up to me, and he was with one of the big groups. I mean, I. Uh, what, KRS or something like that. I mean, what? And he said, Dr. Jimmy, how you doing? So we were sitting and chatting and talking. And then getting heavy into African history. And the white man across the way was minding his own business, getting his nails together. And before he knew it, he had to interrupt us. And he's tie in jacket, pinstripe suit, Harvard graduate. And of course, you know, I kicked butt as probably should be done. And I got tired of him. And I just left him there and went to take care of my business at the mail uh, window. And this young brother took care of business. I mean, I mean, I was so proud to see him. Take on the Harvard graduate. He just wiped his butt out. And, you know, I said, if this is what happened with the young people, I said, wow, we can go eat. We may have something here. You know? And uh, he did give me his little card and stuff, so I have to remember. But this is happening all the time. You meet these... Um, Young fellas really trying to grow and develop. But of course, all we see on the TV screen mm -hmm. is people being dragged off uh, for some uh, unnecessariness that they've been bothered. So what I would like to see the brothers do, you know, whenever we open up our activities or end it, we usually have something special. So if you can just do something for us. You know, you ain't on stage now. You're with your family now. This is like we just, you know, like we used to be on the step and the stoops and North doing our little ditty bopping. You remember those things, Camille? You ain't as young as you act. <laughs> and any of you who want the uh, package, we do have a ten dollar fundraiser for our students on the trip to Africa. Well, that was the religious the one with the 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 See, the brothers are getting, and they're anticipating what's in this. We're like, we want to read it now. We, <laughs> we want to, because we've been waiting. Anyway, my name is Dexter. At least the name that I've been given 
from my mother. I'm searching for that real one. We're going to find it one day. Um, these are brothers of war, at least some of them, the ones that can make it tonight, the ones that are the ones in the organization that try to spearhead things when they go down. Um, as I said before, my name is Dexter. This is Mark, the black man's advocate. This is S.Y., who I call a lyrical genius. This is Juka. Juka is the man, Juka. And this is Brett, B. Funk. And there's a long story behind that name. Anyway, as I said before, this is war. We are warriors against ignorance, and we try to combat it in every way possible, in any form that it comes in. So black man's advocate, tell him that you know. Yo, I'm a rising. So stop the criticizing. I'm sick and tired of brothers hypnotizing other brothers with fake prophecy and proverbs. So now it's time to get what they deserve. Get your facts straight. Read a book about yourself and put your attitudes on the shelf. Because many have tried to lead this revolution. They all have died. And no solution is upon us, because we are still looking for the answers. We won't find a walk around like gangsters, shooting up a party, killing your brother's man. Can't you see you getting jailed by the other man? My history and his, they don't coincide. Doing life for petty crimes, that's genocide. All about money, cash flow, green currency. That is the cause of drug addiction and delinquency. Without it, there'd be no fat cap kingpins. The black loses as long as the green wins. Start realizing and stop antagonizing your brothers and sisters, because it's you that we despising. It's quite surprising. You're always idolizing all the negative minds, because with them you're socializing. You need schooling, a little education on a black race and the growth of a black nation. Don't mean to sound radical or derogatory, but learn your history, not his story. Black power has been around for many centuries. We've been suppressing the press, but not eventually everyone will know. They read it in the history books, then our kids will know their colors, not connected with crooks. I'm sick and tired of paying the price for all the brothers that committed the crime. It took a for a brother stop the violence and start to understand the labels of the packages, not for no black man. Mm. <laughs> Here we go. You can get a, I want to do this for the clap, but I don't have a very strong voice to bounce off the back of the wall like his does. So we can just get the rhythm in there. Here we go. All right. Ready? Bend don't break, but someone even bend. Go with the flow or your snap of the wind. Some sleepy night lights, but they're afraid of my dark. When I'm a shadow running wild in midnight's park. Not selling out because some must be a sales pitch. To make more money, you do an attitude switch. See, I don't buy myself in Cali and Miami. They ain't saying nothing. That's why they get a Grammy. Uncle Tom all dated, bubblegum overrated. Acting like the never the rhyme flow was constipated. Thorns on a rose bush, out in my petals. More soldiers dying than those who come in with medals. Trying to tame a line, but deep is disappointed. Struck by a coin, your body's destroyed. You're not a verbalizer. I'm an MC. I sold monkey wrench and government machinery. I think they know me. They try to ban me. A southern senator will flux clan me. I'm not a communist, I'm a black activist. I suffer hard in the hands of a racist. But since I've gotten all the world gets along, someone pays my mind for ticking time bomb. I took my confidence, called it arrogance. It's a shame when you make the wrong comparison. A little book sense, you gotta have common sense. But your actions should make no kind of sense. If you're a weak and tall, you should prepare to fall. System X has got behind the eight ball. I didn't start this war, I never killed before. But it seems it's exactly what they're asking for. So it's a step to you, the letter 24. Either retreat, attack, or since they hit the floor. I went up slave chains, cause I'm not a slave. And I get pissed when they say that I cannot behave. Here you coming, redneck, wearing your cowbells. Went to Naya Bingies and bought some conch shells. Then I spread my wings to do my walk sore, metamorphosize, then I do my lion's roll. <laughs> Before, my name is Esquire. It stands for Everyone Stupid, Quickens, Unintentional Racial Extermination. <laughs> Everyone Stupid, Quickens, Unintentional Racial Extermination. So, um, thanks to Professor Jeffries, I've become more of an analyst now in terms of my, um, the, what I bring through my raps. Um, I guess I do sort of a little collage, and, you know, just to make it equally. <laughs> um, what's going on in the brains of the future? The mind is severely distorted to suit the needs of a white supremacist to take control of a black body and soul. Now, which is the more successful door, black or white? The little man picks the one that's light. Why? Because the other door is dark, and black is tagged with a failing mark. 
Now which is the prettiest door, white or black? The girl thinks white is the obvious fact. The US cracker, he looks so smugly. Cause now this girl thinks black is ugly. African American youth never get truth. And what's next is an inferior complex. The cut so deep that it's bound to scar the mind of a child that's so into Barbie. And while Barbie drives a Corvette, running shoes are all Flojo gets. It's all a scam, the blacks in Bedland. If he doesn't hear the conspiracy, poor little Sambo, nobody knows. The pain from the blows of the blackface shows. Told in the tall other the tale they were telling. Boys wearing shoe polish, eating watermelon. A disgrace to Sambo and his brother Cool. The names they were given in the Nightmarish cartoon. You really think the eyes of both walls when they spots the people battleship lift? You better think now, nah, Mammy's the mother. Bad with a bandana wrapped on the head, talking to the master with a man of Lord Show. Was generous to provide you. Wish I was at least good enough for behind you. Wash one in one hand, tell Ben another. Mammy is the nanny and she's handy as a close brother. Husband, uncle, blue to a fiddle, smiles and see tooth missing in the middle. All these types of pipe at the time were ripe as they mark the Africans, darky and nigger. This kind of ethnic blow is gone on a brother that I never call Sam. Well, freedom, free your dome, liberate the mind. The demon has you confined, confused, confounded, they compounded lies. Got your mentally surrounded, trapped. Go on the lap in captivity, shackled the Africans, thought they were mastering. Bodies are so, so they went for the spirit. Took out a whip, made your forefather fear it. Our ancient mothers were raped, refused to warm the bed, and they were dead. Causing this modernistic picture could have been authentic, now we're a mixture. A non prejudiced explanation why the world, not just a nation, is a melting pot or pan. Done by the hand of Captain Caveman. Tell me why this tribulation is not a cut by so called education. I say so called by simply explaining that they insist on training. It takes a well, a well trained dog to roll over, beg, walk upon its hind legs. Otherwise, that dog is a fool on how to survive, but he thinks it's cool. How could they arrive at this conclusion? Saying the black man made no contribution. Hope one puts an out an illusion. African descent will get struck dumb. They better save a temp for a contusion and get quick to kick with an infusion. I put a better yet put an effective inclusion of truth into the curriculum. Get the crap out of my face on the properties of Rodgers, Aristotle, Socrates, and Socrates. Because a lot of these men, the, a lot of these men, the man believed to be fathers of thought were thieves. The scriptures on the pyramid Know thyself, materialists never share the bump. There is a royal richness you can't find, or it's a free your African mind. Extending my hand and thanks to all of you and Professor Jeffries for having us here. We, like I said, started our organization, but we're just at that fetal stage, waiting to be born into something spectacular. Mm -hmm. So we're just hoping that we can have all the help that you're willing to give in making what we're trying to do possible. And we're willing to give to you everything that we can as your brothers and you as our sisters and brothers. So you all ready to we'd have a little opening up. <laughs> Something serious. Now, what we hope to do is to take that energy and that consciousness and figure out how something can be done for the one and two and three year olders. And so when they go into the school, they go in rapping. <laughs> you know, our history. And the teacher is looking to find Dick and Jane and give it to them. And they talk about Nzinga and Harriet Tubman. And uh, so we'll work with the brothers and we'll extend any help that they need, including financial help to make sure that they get their stuff on wax and whatnot. So that um, that's a commitment that we will make. Yeah. I'm ready to all pay. So we just hook it up where we need to. Yeah. come on, but I think Professor Scobie needs to say a few words to calm us down. Fascinating. This has been a close race to 
the beautiful brothers. Yeah. And you know, while I was listening to them, everything was going down in my mind. I was saying, this is another power, powerful area that we need in our armory for finding ourselves. Yeah. Let us not be light about it. No. It's very moving and serious, and the fact that it's coming from such beautiful young minds yeah. must yeah. mean that the message is going on around to an African family. Yes. We have now come to the stage where I'm sure we are going to we include not only the elders and the older ones and the not so old ones, but we have now have our young people That's seeing right. what That's we're right. seeing mm -hmm. and putting it in the way that young people put things today. And I think we may not take it light because this is a serious inclusion in the African struggle mm -hmm. alone. And um, how far it will go further, we will just see. But it's a, something that we are developing, and, and I now see the development in its totality. And I see another thing that it brings to us is the fact that we as an African family, wherever we may be now, are getting together in a unified way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once you can get your young, your youngsters with you, your children with you, and talking the way they are talking yes. through a, a, a through a media a medium that is entirely belonging. If it's done in the face of America today, it's our is our youth like these beautiful brothers yes. and who are at other other places too who have brought it before us. At one time, I know we would say that oh rap and say rap, you know, and t and the older ones tend to think oh we have nothing to do with that. But if we don't have that with us as a component of this ongoing struggle. The struggle is going to go. The brothers have said we are at war. Mm -hmm. And their, their weapons that they're using is the most powerful mm -hmm. one. Yes. And I welcome them into the family. And it's always the elder must do it. Yes. I welcome you. Oh. Thank you. Now, I don't know what your timetable is, but um, or anybody's timetable, but we do have, uh, as this was the appetizer, and it turned out to be a main course. <laughs> but the entree is our brother Booker T. Right. And he has been laboring in the vineyard and mastering how you can take her his knowledge and, and this explosion of African light and package it into uh, a process where the children can have it in the school system. And he's been working in District 9, a troubled district, but he's been a stalwart and trying to develop things there. And he's had a team of people who had Jerry in, he has uh, for the Collinmore, and Booker and others who have been working and put together a serious curriculum, including lesson plans. So while the Commissioner of Education sold the word about what the reasons could be made, they were actually making it and just ignoring it at the beginning of the seven years. The delegates from Iraq, the PLO, Yemen, and Sudan walked out of the meeting Thursday to protest the defeat of a resolution denouncing the United States. And what can be done? So that, uh, even though we talk about the Portman Award, based on that said, District 9 on this side of the continent has been doing some serious work. So uh, if we can give a special African welcome to uh, so the Portman Just as it becomes part of the life system in the college, oh, what we began to see in our young people, we saw the same thing evolving. First of all, I would like to tell you that this works. Culture works. I work with children from kindergarten through junior high school. And for those teachers, and we do have teachers here who are working in the process and have classes. And what's so important is something I'd like to even begin with by letting you know. Uh, there was a brother standing in a puddle of water. 
who are conscious. And it happens, and it works. So we don't need to get into the dialogue about whether or not uh, the state is going to is going to say it's going to work. Should we work? They have a five-year plan. I can tell you all about the state. So can Miss Glover. Diane Glover can tell you because she's working on the curriculum. Please understand what is happening between now and the time they decide to include it. Because, see, this is a game now. Because, first of all, they got us on the wrong track. They got us thinking about a curriculum of inclusion. So that all of a sudden, a couple of years from now, when this gosh darn awful curriculum is finally put in place, they're going to say, okay, let's give it to them. We have to understand the tracks. Right now, they are planning to undermine the program. This is what this time is taking right now. They're thinking of a way to divert, because I want to tell you where this multicultural curriculum came from. It came from Brooklyn. It came from the Bronx. It came from those conscious African Americans who many years ago, maybe five or six years ago, said that it is wrong to have a curriculum that does not include Africa. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Do you remember, I believe it was Reverend Daughtry and a few other ministers and community activists stood up and said it couldn't happen? Let me tell you what happens in multicultural. When we do staff development sessions and we start talking about the glory of Africa, you see a hand raised. Say, but wait a minute, what about the Italians? We have a history. What about the Irish? We have a history. You, do, you, do you see what they did? Yeah. What they did is that they shifted the emphasis because they understand that when you take brothers like this yeah. and sisters who are their counterpart, and they become aware of who they are, what they are, where they are, and where they must go, what you have is the most dynamic force in this nation. <laughs> there is a great fear. So we don't need to be surprised when people of Asian background talk about it. We don't need to be surprised when people of other cultures begin to talk about us. And when I talk about the African diaspora, please understand what I say. I'm talking about the English-speaking, the Spanish-speaking, the French-speaking, the Dutch-speaking, the any-speaking people of African descent. Because this is another thing. They have divide and conquer. So that our Latino brothers and sisters do not see themselves wrapped up in us. They do not see that that same comedic origin, that same comedic legacy that we are so proud of applies to them as it applies to us. So they divide and conquer. They make them think that this doesn't apply to you. You have a culture. This is what this is. What we've got to do is clearly see where we fit in this and what we've got to do. To this end, what I would like to do, I would like to do this in two parts. There is no way I can cover everything that I'd like to tell you. But later on down the line, this, this will be in written form so that we can understand this. And I hope that what we begin to do, and what we can do by this evening, I would like to lay out a plan tonight that you can implement tomorrow morning to make a difference in your community. I've had an opportunity to work with parents, because you see, first of all, all of this means nothing without the parents. Please know that we have to do things simultaneously for this to work. Without the parents reinforcing this information and the spiritual aspect of what it is that we're doing, this will not work. It is the school, the administration, the parents, and the community. Because in some schools, we have people of the community who are conscious but do not have children in the school. Many schools say, well, in order to be on the parents' association, you must be a parent, but that's fine. But if you are a community member, you have as much right in that school as anyone else. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. Tonight, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take you back. And the reason why I'm taking you back is because whenever we go on a road, you always have to look back to see where you started. And by the time we're finished today, we're going to understand that this curriculum of correction was in place in 1922. It was on its way into place by 1919. And that there was a dynamic brother who was putting this in place, who laid a road map, who showed us and who crystallized and personified what Dr. Clark has taught us for so long. And that is, is that a human being, male or female, can achieve anything as long as they don't run in the street talking about what they're doing. This brother was able to do things that changed the international world. And the reason why, and if I may ask at this point, how many of you have heard of, how many of you have not heard of Professor William Leo Hansen? Okay. Well, this evening, you're going to understand who Professor William Leo Hansberry was. I spoke to my sister Irma. And there were things that I was contemplating whether or not I should discuss. But I think that after I've been impacted by our brothers who are at war 
I wanted to, I want to now, and I consciously made this decision in listening to them. Because just as we inspire them, brothers, understand you inspire us. Because you're our future. And although the struggle is long, victory is assured yeah. as long as we are united. And as long as we understand that what is attempting to be done to us is not new. And unfortunately, as we unfold this story of William Leo Hansberg, we are going to find that some of the worst people in his life was in practice. We really did a job on him, on many different levels. But because this brother knew where he was going, it didn't bother him. Because he knew the road he was on. And when he was on this road, he just kept going. And we're going to write some models next week so that I can show you what I mean because I'm a very construct person. I like visuals. I like to see and then from seeing, draw out what we'd like to say in the concrete. William Leo Hansberg, born 1894, Gloucester, Mississippi. Brother was born to a, a family, Eldon and Pauline Hansberg. Eldon Hansberg was professor at Alcorn, uh, Alcorn a and in Mississippi. Uh, he was a student of history. He was a teacher of history at Alcorn a and &M. And what he did is he collected a library. This is Eldon Hansberry, the father. Collected a library on Greek and Roman history. Unfortunately, when William Leo Hansberry was three years old, his father Eldon passed away. However, that did not stop him. In fact, that was one of his motivating factors. Because he inherited his father's library. And I guess as a young brother, as most of our young brothers are, you know the ones in special education, those brothers I'm talking about, those that do not have that male influence, he was influenced by his father's memory and by the books that he inherited. So he read these books, and as he was growing, he constantly heard references made to Ethiopia, A-E-T-H-I-O-P-I-A. And what began to happen was an interest in this. He went to Alcorn A&M uh, Grammar School because down the South in these days, and even maybe even now, uh, the colleges used to have high schools and used to have elementary schools, and you could almost go straight through uh, one full lifetime and, and graduate from college. He went to Alcorn A&M. He studied. But what happened in high school was that he didn't particularly care for the things that he was studying because there were things that were happening inside of him which Dr. Richard King would call the collective unconscious. And it began to work on him, and it began to talk to him. And this information I am getting from his writing, from handwritten letters. And as we go through, I'm going to tell you some of the backtracking that had to be done in order to find this out. Because when we're talking about researching, and to my young brothers, and although our sisters may not be here who are in, do we have any young sisters who are in college that would be counterparts to our brothers up here? Well, in, in their absence, we'll speak in general because our sisters are their counterparts and we must always keep this balance going. So our brothers and sisters, research, the ability to research is just not about going into a book and reading. <coughs> what it is is that as Dr. Jeffries has put his model down, and you're going to see this model appear throughout these two sessions that I have. What you have is the book. Well, I shouldn't put the book here. What you have is the interest. What makes you pick up the book? Then you have the book. But it does no good. You have to have a process going on. Something has to happen to make you think about the book. And what you find out about the book and the information that you're reading comes here. When I first began researching Professor Hansberry, I had an interest and I had material. But what I found out about him as I brought the two together allowed us to the importance of the curriculum of correction. And why it is important that we do it now, no more talking. We must go back to Dr. Clark, as we always return to the master. And we must understand that we must never put our ability in the oppressor's hands. Because if they had the ability to help us, they would destroy us. Please know that. Please know that the most dangerous thing that's happening among us today is consciousness. Mm -hmm. To see our brothers and sisters in high school, in grammar school, wearing arms, kinti cloth, 
All of these different things that are evolving. People always say what happened to the 60s. Well, the 60s became the 70s. The 70s became the 80s, and now we're in the 90s. This is a process of growth. This is evolution. This is like Nun, Patal, and Atun. These brothers, being influenced, having an interest in their culture is Nun. Their ability to be with a scholar such as Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Scobie, Professor Yarborough, and all those connected with CCNY then resurrect our young brothers and sisters to consciousness which is up to them. I like visual. You'll see a lot of these as we go through. In fact, next week you're going to see an experience job, because I'm going to get tired of writing here on this board all night long. <laughs> so I'm going to be able to flip these pages out of a while and we'll have no problem. <laughs> but what you have happening in William Leo Hansberry's life is that he's becoming interested around his sophomore year in high school. There's something happening to this brother, and you can see by the way he's writing. <coughs> something is connecting with this brother. And what he begins to do, and what he decides to do, is that he transfers. He transfers to Knoxville. Knoxville in Tennessee. Now, mind you, he lives in Mississippi, but he wants to go to Tennessee. Something's happening to him. So what he does is he transfers to Knoxville, Tennessee. However, in Knoxville, Tennessee, there's a lot of agricultural courses. This brother wants to get down on some serious African knowledge. He's being uh, weighed down by courses in agriculture, demonstration agriculture. This brother says, yes, Booker T. Washington was a wonderful person, but there's something I'm after, and I can't find it in Knoxville. So he decides to go on to Atlanta University. And at, and at, at I'm sorry, and at Atlanta University, he realizes that what's beginning to happen is that something else is beginning to occur. France Boas' works begins to appear. Felix Dubois, Timbuktu the Mysterious begins to appear. A lot of different things start to happen. And what he decides to do is he's going to put all this down and he's going to start to read. When he read France Boas' work and when he read uh, Felix Dubois' work, which was published in Atlanta <coughs> University at this time, he says, where can I find more information? And he's having problems. But you know how the ancestors work with us, where they show us the way? He goes away during the summertime and he's reading the crisis done by Du Bois. And what he sees is an advertisement for a book called The Negro. He sends away for the book and he reads the book. And when he reads this book by Du Bois, he realizes at this time he has got to find the books on the bibliography. He returns to Atlanta University and he starts looking for the books. But at that time, Atlanta University didn't have the kinds of books that he wanted. He wanted books like uh, Lady Lugard. Lady Lugard's uh, A Tropical Dependency, because this was one of the books that the boys were. He wanted to see some of this, because it was small capsules. The Negro, for those of us who have read it, it gives you good information, but it gives you the information in capsules. Something like what they never taught you in history class. Capsules of information on ancient civilizations. But this brother wants to go deep now, you see. He's already read his daddy's work, and now he's read Felix Dubois' work, and he's read Frank Boa's work, and now he's got the crisis, and he decides he wants more. So he's looking all around for this work, and he can't find it anywhere. He goes and he asks, where can I find this work? And he comes upon the head of the sociology and history department, uh, John Bingham, and John Bingham, Professor John Bingham tells him, well, the only places you'll find these works is at Harvard, Columbia, or the Library of Congress. At this point, William Leo Hansberry's <coughs> life changes. Mind you now, he's moving around in many different places in the South. And for a young African-American male, at this time, to be doing this is phenomenal. But to be willing to take the sacrifice that he's about to take is even greater because the brother doesn't have the kind of money he needs. Remember, his mother has married by now, and he doesn't have the kinds of money he, he needs. So what he does is that he works, and he saves enough money to get to heart. That's all he has. It was at this point that the first thing that he does when he leaves, um, when he leaves Atlanta University is he comes up to Cambridge, Massachusetts, first thing he does is go to the library at all. It's the first thing he does. And he begins to read Lady Lugard's Tropical Dependency. This changes his entire image. 
his entire focus. And what he knows is that he's got to get into this information. However, guess what? The brother don't have no place to sleep that night. He doesn't have any money. So he's reading in the library. There's a gentleman sitting across from him. And when the guy finds out that Professor Hansberry, or at this time, young William Leo, doesn't have a place to sleep, he invites him back to the dorm to bunk with him. So he does that. To make this all, this piece of the work short, sweet, to the point, because, again, there's a lot I can say about this period. What William Leo Hansberry does is that he works in the dining halls of Harvard University. The very same students that he sits next to in class, he is serving them dinner and lunch and breakfast. But there's something in the back of this brother's mind yeah. that when you read his biography by many people, unless you've gotten into the research, you might be led astray. And this is why it's so important that when we do research, that we do comparative research, that we not only go to what is written, but that we go to other things that refer back. Because when you do that, you create an image of somebody that might not be true. Because you're reading information, but there are other things going on at the same time. The only reason why he's in Harvard, he don't care nothing about that degree. He cares nothing about the education he's getting from Harvard. You've heard Dr. Jeffries talk about his, what was it, billion dollar in, uh, uh, education? You, you heard that. We William Hansberry's not interested in this. He wants to read every book on Du Bois' bibliography. And unless you can get into that piece of it, which is in a letter in his home, you're going to miss the most important reason why he's in Harvard, and you're going to misinterpret why he does what he does as he goes through. He becomes a special student, which is non-matriculating. For those of us who have been non-matriculating, as myself and, and probably many of us, it means that you're not going for the degree. You're just taking certain credits that at some time down the road may go into your degree, but it's not going to your degree. He's not allowed in. However, in some of the letters that are written from, you see, this is the admissions department writing to different scholars. Will you accept William Leo Hansberry in your class? He's a wonderful person, but I just want to tell you, he's a colored boy. These are letters written that he doesn't know is being written at the time. There are, there are teachers who write back to the admissions director saying, I'll accept him. There are others who say, I want no part of him. But he gets in as a special student. He goes away one summer, uh, the, the summer after being a non-matriculating student, and, he, and it's in Rhode Island, Narragansett Hotel, or Motel. And he works as a presser, as a cleaner, he washes dishes, and he orders books, and he transports himself with this money from Narragansett in Rhode Island to Cambridge at the library. And he begins to continue to read the books. You're going to hear me say this constantly because this is what's driving him. It's not Harvard. He don't care if he's not matriculating. He wants the books. He wants this information. So he goes back again. They take him in as a special student. All of a sudden, in the second year, they decide that they are going to give him more courses than necessary. But now, Something else happens. Remember, this is around 1917, 1918, 1919, World War I. Since Du Bois had such an impact on Hansberry, what Hansberry does is he enlists in World War I. He serves in the army for four months. He is, because of his college education, he is the uh, assistant to the commander on the base. And what he does is that he returns to Harvard because the World War I ends. He's only in four months before it ends. He returns to Harvard, but check this out. Because he served in the war, and because he's been a non-matriculating student, he's looked upon more with a little bit more pride. Respect. There it is, Sister Franklin. Respect. So they say, okay, we're going to take you in, and now you can matriculate. So he starts to matriculate. But now he's running out of money. There are letters that are in, in Howard University, in his home, where he's writing to a Major Higginson, who at that time is a European-American uh, philanthropist who helps African-American students. He writes to Major Higginson. Major Higginson writes to admissions. Registrar asks him, well, what, 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 what about this William Leo Hansberry? Is he worth in, uh, investing? They say, absolutely not. We've given him all the money we can. 
He's borrowed up to his neck, and he needs to go out, make more money, and then he can come back and devote his time to education. Obviously, since he's working, and since he's also uh, in school, he can't do both. He's not a good investor. Major Higginson writes back to William Lillard Hansberry, tells him, I'm sorry, uh, I cannot uh, support you. So what's the first thing William Lillard Hansberry does? William Lillard Hansberry works out his schedule because there is a special degree at that time that said if you completed three quarters of your coursework, which he did, and if you served in the war, you would get an SB degree, which was a war degree. He realizes with this degree, he can begin to teach as a full professor. <laughs> the brother is working. <laughs> he gets his war degree, he's granted the war degree, and he is given office. He's given office from Atlanta University to work in the social studies department or social science at that time, or he can go to Straight College in New Orleans. He chooses Straight College because through a deal, and again, these are in the letters, he is given permission to develop a department of African Studies. Oh. Hey, right on time. <laughs> At this time, he is ready to take off. Prior to going to Straight College, he visits a lot of different colleges, a lot of campuses, a lot of YMCA's, a lot of different areas, and he raises money for himself to be able to at least offset some of the money. It is in Straight College that he begins his curriculum of correction. You know this same thing we're talking about in 1990? We're talking about 1921. He begins to develop a lot of different uh, articles, and he writes an article entitled The Material Culture of Ancient Nigeria. In this article, Professor Hansberry compares the West African artifacts and West African structures to the structures of East Africa and shows quite succinctly. Now, this is 1921. This brother's approximately 26, 27 years old. He shows the same thing that Dr. Sheikh Abdel Diop shows in that mat and another master's work, Dr. Sheikh Abdel Diop. He shows the relationship between West Africa and East Africa, and he uses the artifacts that he has seen to make this comparison. It's accepted. Whatever happens, he gets a little bit of notoriety, gets a little bit of credit, and what he begins to do is to teach at Straight College. He also continues to write his curriculum of correction, because he's not going to give that up, because that's the thing he's working on. He raises enough money to go on a tour. And in North Carolina, he meets his third influence in his life. Let me go back. His first influence is his father. His second influence is his mother. His third influence is uh, Professor Hooten of the Peabody Museum. I'm sorry, his fourth um, mentor. His fourth mentor is Dr. Jesse Moore, who's on the board of trustees of Howard University. In North Carolina, Jesse Moreland hears this young brother talk and says, we got to get him at Howard University. No matter what we do, we got to get him here. Whatever it takes, we've got to get him here. We're going to get into some problems that he had, and you're going to begin to see why we must come together now. We must not fight among ourselves anymore. Because for those of you who have read about Professor Hansberry, you have read about two professors that had it out for him. And I don't know if you've ever been told their name, but he has written a letter, and I have it in my possession, where he names them. And I think you'll be surprised at who they are. Because these happen to be individuals that we today respect very greatly. I came upon some information three weeks ago that hurt me even deeper. Because there is a third scholar who plotted behind Hansberry's back to almost destroy him. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you, my brothers and sisters, not because I want to create controversy, but because we must never let it happen. Professional jealousy must stop among us. We must understand that it's the parts that make the whole. Yes. And if any part is out of sync, it's like if Jupiter goes out of its ecliptic orbit. Our entire universe is destroyed. So we have to talk the truth. We have to name some names. We have to get into some interesting conversations. Yes. 
because we got to talk and we you know, we have to talk on it and we have to talk in front of our young brothers and our young sisters so that we can understand and work it out so that it does not happen again. Professor Hansberry tells Dr. Mullen, I'm not quite ready yet to go to Howard University. Some more things I want to do. So now he's got enough money. He returns to Harvard. And he works with Hooten again. Now, he's not going towards his bachelor's degree. He doesn't have his bachelor's degree yet. He's still got this SB degree, but he wants to raise enough money so that he doesn't have to go through this nonsense anymore. So he begins to go back to Harvard and he begins to study, but he takes graduate courses, but these graduate courses don't go towards his bachelor's. These are just simultaneous courses he's taking to get himself through all of this. Finally, he decides to go to Howard. And he is notified by Jesse Morland. There's letters going back between Jesse Morland and Stanley Durkee and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, there's another gentleman, Dr. Charles Wesley, who was the, the director of the history department at Howard at this time, who also was a Harvard graduate with a PhD, and what's interesting is that Dr. Charles Wesley was going for his PhD when Professor Hansberry was going for his bachelor's. There's a great deal of respect between them and among them. And this is what is really on Professor Hansberry's side. What happens is that Professor Hansberry then uh, writes letters. Jesse Morland is telling him, write to Stanley Jerky, tell him this. He then says, write to Charles Wesley and tells him this. Then Charles Wesley is writing to uh, Professor uh, to Stanley Durkee. And there's a whole triangle thing going on here. This is what I'm talking about research. And these are the things that we must do. We cannot just go to one source and say we know it all. We've got to go from one source to another and almost make it like a detective story so that we can, un we can tell the truth. So that we don't make these mistakes again. Because we rely on certain people and certain people, although they may be very scholarly, and they are, they're, they're saying it and they're not researching and going deeper into the causes and the effects. And when you go into the causes and the effects, Hansberry rises like the sun. He rises. You can see it in his writing. You can see it in his development. You can see it as he's talking to these people. He's learning to do his job. And he's doing it well. Professor Hansberry starts teaching. People are literally frightened. Mm -hmm. See, this is the Harlem Renaissance. We're talking about... Uh, the fall term of 1921. We're talking, I'm sorry, 22. We're talking about a lot of different things going on at this time. Let me take that back. It is the, he begins teaching at Howard during the spring term of 1922, but he begins the process during the fall term of 1921. So there's a lot of different things going on. He comes in, please know this is around the Hall of Renaissance. You've got a lot of people coming forward now. They're, people are paying attention to what they call the Negro intellectual. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, here comes this Hansberry. Mm -hmm. Got an SB degree. Oh, Elaine Lock. Mm -hmm. Elaine Lock is a Rhodes Scholar. He's yeah. proud of that scholar, isn't it? Rhodes Scholar. Mm -hmm. It's like someone of Jewish faith mm -hmm. getting a Hitler scholarship and being proud of it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Cecil Rhodes was the Hitler of South Africa. That's mm -hmm. right. The murderer. We must be careful when we say we are Rhodes Scholar. It means nothing except you've spent money that killed your people. That's what a Rhodes Scholar is. Yes. Plus, you don't really learn much anyway. <laughs> because you're in universities that don't have the capacity to teach you what you need to know. This is why when our young brothers and young sisters are exposed to Dr. Jeffries, to Dr. Scoldy, to our sister Camille Yarbrough, to be in the presence of this kind of assembly, this is what education is. Thank See, you. education comes from the from a Roman word, a Latin word, educare, which means to bring out. And as the brother was talking about training, this is what we do to our children. This is what we do to our <laughs> students. We train them like seals. Hey, jump up here. You jump fish. Perform a trick, and you'll get a fish. Perform a trick, and you'll get a job. <laughs> That's the trick. We're training them. We are not educating them. We are not bringing the education out of them. Because I honestly believe from the African, the Kinetic perspective, that every child is born with everything they need to know. And as they go through the educational system, it is the fine-tuning of the teachers that brings this information out of them. That shows them, this is what you have. This is what is here. When you bring them together, then you are like Atum. You have risen to the top. You have synthesized your thesis, 
and your an antithesis, and you've been able, through a method of movement, been able to get an education. I had a friend graduate from Queens College. He said, Brother Booker, let me tell you, I got something that three quarters of my classmates did not get. I said, Brother Steve, what was that? He said, I got an education. And that was true, <coughs> because the brother was conscious. And unfortunately, most of our young people <coughs> leaving college are not conscious. They are blind. And what we've got to do is to begin to bring out this information in them so that they become conscious and so that they become knowledgeable. You have William Leo Hansberry here. William Leo Hansberry is given permission because remember Jesse Morland's behind him. Jesse Morland is not only a graduate of, How uh, of Howard University, but he's on the board of trustees. He's looking out for him. William Leo Hansberry is like his buddy, his young son, that he's going to bring through this whole piece because at this time Jesse Morland is trying to bring about, he's trying to pull out of the history department and African studies department because remember, as people of African descent, and I'm not saying this is generally true, but when you went into Howard, you did not learn African or African American history. Mm -hmm. Anything you learned of the African or African American history, you learned through history. <coughs> now, of course, that's wonderful in terms of the curriculum of correction, if we could infuse that, but unfortunately, in the history department, you did not learn those types of things. See, people were trying to speak Latin and Greek and all the rest of them things. You see, they go around campus. Can, can you imagine brothers and sisters walking around talking Latin and Greek to each other? We were hands raised with somebody, I want some metanecha here. Yeah. We some metanecha to talk. I don't want to talk no Greek and Latin, but he had to study it. He had to study it, first of all, to get accepted. He had to study it in order to be able to transcribe and, and understand what he was reading about in the Greek and Latin books that he'd grown up with. So he did it only as a means to an end. It wasn't the end. Yes. You didn't catch him talking Latin and Greek on the campus of Howard. But you did see him reading it when he was, had to read the book. So he did what he had to. But at the same time, he understood what he had to do. And this is what our young brothers and our young sisters have to do. They have to understand what it is that you have to do to get to where you got to go. You see, because we're not talking about just content here. We're not talking about, it's not interesting. It is not important for our young people to know about the pyramids. What's important is to understand that a society was put in place that allowed great people to rise. See, Imhotep is not important. It's the society that allowed an Imhotep to rise. This is what's important. Skill building with our young people. Critical thinking and reasoning skills. So that when they look at a newspaper or when they look at the news and that they see that many that look like them that they cannot see their face because they've got uh, 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 coats over their head and they got those um, bracelets on. You, you know those comedic bracelets they got out here now? <laughs> comedic bracelets, they got them all, all the time. Mm -hmm. That they can see and perceive that there's a reason why they're looking at this. Mm -hmm. And that they don't get mistaken and misunderstand what's actually being said to them. Critical thinking and reasoning skills. And this is what Hansberry was beginning to develop and begin to put in place at Howard University. He's given permission to start three courses on African history, and wow, that shook the campus. Never before had they ever heard anything. For instance, Negro peoples in the civilizations of the prehistoric and ancient world. Negro civilizations in East Central Africa from the 8th century BC until the end of the 16th century. Negro civilizations in West, in West Central Africa from 900 AD to the end of the 19th century. This brother covered the gamut because he knew he could only do certain courses. So what he did is he structured them so that he could cover the whole piece. But as we go through this dialogue that we're going to do tonight, you are going to begin to see that what he really developed was an entire curriculum in place, but he expanded it as he went along. As the people who allowed him to do it, allowed him to do it, he expanded with them. The brother was a chameleon. The brother was an African chameleon who could adapt to his surroundings and be able to do for his people what was necessary. I don't need to tell you that within three years, he had already had over 812 students. And let me tell you something. He was only allowed to teach freshmen, and he taught a correspondence course. So it wasn't like he was even accepted, and his courses weren't mandated. But because of this brother's magnitude, and because of his presence, and I'm going to show you some slides of him because I think you need to see him. I'm sorry I don't have a tape of him, because I want you to hear him. I want you to be able to understand who he is, and the part that he has played in our life, 
and the fact that he is amongst us right now. He is with us. It is his word that has guided us, and it's important that we know this, because the curriculum of correction was begun by him. And as I just told you, his courses that he had were the first courses in the history of this civilization that existed in any university anywhere in the world. Professor Hansberry entitled, entitled his first curriculum at this time, An Introduction to Ancient and Medieval Civilizations. The areas he covered in his courses were Africans in Europe and Asia, Africans in Egypt and Ethiopia, the Zimbabwe culture, West Africa, and the Sudan. Has he missed it? No. This brother didn't miss it. Oh, did he? <laughs> the brother had it together. What began to happen was fear, professional jealousy. There were people who were very serious. Not only were they lose their job, Sister Franklin, but you know what happened? There was a certain aura in Howard. You see, it's bougie there. It's still bougie. But back then, if you didn't have a PhD, who are you? If you are a bachelor's degree, hey, you're not even in the game. And this brother didn't have a bachelor's degree. He still had his war degree. So you know how they felt about him. So they began to plot. They began to plot. Stanley Dirk, the president. But I'm going to tell you how the ancestors work. There are letters that are being written at this time between Jesse Moreland, Stanley Dirk, and Charles Wesley. The two people involved in this conspiracy, Elaine Locke and Ernest Just. They, uh, there is a letter that was written by Hansbury to Jesse Moreland, and he's saying to Jesse Moreland, he's saying, I don't understand he calls it misdirected zeal and professional jealousy. He says, I do not understand why Ernest Just has told Dr. Stanley Durkee that he has invited me over to his home, sat down with me, and quizzed me on my knowledge of Africa. Because not only has he not invited me to his home, but every time we on campus, he turns his head when I come by. Mm. So people are not telling the truth. We all know Ernest Just. Don't we respect him? And didn't that brother do many great things? But you see, when Satesh, Satesh is in all of us. And what happens is that when professional jealousy begins to be to surface, when you begin to see that there is somebody who has a war degree but has the kind of charisma that can bring people around to, to have 812, there's a letter that Professor Hansberry writes more, and he says, I may suspect that this might be the problem. And he goes on to say that we had a very successful summer school. I had 13 students in my anthropology class. I had 24 students in my history class. And unfortunately, Elaine Locke had zero. You see what's happening? The need for research to be able to go into these letters. And you see, this letter is not where you find it. This letter from Hansbury is in Jesse Moreland's file in the archives of Howard University's library, the founder's library. Now, if we were just dealing with Hansbury and we didn't get into the other people who impacted his life, and I want to say this to my brothers and sisters in research, if we had just gotten into Hansbury, because I pulled Hansbury's file, but I came upon someone by the name of Dr. Doris Hull, who is a librarian and history teacher at Howard and who was a student of Hansbury. And she said, well, you just don't want Hansbury's file. You want Jesse Morland's file, you want Elaine Locke's file, you want Ernest Just's file, you want a whole bunch of files. Because you're going to see some things happening here that's going to surprise you. See, I thought I had a, a, a zip, zip, zip uh, thesis here. I didn't realize that I had one of the first African-American soap opera series. <laughs> because that's what it is. It is those things that rise in us, no matter how great we are, no matter how wonderful we are, that pit us against each other. And then you have people who come in between us and begin to play games. So here's Stanley Durkin. You want to play some games? Hansbury stood back. Jesse Moore said, Hansbury, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And as you know, Stanley Durkin was the last European-American president of Howard University. And it was because of Hansbury. <laughs> so if he, didn't, if he never did anything else, at least he did. <laughs> You see, Hansbury is dynamic. Mm -hmm. He has shown Dr. Morland that he's serious, that he's a scholar, that he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Dr. Morland said, don't you mess with my man. 
because I will chill you out. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. Stanley Durkee became the last European American president of Howard University. And it, it was the, there were a lot of things that happened. Because first of all, the student protested when they brought charges against Hansburg. Mm -hmm. Students wouldn't go to class. Mm -hmm. You think that what happened with uh, Professor James Cheek was the first time it happened? Mm -hmm. It happened back in 1925. Mm -hmm happened in 1924 and it was because the students didn't want any more part of what was going on it wasn't just because of Hansbury there was a lot of things happening at Howard at this time and Hansbury was one of the things that had happened because he already taught 814 students and they didn't want no part of this they said no more so there was a student uprising there was the deal with Hansbury and there was total inefficiency because quite frankly Stanley Durkee was not an educator he was a preacher and he was contracted to come up here and become president of Howard University. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not the first time we've had ineffective and moral people in places of position, unfortunately, leading us. There we go. But we do have Jesse Morland and we do have Professor Hansberry to thank for that. So, Professor Hansberry in 1925, June 2nd and June 3rd, Professor Hansberry conducts a symposium. I would like to go through all of this. It would take a great deal of time, but again, all of this, you will get this information in time. But he goes through a 28-page symposium in 1925 where he covers from the very beginning of existence of the African world, which is the human world, to the period of bondage or hostage. You see, I like the word hostage nowadays. See, everybody uses the word hostage. You see, and when one hostage is, is thrown overboard, everybody gets upset. When 235 or 55 or something like that taken, everybody gets upset. How should we feel when 100 million hostages are taken and their children are still being mistreated? I think we should be concerned about that. And I think we should let them know that. Yeah, we do. But our brothers are. So we, we can see this happen. So it's important to know that Professor Hansberry at this time was beginning to evolve. Please know at this time he's also continuing to write the curriculum. He's also continuing to do a lot of different things. What he decided to do in 1929 is to go back and get his bachelor's degree. He takes a sabbatical, he goes back to Harvard University, and what he's doing is that he asks permission if he can take his requirements for his bachelor's and his master's at the same time. Harvard says no good, you've got to do your bachelor's first, then do your uh, graduate. He finishes his bachelor's work, but the brothers have a problem with French. Serious problem with French, just can't master French. Can't master French because it doesn't have the potential, He's too busy trying to get his curriculum together to put his mind into learning his language. His brother's trying to get into this history and his curriculum. And they keep telling him to speak French. He said, I'm not teaching French people in French. I'm speaking them in English, and I'd like to do this curriculum. They say, no good. You have to pass the language requirement. So what he does is that he asks permission, and he has Professor Hooten write a letter of permission if he can go ahead and take his uh, courses for his master's degree, if they will just allow him to postpone the French exam for his master's. So when they hear from Hooten, they say, well, we've got to give in here. Okay, you can go ahead for your master's degree, but you have to take your French before you get your master's degree. What happens is that he works something out with Howard and Harvard. Instead of going to Harvard to take his uh, French test, he takes it at Howard. <coughs> He passes. I don't know how. <laughs> he passes it, gets his master's degree, and he continues his work. So the brother's very serious. The brother knows what he wants. Please understand something. This brother knows what he wants. This brother's on a mission. In fact, there have been articles written on Hansbury, and there is one article entitled, William Little Hansbury, A Man in His Mission. <laughs> he knew what he wanted. He saw the vision. And all this out here wasn't going to get in his way. Mm -hmm. Elaine Locke wasn't going to get in his way. Ernest Just wasn't going to get in his way. Neither was the Toro Shamba. Oh, that broke my heart. I'm telling you, it hurt me. Because we have all respected, and I still respect him. That's not going to impact, and it should never impact. If anything, let's draw the positive from the negative. Because in 1924, they opened up King Tutankhamun's tomb again. And there was a delegation sent over there to witness this. And Jesse Morland wanted William Leo Hansberry to go. But Elaine Locke said, but I'm the Rhodes Scholar. I don't care if you got more students than I do. I'm the Rhodes Scholar. I should go. <coughs> so Elaine Locke had done a favor for Arturo Schomburg in setting up uh, the Schomburg collection in terms of the books that Schomburg wanted. 
So Schomburg repaid the favor by writing letters to Stanley Durkee and strongly recommending that William Leo Hansberry do not go mm. and that Elaine Locke should be sent to this place. Mm. Unfortunately. Mm. But the one thing is, please take the good from the bad. Oh, uh, this is what we must do with what we have. Take the good from the bad and learn from it. So that as we begin to develop and as we begin to grow, that we do not let certain personalities get in the way. We must always suppress Setesh. Yeah. That's the Usirian drama. That's the story of the Usirian drama. Unfortunately, some of our brothers and sisters, for whatever reason, sometimes can't do it. And I stand before you as no angel. I have my problems. We all have our little thing here. And what we've got to do is just work on it. That's what our ancestors told us to do. Yes, you may have your problems. But you see, the problem is not that you have the problem. You're allowed to make mistakes. You see, there's nothing wrong with having fear. A true man or a true woman is measured by what they do in face of that fear. So we don't try to become fearless. You see, when someone tells me they're fearless, I say, you're crazy. you guts to have fear. If you don't have fear, you're crazy. So you are not made by the fear you have. You are made by what you do in spite of that fear to overcome that fear. So instead of vibrating on the fear to become fearless, you vibrate on courage. And that's what we have to do, and that's what they should have done. Because as you can see right now, if them brothers had allowed Hansberry to do his thing and support him, we wouldn't be here now talking about no curriculum of, of, of correction. In fact, quite frankly, I think they would be here talking about how they need to be included. <laughs> but it didn't happen that way. We are here. And we got to do something about that. <laughs> okay. What began to happen in 1935, Professor William Leo Hansberry has written a lot of different places. He wants to be able to go to school. He wants to study at Oxford. He gets a grant to go to Oxford, but prior to going to Oxford, he studies at the University of Chicago to prepare himself. He studies during the summer of 1935 and 1936. At uh, the University of Chicago, he studies the work of James Breasted and all of the other work that's in the University of Chicago to get himself ready. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in Chicago, a uh, love bug here. Oh, that's good. That was wonderful for him. <laughs> he said he had never seen such a beautiful African queen in his life. <laughs> and a lot of people said that. A lot of people in the interviews that we conducted yeah. said the brother was swept off his feet. Yes, he tried to get that curriculum together. And yes, he loved that. <laughs> Something touched that brother's heart. And I believe Myrtle Kelso. He met Myrtle Kelso. They were married. And um, he got, uh, they had their honeymoon in Europe because he studied at, at, at uh, Oxford. He returned and he was promoted. Uh, when he returned, 10 months later, he was promoted to... Uh, assistant professor in the history department and given two additional courses to teach. The brothers expanded. Mm. People and cultures of Africa in Stone Age times. Culture and political history of Nilotic lands and historical antiquity. Cultural and political history of Kushite or Ethiopian lands in the Middle Ages. Cultural and political history of the kingdoms and empires of the Western Sahara and the Western Sah uh, Sudan. Mm. And archaeological methods and materials. This was key because he wanted to train his students to take his place. He began to train them on the methods of archaeology. What do you do? I mean, you come upon a find. What do you do? What does it mean? What is carbon-14 dating? What is potassium argon? How is it that this means something? How do you know that it comes prior to whatever it is? So this course was very important that he began to add. He continues teaching at Howard University. But what happens, please remember, that the uh, World War II is breaking out. Now here's a very important part of Professor Hansberry's life, because you're going to understand the impact that this man had on the African world. He is contacted by Ethiopians, because he is known at Howard University by this time as the father of African students. People, and another thing that, was, that goes throughout all of the interviews and the work that I've, I've seen on him, is that he never trained them to remain here. He always taught them that their obligation was to return to Africa and to share with their people what he and others had taught them. They were, would return. For instance, the Ethiopian students would return. What happened was is that they sent a message through the grapevine 
that they needed Hansberry's help in Ethiopia because at this time, this is when Italy is encroaching itself on Ethiopia's sovereignty. Professor Hansberry gets some people together. He gets something called the Ethiopian Research Council together. And what happens, he sends a delegation over. Mind you, this brother in the 30s, late 30s, sends a delegation over to check. Now, mind you, he's also working with the United States government. Because in getting the monies and the funds needed to send these people over, he had to be able, because remember, Italy was not on the side of America. So they send him over, and Hansberry doesn't go. He says, you go. He calls William Steen off to the side, and he said, listen, now you go ahead and do what they tell you to do. Because you know what you got to do, because we need to find this out, and we need to free our brothers and sisters. But when you get over there, I want you to talk to some people, because they have some material for you. And he tells them what he wants them to say, that clue word. And once that clue word comes, all this material on African history is put into their hands. They return it to William Leo Hansberry in America. The Count Chiano becomes very offended that uh, William Leo Hansberry is about to finance Haile Selassie's visit to America. The Italian government gets angry and sends a letter to the United States State uh, Department and says, we take exception to William Leo Hansberry. The brother is powerful, political. He's not only an educator, but he's political. And as we go through this, there was something else I told Sister Emma I wasn't going to say, but brothers, you got me fired up this evening, yes. and we got to talk on it. So we're going to talk about his political activity because it's important that you understand what he was doing. Oh, he had something else. He had a vision. And like Dr. Clark says, you can achieve what you will as long as you don't go out in the street and run your mouth. Shut up. Do it. Don't say you your brother's keeper. Just keep it. And that's what Professor Hansberry did. Okay. Now, there is uh, an article appeared in Time magazine, and it's telling of how an Ethiopia traveling to Manhattan, Kansas, can't get a haircut. William Leo Hansberry says he wants to do something about this. And what he decides to do is that he sets up a council with the assistance of William Steen, James Grant, Robert W. Williams, Jr., and Henry, uh, Henrietta Van Noy, and William Gray. He organizes the Institute for African American Relations. You know that big, beautiful building down there by the U.N. called the African American Institute? Mm -hmm. William Leo Hansberry created it. Mm -hmm. But you know why you don't know about it? Because in Washington, D.C., a group of European Americans said, well, uh, if we're going to get an institute going here, we need some finance. William Leo Hansberry and these European Americans make a deal. And this deal is you can go to New York and set up your financial arm of the African American Institute. We don't want it here. But in return, you must finance Africa. And I'm going to return to Africa House because that's very important. But at the same time that he's doing this, Goldie Seifert, Charles Seifert's wife, Charles Seifert and, and, and William Hansberry were very good friends. Goldie Seifert, after um, uh, Charles Seifert had passed away, called William Leo Hansberry and asked him if he would begin to develop a program of study, which he does. And what is most interesting is that it is here that Malcolm X walked in on William Leo Hansberry and began to get a sense, not only from studying with Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben and all of the other scholars that he studied with, but Malcolm X was also impacted by William Leo Hansberry at the Seifert Research Center. So when we begin to see Malcolm X budding in his Afrocentricity, it is not by mistake, it is by design. And he begins to see the development and the interaction. I'm not saying that William Lewis Hansberry was the reason why Malcolm did it. I'm saying that he was another influence in that great brother's transformation. Okay, now, this African American Institute begins to uh, support Africa. They have um, headquarters in Lagos, Nigeria, Dar es Salaam, Tanganyika, Washington, D.C., and New York. What they begin to do is miraculous. Nambi Ezekiel, first president, 
Nigeria, was a student of Hansberry's during the late 20s. Kwame Nkrumah was a student of William Leo Hansberry. Africa House was an underground revolutionary movement that taught Africans how to revolt against the colonial system. You can do anything as long as you're not in the street running your mouth. Kwame Nkrumah begins to buzz other Africans trained in America, and, I, and I'm sure that you know far more than I, there are those scholars in this room who know the African scholars who studied in America, who studied at Howard University, who studied in these different areas in order to get an education. But everybody, no matter where they were in America, came to Africa House because everyone knew that was the Underground Railroad. William Leo Hansberry was not a man of talk. He was a man of action. And the reason why you may not know him, it is because he designed it that way because he knew if you knew this, they would know this. And if they knew this, they would snuff him out. So he was quiet. He let everybody stand up and get credit for all of these different things. Like when he, in 19, uh, 50, uh, 1953, received a Fulbright scholarship. And he went to Africa for the first time in his life. The brother went to Africa to study. And as he began to travel, throughout Africa, and you've got to know the places that he went to because it's very important. During this time, he lectured and studied in Kenya, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Kinshasa, Ghana, Nigeria, Zanzibar, Tanganyika, Malawi, Zambia, and Liberia. Not to mention the research he did in Egypt, where he was based with his family, in, in the Sudan, and, and in Ethiopia. This is what this brother did in 1953. <coughs> However, this was a, a, a Fulbright scholarship. When he returned to uh, Howard University, he came to realize that in his absence, Howard University had received a grant from the Ford Foundation to establish an African Studies de uh, Department. And unfortunately, instead of uh, appointing Professor Hansberry, who would naturally be the person for this position, E. Franklin Frazier. Oh, E. Franklin Frazier. No, I'm sorry, brother. I didn't mean to make you leave. <laughs> <laughs> However, I must tell you, from all of the interviews and all of the things that have been said, the brother never held a grudge. Why didn't he hold a grudge? Because the brother had a vision. I go back to that vision. He knew what he wanted. He understood human nature. And he would let nothing get in his way. But you know something? Despite the fact that E. Franklin Frazier was in charge of it, despite the fact that all of these things had happened, that they had a whole bunch of scholars, there was a great deal of interest, uh, the deal was that you would get Africa House, but you can only deal with the colonial period forward. They knew where Hansbury was coming from. He was ready to take them students back to uh, the Great Lakes region. Right. You see, <laughs> making them rise up out of the Central Lakes region. They said, no, that's not going to happen. We, we want these African students to rise with change. Don't let them rise with the crown. They got to rise with those comedic bracelets. <laughs> Despite that, he had no problem. In 1957, he was contacted by a great historian to come to the new school to uh, teach an African study course, which he did. He became a very good friend, uh, and he became a mentor to this particular historian. and. This man was Dr. John Henry Ford. And it was out of this experience that Dr. John Henry Clark and I sat down in 1983 and discussed William Leo Hansberry. And I got a sense of where he was coming from. Hansberry retired from Howard University in 1959. Believe it or not, Howard University still owed him money that they refused to pay him. Uh, they did not treat him right. Myrtle Hansberry did not care for Howard University. But despite that, Professor Hansberry had a smile on his face because, for one thing, when he left Howard University, they did have an African Studies Department. And his vision was clear that although it was starting at the colonial period, he knew that there would come a time when people would go back. And brothers and sisters would go that we have to realize 
That is Professor Hansberry or Professor Clark. Professor Clark teaches us and we teach our young brothers and sisters. <laughs> this is the continuum. This is the map that was laid out for the curriculum of correction. So before I even get into the curriculum of correction for next week, we have to deal with this so that you can understand clearly the map, the road, and those diversions that will destroy us. Nothing must stop us. Our young people are ready. They are like sponge and water, dry sponge at that. They are ready. They are willing. They are able. And I'm telling you, when I heard these young brothers doing that rap, I couldn't help but go back to Africa and hear Griot. Right. They, they are training to be Griot. Right. That's what rap is. When they were doing breakdance, breakdance is capoeira yeah. from Angola. Yeah. Everything that goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. We are standing now in the same place that <coughs> Professor William Leo Hansberry stood. But the one thing that we must promise ourselves is that this time they will not stop us. Because I'm telling you, our children are ready. But on the other side of that being ready, our children are dying. When a child can be shot in the bosom of his or her grandma, when they can be shot in the stomach in their own house, we need to do something. But please, we're facing negativities. But please understand, don't get caught up in crack. You don't have to worry about crack. Marcus Garvey showed us that we could go off alcohol, which was the crack of his day. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad went into the prison. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad took people off heroin. That was the crack of that day. You see, the drugs get worse in terms of its ability to addict us because of what Kwame Tori says. They see us rising. And for those of us who remember drugs in our community, I remember when drugs came into the projects down there in Lincoln Center where I live. I remember when it came. It came when the brothers started standing on the corner and instead of singing do up, they started singing do right. <laughs> Let's get it on. That's when drugs came in. Crack is in our communities, not because we're susceptible to it, but because they hear what our young brothers and sisters are talking about. That's why crack is here. And if we can get to our kindergarten children and our first grade children and our second grade children and get them through a continuum of education from a committed point of view, there will be no stopping us. And for those of us who are teachers in this room, we are on the front line of this war. And I can tell you that our children are ready. They are beautiful. And you heard Dr. Jeffy talk about the troubles of District 9. <laughs> I'm from District 9. And I'm on camera, so I'm not going to say too much about District 9. But I will tell you that the children of District 9 are like the children of District 5 here in Harlem. And that they're ready. And in my research and what I've seen so far, the only ones that are not ready are the adults. Our children are ready, and we must pray and meditate on this. And we have to ask the spirits of Professor William Leo Hansberry, Carter G. Woodson, Sheikh Abdiya, all the answers. We must ask William Leo Hansberry to come forward and to resurrect himself in us so that our young people can resurrect us as Heru resurrected Lucia. Shemem Hotel, our moon is satisfied. Chancellor Williams, 
President John Henry Clark, William Steen, Joseph Harris, uh, Mark Hyman, Doris Hill, James Hinton, Bertrand Green, and Charles Seifert, Mrs. Charles Seifert. In Hansbury's home, when I walked down into his basement, I was awed. And it's unfortunate because, again, I want to say something about the Institute for Youth. Because the Institute for Youth, under the direction of and the leadership of our elder sister, Irma Lean, what we did is that uh, I wrote an artwork that I had done in leather to sell to begin a fund to put his work in acid-free folks. It is literally deteriorating. Mm. Literally. And this is another thing I want to tell you. You see, we don't need a, a Herbert Affleck. We need to do it ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. This brother has got a basement and an attic full of maps, of graphs, of lithographs. That's right. And I've been in contact with the daughter constantly trying to let her know. But in answer to your question, there is a wonderful array of information that Hansbury has put together. And when we begin, and, and when I can get finally this published and let you see what it is, because I extracted some of the more important pieces, yeah. you're going to begin to see some dynamic information this brother has. But I just want to tell you this and answer your question. You see, we're talking about the education in terms of, uh, uh, we talking about uh, William Leo Hansberry in terms of the education, if you the teacher. Right. We have spoken in terms of his political aspirations of what he did politically in his house he has got two thick volumes on African theosophy as I see it do I have to tell you more? no, no. no. let me tell you something this brother was aware of the collective unconscious and the point wait see I had heard Richard King speak about the collective unconscious first word of life yeah but when I read Professor Hansberry's work, I went straight to the top. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> and there was no problem anymore in understanding yeah, was... what it is that we have to do. Yeah. This brother understood philosophy. He understood theosophy. And he understood what happens when you take the spirit and the body and you have a vision and you take the method. He has two pieces on theosophy and it's handwritten. Mm -hmm. oh. And it's in the back. So that if you did come, you see the file drawers when you walk down in the basement, you come this way. The file drawers are up against this wall, and he has file drawers up against that wall, 25 altogether. The theosophy piece is in the back, way in the back. So that the chances are, he figures that when you walk in, which I did, the first, I went right to the left. For me to get to where the theosophy was, I would have had to really been interested in this brother. You understand? You know how the Africans did it in Kemet? You know when you go into Abu Simbel mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're looking at the Battle of Kadesh? Mm -hmm. If you are of, of consciousness, you can understand what the Battle of Kadesh is. Mm -hmm. But if you are not of consciousness, you're not going to understand what that says. You're going to think that's a war between people, which it may have been, but that's another kind of war. The same is true for his view of theosophy, which is spirituality. The brother was on top. And he needs to be not only remembered, not only revered, but resurrected. Yeah. because he's a very important force in our life and although he is unsung we sing his praises tonight so therefore you will be putting uh, together uh, uh, I have a base fund and I would like you see being from district 9 I don't like to touch other people's money so I, I've, I've learned that I would like Gail Hansbury to be contacted I would like Kay Hansberry to be contacted. Because you know, they suffered. The family, I've not even talked to you about what the family had to go through. They suffered a great deal. And I think that that should be purchased from them. And that needs to be put in acid free folders, on microfiche. And what we've got to do is make a copy for them to keep forever. And take his work and put it so that it will be with us forever. So that they can inherit it. That's right. Thank you. information I will contact Gail if, if there are groups of us who are willing to support this venture I will contact Gail and I will put something in place to make this happen but we collected these kinds of funds with the Institute for Youth because we felt that it was so important that it comes from us and that we resurrect him and that we are in control of what happens 
Because I'm telling you, don't let that theos don't let those theosophy books get out of your hands. Because you're giving away a lot of secrets. And I don't need to tell you about his Masonic Conventions. I'll leave that for another one. Uh, I, I have one question. Um, I think Sheikh Anza here mentioned that uh, the African uh, experience is not a there's, there's no part that's really lost. It's all there. And um, this brother, you, you've spoken up tonight. I've heard in passing that this is a revelation. And I'm wondering now, how, how can we put some of this knowledge in, in, in a working, functioning uh, apparatus? That they be, you know, because there's so much that we have, you know. We're rich, <laughs> you know, we're marvelously rich. But somehow we don't use our riches to enrich us. My brother, that's why I'm coming back next Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> that's why this had to be done in two parts. And that's why I thank Dr. Jeffries for allowing me this time, these two weeks, because we could never have done it in just one. And when we get together next week, you'll see why. Because next week I'm going to lay out, let me say one other thing. <coughs> And the people who were part of the Institute for Youth will bear me out on this. I studied under a particular professor to get my thesis done. Everything that Professor Hansberry stood for was what he tried to stamp out. I did not know this. But when I began to read Professor Hansberry's work, Sister Halima Ma was telling me hey, there's a group called ASCAP coming together. They're going to have to study. And they, they, they're they going to start a curriculum. Well, why don't you take part? I said, no, my sister Lima, I, I have to do this um, thesis. You know, I'm really working on this. I started working on Professor Hansberry's thesis. And what happened is I had to put it down. Because Professor Hansberry, now, please don't get me wrong on this. I'm not telling you that I started hearing voices. But I could hear him say, stop writing about me and write about what I tried to do. So I immediately put in place a curriculum. I put the thesis down. I have five years to do this or I'm going to lose my job. Because as a teacher, when you're appointed, you have five years to get a master's degree. If you don't get it, you lose your license. But something compelled me to put this down. His brother was telling me, forget me. Listen to what I'm saying, man. You're missing my point. Uh -huh. His writings were so clear on the curriculum and what you have to do to administer it. I put my thesis down and I started a curriculum. Okay, now all of a sudden come, <laughs> this is my fourth year. So I said, I'm sorry, Professor Hansbury, I'm working in the institute. Hey, tell me something. The people, they said, how many times I tell you I had to leave to finish my thesis? I said, at least three times I got to go to finish. So let, let me go and do this. I would go home. And Professor Hansberry would smack me upside right. my head. Right. Of course, I speak in jest. I'm on, you see, yeah. people yeah. use that. Right. Right. I say this in an analogy. Right. Because as I would get back into it, he'd say, put it down, man, and get back into the Institute for you. Right. I'd call Sister Irma next day. I'd say, Sister Irma, listen, you know, I know you think I'm fickle, but I'll be there on Saturday. I did this at least three times. At least three times. But this is the impact Professor Hansberry had. And you are absolutely right. And may I tell you something else? Which might be a little frightening. I hope you take this right. It makes absolutely no difference if we resurrect his work. You know why? Because we're already resurrected. And that's his story. You got everything you need. We're already rich. We're born with it. All you have to do is Adam Clay Powell says, use what you have now. But we will resurrect it. And we will do what we have to do. But even if we don't, we have everything we need to rise. All we need to do is put it in place. Next week, we're going to get it on. Let's get it on. Right. We're going to get it on next week.
surprised me. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Doctor Clark has always been talking about Leo Hand there, right. but um, he's never been able to explain him so we could feel him and taste him the way we have uh, today. And of course, I was just about to get heavy into Alain Locke. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I will. But um, I will with caution. <laughs> because I was doing a piece and I'm working on a piece on courageous Jewish scholars. See, because they want to call you anti Semite, so you got to take that and use that. Courageous Jewish scholars who have um, <laughs> broken through in terms of this whole African history that most Jews have cognitive dissonance in relationship to. We gotta understand that. Those people we call the European Jews cannot deal with the Nile Valley because their very essence, everything they learned about, their collective consciousness or unconscious is at stake. So when we talk about the Nile Valley and the significance, we're creating a monster for them. These teachers cannot deal with this. <laughs> and it takes a special courageous Jew to deal with them. And most of them have been monsters which means they've already gone through the metamorphosis of getting rid of that genome about dealing with the now. And so there's a whole uh, string of them. Uh, book of mention, at that. If you heard uh, Gary Bird uh, last Monday, you had another one, William Katz. Mm -hmm. So since you gave me a note, I really appreciated you taking me in. You know, when he had to also write love, I knew that our people always attack the wrong part. In other words, he was saying attack on me, which he had accepted to a certain extent. Once he saw me, the truth was manifest. He could not accept that which he had read in the New York Times. So at least I have that. There's a lot of things that have that. You'd be surprised that Jews have sent me the material on Jews and the slave trade, that the liberty and all that stuff. The Jewish people and the core and the vision of the information. So there's a whole series of the Aptekers and the uh, Cats and Melvin Hurst of us. Yeah, yeah. And, but I always wanted to be able to put an African inspiration under these Jewish guys. And when I found out that Hurst of us, you want to get a lot of credit to because he was a Negro, he contested the French inspiration, who said that they African didn't have, the African American didn't have African residual. <laughs> that we were Negroes, and that's why it's ironic that he was asked to head the African studies when he had waged this battle against us having an African group. And so here you had Herzkovitz contesting this outstanding African study. You wanna, like Booker said, you gotta read the documents, you gotta go get the, the, the original resources. You gotta, uh, understand the dynamic of causation. The reason why Hershkowitz got into looking at the African past of Africans in the New World was because Alain Locke pushed him in that direction. And there's a documentation that shows that he, Alain Locke asked him to write a piece on African residuals. And when Hershkowitz studied the thing and came up with a piece that there's no African residual, that we are Negroes, just like every other American. We've been processed into this Americanization. And then it was Alain Locke that pushed him to look further into this thing. And then once he got hooked on the African thing, the Hershkowitz went on his own. So, so there's a dynamic relationship between these individuals. The book was saying the formulation is not to get mad and not react correctly, but to see this as part of a, of a dynamic process and take out that which you could <coughs> Because the same dynamic that he's talking about, which was taking place in the academic arena, was taking place in our communities publicly around Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. And it was the same type of, of, of dynamic of, of where we come from, of color, of, of class status, of European degrees, uh, that type of thing. And the beauty that we have now is that our people have gone through that process. And now we have a concept of sisterhood and brotherhood, which the others didn't have. Scholars used to hide their work. They used to try to fool people. 
We have a situation where we share. Mm-hmm. Booker said, here, take this here, but don't put the doctor in the whole new command. Here, take this, do it, this, do it. And we have a whole other, well, like that says, take this or I'll help you do this. And Van Sutton says, look, come on, you have to do this, do this, and create an African, a general African civilization. Uh, Obanga comes from the, from the east and sends Van Sutton an 800-page manuscript on his African philosophical book. 800 page mentioned. The government's just trying to publish 100 pages here and here, 200 pages here and here. I'm sure Abanga is uh, continuing to write because he's head of a Bantu civilization center now, which was presented in this room at this conference table by the Minister of Health and Information uh, of uh, Gabon here. And then uh, eventually uh, Abanga, one of the greatest scholars on the African continent, uh, headed, he's the heir on the continent of the side of Dr. Shekhar's gift. Because we're saying this stuff is passing on uh, in relationship to uh, our special relationship, this brotherhood, this bonding that we have, this, this African family. When we went this summer to Ivory Coast, uh, Yanga Boa wasn't there, but his wife was there. First thing we did, we only had a couple hours, was to run into the house. We didn't, she had prepared dinner. We asked her, my wife and I said, we ain't got time for dinner. We want to get to see his research. Where is it? <laughs> and I knew where it was because when I went over there a few months before, he had exposed it to me. He had actually given me documents to bring back here. And I'm hoping to actually get him to come here for through. But he has discovered. You know he discovered the gold weight. That's the three-volume study that all of you should have. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very costly, $95 a volume. But it is a fundamental study. And one of the important parts of it is that the, the ground is down. Thank you about food. The swastika is our sacred symbol of the male and the female principle, uh, particularly in relationship to, to rulership. So it's ironic that Hitler has taken that symbol. In the New York Times, when they made the attack, Virgil put that message in the time, and one of the things he said, Jeffrey says that the swastika is a sun people symbol older than Jews themselves. That's right. You know, when some Jews that have some knowledge to see that, 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 that at the end. <laughs> and anybody would even have that knowledge, much less pass it on to uh, young minds. But Bua has published it. This is in his three volume study. But he had said a few years ago, he said, the study on the archive, that's yours. You always run the that. I'm into something else. And I, he didn't tell me what it was up until uh, a while ago. And he's discovered an ancient African civilization in West Africa. Around the Bandama River in the Ivory Coast, going back to five to seven thousand. Ooh. Mm-hmm. He's got megalith heads that were carved out of the very rock. I mean, he has a hundred of them. He has them in his living room. That's why I was rushing him now. He has them in his courtyard. He has a dozen in his courtyard. And he has a separate building for his library. He has them alone. My wife has it on there. And this is what this brother was. Into he had discovered uh, this culture going back thousands of years in West Africa. Mm-hmm. That's a missing piece of a cultural link that runs from Senegal mm-hmm. through uh, Nigeria. And this piece is in the center of it. So it shows a cultural sweep in West Africa. Mm-hmm. So there may be things that we have. We've been looking to the Nile mm-hmm. because the things came together. You had your thesis, you had your antithesis, dealing with the negative and building this enormity of the of the zenith, which Dr. Ben says, coming from Nubia, uh, Ethiopia, and, and the zenith. And so we had a system uh, that sustained itself for thousands of years. And we don't look seriously at West Africa in terms of ancient far, but there's an ancient culture and civilization in West Africa that's a complement to this that was in, in uh, East Africa. And of course, in Southern Africa, the Great Zimbabwe ruins, uh, we really haven't even clocked that in. Mm-hmm. But when we went to Zimbabwe, we thought we were running through the Great Zimbabwe ruins. And the citadel and all that, but there are 200 stone cities in the Bible. Mm-hmm. The sites of 200 stone cities, not just the Great Zimbabwe. So there's a whole cultural dynamic that we can unfold if we put our minds to it. And Booker has provided us with an important piece that there are people that once you start to study what their role and mission was, and you capture their vision and you add it to your insight then the dynamic that you have is an enormous one. So because you're building on that particular strength. And so we can see it happening now. Well, that's something with nothing to the active dimension. 
he just come into it from communication. Right. And now he's going, he's going so fast. You know, we have to hold him back. <laughs> you know, and he published, I don't know how he published all his books, but he was in communication. So he's taking his communication skills and he's producing a book every six months. <laughs> you know, Van Sotoma has given up teaching. He's taking time out. He's on the road. He's taking his show on the road. Not only in America, he's going over to Holland, he's going over to Germany, he's going over to Russia, he's going over to Paris. In other words, this thing that we're talking about is international. It is not international. Moving into the African component universalizes that. And so that means we become the people who can synthesize all of it on the planet to make it make some sense. So that's where the Hansberg Newton was something way out there. He probably didn't know all the fundamentals of it. But what the upset was, you go back and you deal with the tradition, you deal with the current manifestation. So he was able to take the ancient Nile Valley and then relate it to, and I have a book in my office, where he deals with the linguistic connection with his own people in Senegal to the sacred language of the Nile. But he said you have to go to the top, you have to rise like a phone, and you have to make it an operative scientific principle. That's when we, when we put that circle when we talk about systems, we're talking about making it an operative scientific principle so that it becomes a transformative process, so that it has a system capability to sustain itself. And even when it's attacked, it has the regenerative capability of regenerating itself. A system, an operative scientific principle, makes this whole process into a dynamic system relationship. So that's where we're going. So curriculum inclusion was what our boy Don Smith put on the document as a political ploy. We're talking about a curriculum of correction, a curriculum of truth and the interaction of these dynamic, this complementary opposite is a curriculum of liberation. So that's really where we're at. A curriculum of correction, a curriculum of truth, which will liberate us. So we're on our way. This is just a, some of the steps that we're taking. So I'm glad the brothers were here. And our sisters are here. We've got to get our daughters of Africa right tied into this process. And, um, and a book of what a special life. And it's not unusual that Schomburg and Just and Elaine Locke, according to the situations that they're in. Because, as I said in this, again, there's that multi-billion dollar African education that begins in the beginning with my mama and continues through that community in Newark and on to Dr. Clark and Dr. Bed, etc. And then there's the antithesis of million dollar white boy education, the big lie of white supremacy. And then as you interact with two, we have an enormity now. You see, and that's what Diop has done in his great book, which is coming out, Civilization for Barbarism. It deals with the Greeks in a way that the Greeks will never be the same. So I hope we can get this thing covered. In other words, his analysis of Greek civilization and culture will mean that can never be put on a pedestal again. And then, because the whole concept of genetic pruning, he demonstrates the documentation of what they have to do life. Killing off the children. These northern Greeks coming in as warriors dominating the southern Greek and genetically pruning them to keep them at 40,000 slaves. But genetically pruning the Spartans themselves to keep them at 10,000 warriors. Killing off the women children, because you only need one woman to produce a lot of kids. And killing off certain men children that didn't meet the prototype. Hitler before Hitler. In other words, Tiap gets into that in a serious way. I've never seen it done that way by anybody else. But that's just a, a part of his thing. His heavy thing is getting deep into what Nile Valley culture, civilization, philosophy was and the legacy that we have. But you have to balance out the negative and the positive to create that the new, the new positive charge. So that's where we're moving. Well, I'm very happy to see it happening. Um, I'm glad the brothers came and make sure we got it on, on some type of tape. I'm glad Diane is here so she can get a taste of it. And too bad Adelaide wasn't here so she could just sit and, oh. and be in her glory. So Brothers and sisters, I brought 19 slides for Professor Hansberry. I got so carried away, I forgot to show no, you. No, 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 no,
you have to show because we we try to leave it'll, around. It'll take it'll take about five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 There's a question. There was a question. There's a question. Excuse me. There's a question. Oh, one question before you start. Why is hotel? <laughs> my question, my question is about the actual material you start to make. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to learn about you. I can pick it up. I guess the thing is that the most important thing is that you can understand what you say you have on and what you have to do. What is that? You mean Leo Hanford? What happened was that everything that he did, the, the, the question the brother asked is where was his research? How did Hansberry get all of this information? What he did was that he was sparked by Du Bois, uh, Felix Du Bois, and W.E.B. Du Bois. And what happened was is that he read a lot of of his own books from his childhood in terms of ancient Greece and Rome. That, that was his beginning. But where he got most of his information from him and J.A. Rogers together. J.A. Rogers. Uh, he worked with all the heavyweights. Uh, he was in contact with Drusilla Dungy Houston when she wrote her book, Wonderful Ethiopians. Uh, James Spadey did a, a comparative piece because remember, Drusilla Dungy Houston was impacted by Du Bois as the Negro also. And that's what spurred her on. So what's most interesting is that here you have a woman, I think she was in Oklahoma, and you have a man that is in um, Mississippi being impacted by this one book and they're both rising to become scholars in their own right. A lot of writings in terms of a lot of the scholars, but most of it came from the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, he has a book, James, um, Professor Joseph Harris wrote a book, Africa and Africans, as seen by the classical writers. And in this book, you can see Professor Hansberry's writings from where he got the Greeks, like Pliny the Elder, uh, Herodotus, uh, Callisthenes. A lot of different writers began to write that he was impacted by, but then he began to depart from that, Charles Seifert, George G.M. James, um, I, I have a list and I'll bring it in for you next time to, to show you who who was impact. Du Bois was a big impact. But what was interesting is that when Du Bois did the world in Africa, Hansberry wrote the piece on Ethiopia in the world in Africa. And Du Bois gives him credit in the beginning for using Hansberry's work. Uh, Hansberry was invited by Du Bois for the fourth Pan-African Conference to speak on the evolution of the African presence in the world. So he was impacted by a lot of different people. And it was scattered, just like it's scattered today. But what's happening, and I think that what all the scholars are doing, and what Dr. Van Sutter is very good at doing, is that he's bringing all of these scattered pieces. You know, like you see his body? Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. Peru's eye? Right. <laughs> bringing it all together, and by the magic of Tahuti, he's making it one. And so what we've got to do is go in, and this is what uh, Professor Hansberry was saying. He said, you have to go into archaeology, anthropology, uh, and he even said you have to go into somatology. I had to look that one up back there. I didn't know what somatology was. The study of the blood. See, this brother was into melanin. And I, and I could show you some things in terms of his... Hotep, my brothers and sisters. Just before I begin, do I have to speak into the mic? Yeah. I do? You can remove it from the stand. Okay. my brothers and sisters. Uh, one of the first things that I would like to do, of course, is to thank our chairperson, our brother, our attorney, Alton Maddox, for inviting me. In his opening remarks, he said of my growth, and clearly my growth has occurred because I have been invited to be able to speak before people such as yourself. I remember when I, before I ever spoke at the slave theater, I was told that when you come to the slave theater, it's almost, if you were an entertainer, it would be like going before the Apollo theater. 
that you're not going to get away with just saying anything. That those who are listening to you will scrutinize your every word and in fact even your body motion. And that not only will they scrutinize what you say in your body motion, but that they will know when you start to stray away from the realities of what we're facing. And so my growth has come because every time I speak before you, I know that I must prepare myself to the utmost. In fact, I prepare myself more to speak before you than when I speak before professors at Columbia University. Because I understand and I realize what it is that we're facing. And so when I judge myself, I really judge myself for when I present myself to my own people as opposed to others. Because I've come to realize that there's no one that knows us better than us. And there's no one that knows us better than what we need to do and what we need to say than us. So if I am growing, it is because of you. So I thank you for being so scrutinizing and so much to the point that you're not just going to let anybody come before you and just say anything. So my growth comes through you, so thank you. I've come to talk to you about a topic that we call skills. And for those who might be interested in copying all of this down, I just want you to know ahead of time, in case you don't, I have prepared a guide for a nominal fee after all this is over, so you don't have to really write a lot down. Much of what you'll see up here is in the guide, so I just want you to know that. Nominal fee of $3 will get you through all of the writing and the other things that we're preparing. I have lesson plans and video guides and a few other things because, you know, I'm growing as we're all saying, and what I've realized is that as educators and as presenters, when the Chemites would speak, they learned from the Ethiopian and Ugandan and Kenyan teachers the real way of doing things. And sometimes when you're dealing with a subject, and this goes for all of us, whether we're in classrooms or whether we're even amongst ourselves, the reality is, is that when someone speaks and the participants write, you cannot hear what the person is saying because you're too busy writing. However, if you have the comfort of knowing that much of what you would write is already written, that you can peruse and study at a later date, it makes your attention stronger here. And this is really a key because this is the first introduction. When I'm in classrooms and I speak to young people or when I speak to anybody, I attempt to make it such that you will become a part of the procedure of what I'm saying. But if I'm constantly trying to take you, get you to take notes, then part of what I'm saying is not going to be recorded. It'll be recorded in your subconscious because everything that you experience is in your subconscious. But if you have the ability to focus, then your consciousness is grasping the material and what you would have written is already done. So it is important that we introduce new ways of learning because this is the way we learned. We also understand that a great deal of the way in which we learn is orally. Africans often said in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania when the Chemites were bragging about how they had invented this wonderful writing system, they said, well, brother, you're writing because you forget. Because if you train your mind, your mind will become the greatest notebook that you ever have. And through atomic power, through the atom philosophy, your mind can write down information in the libraries and the recesses of your mind so you don't need to write it down because you have it in here. Paper can be destroyed. Many of us are saying, well, you know, the Chemites had the kind of, and it's true, the Chemite had the weather that made things very dry and paper was able to last. Buildings were able to stand strong for many thousands of years. But the Ugandans would have said, well, everything changes, so why keep things permanently? Writing changes, so why do we need writing when I don't forget? So the oral tradition amongst Africans and Native Americans was very important. We write because we are afraid we will forget what we've heard. Africans don't write things down in Central Africa because they never forget. It's all according to your perspective and your African centeredness of what you're dealing with. Of course, writing is important. I'm not saying that. It is important that we learn to write. I wouldn't say it's important for us to learn script because that's not very important. It's important to learn it as art. And I've often said one of the things when we design our school, along with getting rid of that school bell and the PA system, but that's something I need to talk to you about. Come back at a later date to talk to you about that. But 
when we begin to develop our schools, some of the things that we're going to realize is that the things that we have now are not really necessary. And that you have, as African people, in your genetic pool, all of the things you need to never forget. Not only will you never forget what you heard, but you'll remember what you were never told. Because the ancestral line will guide you in a way that will clearly let you understand. I've often told people, you know, we're so busy telling each other, and it's, sometimes it's true, but we often tell each other that we need to get our foot in the door. Well, I'm telling you, you don't need to get your foot in the door because you're already in the house. What you got to do is turn on the light and look around. See, you need a facilitator to show you where the light switch is. You don't need someone to hold the door open for you because you're already in the house. And what we have got to do in our classrooms is help our young people understand, if not ourselves, that every bit of information that you need, you already know. And that what we need to become in classrooms are good facilitators. Facilitators of knowledge and information to allow our young people to know that you already know this math and science. You already know the language arts, the arts and crafts. You already know how to draw, dance, and sing. What you need is someone to let you know that you know this. Because the reason why we are in our classrooms is not to learn. We are in classrooms to become conscious. But not just conscious, but conscious of our consciousness. We need not only to know, we need to know that we know. Some people will call it arrogance. Some people will call it that you're a show off. But the reality of it is, is that if you got it, know that you got it. And don't be ashamed to know that you're great. You see, we kind of beat ourselves down in our greatness. And the re and reality is, is that we've been trained to do that. When we were getting to the point of extreme knowledge, when we were getting to the point of dignity and pride and integrity, those were the virtues that nobody who is going to be kidnapped or held against their will no one would allow themselves to be treated that way. So therefore, it was always beat out of us. It was psychologically trained out of us. So therefore, now we still suffer from some of these feelings of greatness, of grandeur. And so when that happens, we try to play it down. Now, there's a difference between humble and having humility. You see, I have no problems with having humility. But I am not humble. There's a difference. It's a semantic difference, of course. It's according to how you define it. But you see, no one can get on your back if you're standing up straight. And too many of us shake off our addictions, but we keep our back bent. But if you stand up, no one can get on your back, because anyone who does will slide off. So what we've got to do in our classrooms is understand our greatness. We have to understand what makes us who we are, and we've got to move forward. We're wasting a lot of time trying to get ourselves out of a pit that we're not in. And what we've got to begin to do, and all that I'm saying is English words that you've all said before, you've all heard before, but the way in which it's being combined is like the constitution and reconstitution of atoms. Because you see, when you transcend from this level or this plane of existence, you're still going to be the same atoms that make you up now. It's just that the constitution of your atoms is going to change. And the same thing has to happen in the classroom. We must reconstitute the atoms. There is nothing new that's going to come into our lives. There is no language that we're going to learn that's going to change the conditions that we're in. It's the way in which we're going to reconstitute and constitute the words that we're using. And the way in which we're going to do that is by looking at a number of different things. And I always like to at least begin with a proverb of some kind, African in nature. And I think that a, 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 an appropriate proverb for this afternoon's presentation is one that my aunt gave me uh, when she was transcending. And she said that if you give a person a fish, he or she will eat for the day. But that if you teach them how to fish, they will eat for a lifetime. And that's what skills are. In our classrooms, we're teaching our children math and science, but we're not teaching them the process of what this means. And what we have got to begin to do is look at skills as the atomic or the application of atomic knowledge, which we call wisdom. There is a difference between knowledge and wisdom, and we'll talk about it as we go along. Also, if I may say, if there are any questions or comments that you have, 
please feel free to raise your hand as we're going along. I like to strike while the iron is hot. The question you ask now is not the same flavor as the question you will ask at the end. So please feel free to raise your hand and comment or ask questions as we go along. And of course, we are here assembled as an African people united in a movement, the United African Movement, here at Peg Lake Bates Resort. I know they have another name for it, but in my heart, it will always be Peg Lake. Right. <laughs> and of course, today's date is 8 October 95. Now, you can tell I work with children because we've got to break it all down that way, you see? And I, I tend not to try to change my approach because you can even learn something from how to talk to young people. You see, we assume a lot. We assume that everybody knows what we know, and the reality of it is, is that we can't assume that. And even though I said that I work with children, even sometimes we as adults need to hear the full flavor of what it is that we're experiencing. I know we know where we are. But you know, as you call someone's name, you call them into being. As you call things out atomically, you call things into being. And I always like to work from that perspective. The research that we're doing, looking at what we're experiencing in our classroom and the African curriculum. Now, as I've said before, I will say again, and I will always say, and I want to be careful how I say it, and I hope that I explain it well. And if not, please ask a question or make a comment. There is no such thing as an African-centered curriculum. It doesn't exist. The reason why we call it an African-centered curriculum is because other people have taken a universal body of knowledge and said it's theirs. When African people sat down, the scholars and the scientists, the practitioners sat down and developed this way of transferring knowledge through the generations, they never said this is for African people. They gave it to a universal, oneness, a cosmic being. This knowledge, in fact, we wouldn't be in the position we are today if it was African-centered because those that took it who were not African couldn't have understood it and couldn't have created this civilization. Therefore, it had to be a very generic body of knowledge that was able for anyone to understand through understanding of skills. But I want to be careful because we need to say African-centered because of the balance on the other side. Therefore, we need to get back into an African perspective. This is not so much an African-centered curriculum. This is not revisionist. I've presented, people stood up and said, this is a revisionist theory. This is not a revisionist theory. This is the original theory that you revised. There's a difference. This is not revision. I am not revising anything. I'm returning to the source. You revised the original, okay? I am not teaching this and understanding this for us to go back into Manhattan and back into Chicago and back around the world to build pyramids. But I want to lay the foundations of a sacred scientific thought that led to some of the greatest creations of the world. We cannot go back to Kemet. Kemet is no longer what it was. But we can take their philosoph uh, philosophical base, their foundations, and build from there with what we have today. So as our brother Bundy was talking about the technology of today, if you, if you took the African mind and coupled it with today's technology, you would have a dynamic process. So therefore, when we go back, I don't say let's go back and stay back. Let's go back to the future and begin to develop those areas of understanding and learning that will allow us to transcend. Because I guarantee you, when our young brothers and our young sisters get this information, I guarantee you they will have to start a new way of testing because even they will not understand the level that our young people are on. What's happening in our classrooms are revolutionary. As I was talking to the brothers that brought me up, my brother Dexter and brother Michael, we were talking in the car about a number of different things. And the reality of it is, is that the world that we're living in is changing very rapidly. And one of the things that we've got to understand is, is that the great fear that they have is that we will know what to do with what we have. As Gil Scott says in Message to the Messenger, they don't know what to tell our young people, but they know our young people know what to tell each other. So if they keep them apart, they're not going to be able to vibrate off of the future. And I am saying that our young people will take this information and bring it to another level of understanding that will make the computer look like the invention of fire. 
And that was the first thing that brought us into civilization, or one of the first things, along with the handshake. So the reality is, is let's look at skills. Let's look at the process. Let's look at what we call functional consciousness. Forget about psychological consciousness. Psychological consciousness is the matter or the material, which has its place. But functional consciousness is the process by which you use psychological consciousness to reach a level of understanding that goes beyond anything else. It is what we call intuition. It is when African folk can come together and all be on one vibe and yet no one speaks a word. We could do that before. Some of us do it now. What brings you here in support of the United African Movement is that very notion. You may not know it. And each of us may not even know what the creative force has planned for us. But Kepra, or the process of becoming, will let us know in time. There's a reason why we're here. The African people in this hemisphere, our purpose is to save this planet. We were taken from Africa, whether we realize it or want to accept this or not. This is my belief. This is what I see. And we were dispersed in this hemisphere from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego in South America in order for us to return back to Africa and save this planet. And once we get this understanding, we will know you don't need great numbers to do that. Thank you. you just need commitment from selected few. I'm going beyond double, uh, Dr. Du Bois's concept of the talented 10th, and I want to work on the conscious 10th. As a conscious 10th, you can be a bus driver, you can be a custodian, you can be a doctor or a lawyer. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be interested in math and science. Just be interested in yourself and in your people. Be interested in this planet and the development of a new world order. Because you see, the only reason why they're dealing with a new world order is because they see the new world order. And you are that new world order. We're talking about skills that are interchangeable, Skills, as we're dealing with it, of course, you know. Skills can be interplayed with wisdom. Knowledge, and this is where we define and we look at certain definitions. Nothing is written in stone, so I just send this out for your own vibration. But we say that knowledge is the accumulation of information. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Or the application of the accumulation of the information that you have learned. If you can't use what you've learned, you've wasted your time. It was no sense sitting there learning that geometric theorem if you don't know that buildings are built from that. It makes no difference to understand variables if you don't understand that variables can be applied in your own life. We interchange wisdom with skills. But I want you to look at the design, because up here I said skills first, wisdom there. I then gave you a definition, and then I switched them around to show you that it's interchangeable. In a child's mind, you need to do that. You can say it's interchangeable, but you've got to show him that it's interchangeable. But you just can't show him. I couldn't give you this and then give you that. I had to take you through the steps that would have proven this, and through proving this, this became that. I could do this mathematically. This is a mathematical equation. This is where math comes from. Math is just not numbers. It's just not variables. It's the material world being written down. It's the spiritual world being written down. And it's showing how matter and energy are interchanged. But when I mention matter and energy to you, I now have moved from math to science, according to them. But to the African, holistic education demands that you interchange all of the different topics. And I could not have done any of these things without the skill of language arts. So holistic education is something that we all must learn. This is the way as African people we learn. We don't open up a math book from 10 to 10.45 and have a math class and then close that math book and have a social studies class. That's not the way African people learn. It's not the way Native American people learn. It's not the way Chinese people or Japanese people learn in the ancient world. They learn through all of the things around them and allowing them to interchange and look at the world around them. The acquisition of skills allows the learner to apply complex thought processes Sorry about that. 
required to solve basic slash advanced challenges. I don't call them problems. Because problems to children create another thing. You automatically have a barrier. A challenge is something you look forward to overcoming. Problems sometimes is something people avoid. So I don't use the word problems. I don't use the word math problems. Because they're not problems. They're challenges. When you use that word problem, it creates something <clears throat> in the mind of the learner or the person speaking. A problem. And then you're going to turn around and say, I have a very serious problem. Okay? And then you're going to say, well, this problem is not hard. Well, yeah, you should have said that before. Well, your problem is not hard either. You see, how are you going to have a problem you can solve here, and now you have a serious problem? Again, going back to language arts and the way in which we use our language, we send messages to our young people that we're just not aware of, but the people writing the book aren't aware of these problems either. And you see, we've been following a people that don't know what they're talking about. Really, we've given a lot of credit to people who just don't know, and as I move on through this area of, of education, it frightens me because so many people are writing things that they just don't know. And it's frightening, you know. And it's frightening not so much that they don't know, it's frightening that we follow them. It frightens me that some of our most brilliant scholars have to take a second seat to people who know nothing. And these are issues that I'm facing every day. These are uh, processes required to solve basic and advanced challenges and make decisions in everyday life and classroom learning. That's why we're around. That's why school is what it is. That's why when the African scholars sat down, they said, look, we may have this knowledge, but now we have to find a way to transfer it to those who are coming up younger than we. So they set up a way in which to train and to teach young people, and this is what they said, that skills was what they were after, and it's the... It's the subjects you use to take them through the process to acquire the skill. But once they learn what they're supposed to learn, that's not important. It was the process that was important. But look at the way we test our children. We test our children in a way that for all we know, they could have been very good guesses and got everything right with no ability to know the process. But we're willing to accept the fact that as long as you mark sense that A, that's okay. We don't know how they got their answer. If they looked over somebody's shoulder at the answer, we have no knowledge of that. All we know is that they got A right, which is absolutely opposite what we really should be after. And if I may also tell you that in the lower left-hand side, I use comedic numbers. I don't use the... Hindu Arabic, although that's African too. I use the, the comedic number system. Okay. Skills. After you get the basic skills, we're looking at higher order thinking skills. We call them the HOTS. Higher order thinking skills demands that thinking about thinking thoughts leads to knowing about knowing knowledge. Think about that. Thinking about thinking thoughts leads to knowing about knowing knowledge. That's heavy. But look how many times I repeat the same word. You see, this is what we must do, African perspective, to use English, which, by the way, Malcolm called the language of liars. We need to use English more as a metaphor and this is why I will say again, as I always say, I celebrate our young people with hip-hop. Because nothing clearly brings us back to the metaphor than the hip-hop. But I can't say hip-hop without saying bebop. And I can't say bebop without saying the blues of the plantation. We are a metaphoric people. We, what we say, we hit a straight line with a crooked stick. Double entendres. We, we don't say it. It would be too easy just to say it. The thing about life is to break it so that it's exciting, you know? And that's what we do. Please. That's right. That's right. My daddy used to say, you know, you think you're so slick, you're going to pass yourself slide. <laughs> this process, Kepra, 
<laughs> this process is enhanced, embellished, and expanded by the teacher slash facilitator understanding the importance of questioning techniques. We don't ask enough questions, we're too busy talking. That's why we get burnt out, because we do so much talking. By the end of the day, we're so out of breath. <laughs> we're tired, we're ready to go home and go to sleep. Whereas if we had been a facilitator in that classroom, we would have been able to gather all of the cumulative knowledge of all of the ancestors of all of our children. Our classrooms are going to get larger. They're not going to get smaller. But I have no problem with that. Because the more folk of African descent we have in a classroom, the more ancestors we have with us. I've been told by a sister from South Africa, she had a class of 250 students. And she didn't have not one discipline problem. Not one. This was, of course, before our young people stopped going to school in the 70s, of course. This is when African folk taught African folk before the other pieces of information came in. You, you know, it's, it's not about classroom management. It, and it, it's not even about money. Frederick Douglass did it on breadcrumbs. It's not about money, not when you get down to it. It's about purpose. It's about understanding. When we were on that plantation, we had a lot of people at our meetings. Nobody made a murmur if we knew that someone would hear. Not even the babies knew to be quiet in their mother's arms. It's not about numbers. People say it would be easier with smaller classrooms, and that might be true in today's situation. But when we were ready to learn, we sat around a master teacher, and it wasn't a matter of numbers. They weren't thinking about a 12 to 1 ratio. They were looking for the most able students to be with the most able master teachers. And knowledge was transferred. But we're facing a whole nother dimension out here in our classrooms. Therefore, we need smaller classrooms because the children are conspiring against the teacher. But I can't blame them because I conspired against mine too. Because they were boring. And they didn't tell me the truth. And anybody under those conditions, you'd be a fool not to conspire. So let's look at our questioning techniques. And I, use, I, I like to take words that can help us remember. Like I remember, I always remember the five uh, Great Lakes of America by Holmes, uh, Huron, Ontario. Mich thank you. That tells you how much I really care. Erie and Superior. OK. So food technique. Food, the first the F is factual. Basically, questions that the facilitator will ask that will bring forward true or false right or wrong answers. The first O is for opinion. You'll have varying responses. Everyone has one. The second O is for open-ended. Many times in these questions, you have the word some, ever, or any. For example, do you have some? You asked a question. Have you ever? Asked a question. Do you have any? And you asked a question. Some, ever, any, we call it C. Finally, the D stands for descriptive. The descriptive describes any of the above or describes something, someone, someplace, etc. Questioning techniques that lead to the concept of the higher order thinking skills. Now I want to list for you the thinking and reasoning skills. Of course, they are not limited to this. Of course, you probably have your own. But I would at least like to focus on some so we can at least begin to vibrate on the concept of what a skill is. You have problem solving, you have decision making, you have inferences, whether they be inductive or deductive. I will, dis I will define both those words. You have as four divergent thinking skills, you have evaluative thinking skills, and you have philosophy, and you have reasoning. Page five. Also, notice how the Chemites did their five. Three on top, two on the bottom. And you wonder where we got Roman numerals from? Okay, you notice that six will have three on top and will add the one where the two was on the five. You will also notice that the larger number always begins on the top. Let's look at the number one of the problem solving and let's break that down into some numbers and you will also notice 
the comedic numbers here. You see, we're transferring this. We're moving from one to another. I'm not adding anything new. They're still the same numbers. They're still all the same. I'm just giving you an African perspective, and this is what we must do with our young people. Identifying a general problem, sort of self-explanatory, but so many of our young people cannot do that. In fact, part of the reason why we're in the problem we're in today is because we did not do number one of number one and identify a general problem. And the general problem came to our shores and we didn't identify it. Number two would be clarifying the problem. Being very specific, clarifying it being clear on what the problem really is. Formulating hypotheses. Now again, I go to the point that when I throw out a word like hypotheses, it's just a little bit different than other words, so I think it's important to define it. Not through the dictionary, but by using Reverend Ishaka Musa Barashango's definition, which again is an African-centered definition. Some people might want to go to Webster. Some people might want to go to Webster Miriam. Some people might want to go to any of the other reference books. I turn to Reverend Barashango. That's my option. That's your option. Wade Noble tells us that power is the ability to define one's reality and have that person accept that definition. Well, I reject Webster. My reality is Reverend Ishaka Musa Barashango. And if I say that, if I say that, that's what it is. You understand what I'm saying? You can sit there and argue with me. I'll go with that. But after all the argument is over, I'm opening up African Genesis by Reverend Ishaka Musa Barashango. When I define reality, I go to Dr. Wade Noble. When I look at metamorphosis, I go to Dr. Naeem Akbar. When I go to genetic annihilation, I go to Dr. Francis Creswellson. Now, there are people who can argue with me, and we can sit here and go through it, but after it's all over, I'm going back to where I am. That's what Dr. Wade Nobles teaches us. Now, the question is, some people feel very nervous about that. Some people would rather stutter on what Webster said. But remember, Webster made a deal with the devil. <laughs> Hypothesis. Hypothesis to assume, suppose, lay basis for a temporary explanation of an occurrence based on known data, thus validating a basis for further research. Let me give you a sentence that might explain what a hypothesis is, as Reverend Barashango gave us. It seems to be that, which if you were looking for one word, a hypothesis would be probable. Simple as that. Continuing on, formulating appropriate questions. You see, to know what you don't know, you've got to know what you know. To know what you know automatically guarantees you that you will learn what you don't know. Because you already know. So you've already set up your lack of knowledge through your fulfillment of knowledge. That is why it's so important to look at questioning techniques. And that's why it's so dangerous the way we test, because in the African and Native American world, they never tested you after you learned. They tested you before you learned, because they wanted to know what you didn't know so they could teach it to you. When you test somebody after, you're really playing a game to see what they don't know. So you can punish them. Exactly. That's the bottom line. And that's what we do. Write it 200 times. Go to summer school. Repeat the grade. Sidestep. I think you need special ed. You see? I'll tell you who needs special ed. See, I've often said children are not special ed. 
Well, first of all, I call it challenge. I don't use the word special ed because all of us need special ed. Special ed revolves around time. When I counsel special ed teachers, teachers who teach our challenged children, whether they be emotional, physical, or spiritually challenged, I often tell them it's time you're dealing with, nothing else. You're going to teach them the same thing you teach all, all the other children, but you're going to take into consideration time. A child who is physically handicapped, let's say, through a leg, who possibly may have a limp. If you were to get to the door, the question is, that I ask is, is it that you want everyone to get to the door, or is it important who gets to the door first? Well, to me, it would be, Everybody gets to the door. Therefore, those who may be physically handicapped, it's going to take a little bit more time. That's all. But they, they, they're going to get to the door. <clears throat> if a, for lack of a better word, I, 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 you know, the, all, they have all bunch of classifications, you know. They had 11 the last time I checked. Not at OJ's free, they got 12, but we'll get into that later on. <laughs> See, that 12 is everybody that thought that O.J. was innocent. <laughs> but the question really is, if a child cannot get a math problem right, right away, the question is, do you think the child can get the problem right, or do you think they need time to get it? I would say it's time. I don't care how long it takes. Just go through the process. I don't care how long it takes you to get to that door. Just get to that door. So teachers need to learn patience and time. And they can teach any child, anything, anywhere. Formulating appropriate solutions. Now you got the question down, what's the solution? You must choose the best solution. You might have formulated the appropriate solution, but that don't mean you're going to choose the right solution. Therefore, you must be able to choose the right solution, but then you must apply it. You can formulate the appropriate question that leads to the appropriate solution. You can choose the best solution, but you must apply it. The difference between choosing the best solution and applying the solution is the difference between opening the door and walking in. You can open the door, but if you don't walk in, why'd you open the door? Many of our young people get to the door, open the door, but are afraid to walk in. Why? Because they've been beat against walking in. That's the point where most people will stop them. Generating related ideas. Here's the metaphor. You see, when our young people get up with the hip-hop and they begin to give you related ideas, sometimes as adults we get very upset. We say, we don't like that. But the reality of it is, is that what else can a child give you but what they're relating it to? Richard Pryor would have said, what did it mean to me? What does it mean to me? And this is where many of our educators get in trouble. Because they do not relate it to the ideas of the young people. They do not see themselves in the process of what it is that they're learning. Everybody's throwing them. I have a physics book. Everybody in the physics book is of European descent. Everybody. When you study astronomy, you start with Copernicus. Mm -hmm. Who, well, by the way, the whole world was against them. But you start with Copernicus. They don't tell you that the church tried to kill him. They just tell you about Copernicus. They then tell you about Galileo. They tell you about Johannes Kepler, born in Stuttgart, Germany. Mm -hmm. But what they don't tell you is that half the world, if not all the world of European descent, rejected his ideas. It's only now that they realize he was almost there. And you would think that those are Kepler's ideas. But Kepler himself admitted he studied the Egyptian golden rule of the motion of the planets. He admitted it himself, but they don't put that in the books. So they'll tell you Kepler was the one that in invented this. Or Copernicus invented this. I'm about to publish the first piece on the comedic origin of the universe. Which calls forward a hotel. But that wasn't what I was going to say. <laughs> that was just a preface to what I was going to say. Yeah, the spirit made me say it just to set the pace for what I was going to tell you. But I'm now doing the comedic origin of the solar system. And I'm taking the third philosophy of the Memphite text 
and I'm comparing it to the Dogon text, which makes me do research into the Dogon. The Dogon knew that Saturn had rings. They knew that Jupiter was surrounded by icebergs long before anybody had come to Africa to tell them that. The Dogon knew of a star system known as Sirius. They call it Sirius A, but Sirius B was what was so outstanding because Sirius B can't be seen by the human eye. And a European couldn't even get to it with the most mightiest of telescopes until just recently. They knew that there was a 50-year rotation of Sirius B around Sirius A. And they had charted in the sands all of the movements from 1920. They had a ceremony known as the Sigue, S-I-G-U-I, every 60 years. And when Marcel Griol and Dieter Lang, male and female, went there and studied, every, every time they have a ceremony, they have a mask. But they had 12 masks. So you multiply 12 times 60, it means they were celebrating that ceremony in the 1200s. Long before they even knew any of this information, the Africans were celebrating it. But you gotta move, you gotta take a step back and take a breather because there's something I'm gonna drop on you here because this is something very important. In order to understand Sirius, in order to understand astronomy, you have got to experience a couple of times. So if the Chemites had a great year of many, many thousands of years, whatever we want to say that is, you just can't forecast right away. Let's say you're dealing with a great year of 46,000 years. You just can't say. It takes one time, which is 46,000 years, to know that you're going to go through the 12 houses of the constellations. It's like, let's say somebody walked through this door and left that door. They came around the first time, like this. Could anybody in this room say you know they're going to come back when they're going to come back? No. You've just experienced it. Let's say they come back a second time. You still don't know if there's a pattern because it's the second time you've seen them. It's not until the second time they come around that you say, didn't they come around the first time? Let's see when they come back around. That's when you measure. You're aware that there's a pattern. You've seen them twice. Then they come back around and you say then, well, how long did it take? Well, there, that's when you got your measurement. But that's still no guarantee they're going to come back around the, that same time. So it's not until they come around the fourth time that you can actually say, so if someone has a great year of 46,000 years, they got to experience that a couple of thousand times. You're dealing with a civilization that goes back hundreds of thousands of years. And I'm telling you, when all this is said and done, if they say that the comedic legacy began 4,100, I guarantee you we're going back a half a million years in Egypt. Now, I'm telling you that now. Time will, time will bear me out. If I'm wrong, I'm going to be dead, so it don't make a difference. <laughs> uh, and, if I do, and when I do come back, I'm going to be in another form, so I'm not going to lay claim that I said that the first time around. But if I'm right, then we'll have a body of knowledge that will go beyond all expectations. The Sphinx, I know I've said it before, I'll say it again, the Sphinx was not the head of a man, nor is it the body of a lion. It's the body of a lioness and the head of a woman. Because it was born and created within the Leo Virgo house. Not just that, they're pushing the pyramids back 10,000 years now. And I'm guaranteed, if they're pushing it back 10,000 years, give it 100,000 years. Because you cannot get a body of knowledge just like that. The knock culture, the knock heads, they say were made 900 years BC. But to get to that level of artistic greatness, you would have to have been doing that thousands of years to get to that level. So the knock culture merely is the peak of what you see. 
But all of the years that led up to that is what you've got to focus on. This is what Africa will show us. And these are the skills. These are the kinds of questions we need to be asking ourselves. These are the kinds of things we need to be asking our young people. What do you think? You get to your ninth and 10th grade and you do algebra and geometry, but it's the math you learned in kindergarten that helps you to do that math up in the greater years. So the same is true that if that's true, then it's also true that much of the greatness of Kemet, of the pyramid building, and you see the writing system, the pharaonic system, all they say was, born. that's why they give it, they say that people from outer space came down. Because they say that, you see, there is no sign that writing grew in Kemet. All of a sudden, it's there. Now, Kustal is the answer. Because it is obvious that they were writing in Lower Kemet, in Nubia, many years prior to the movement of Africans going into Kemet. Nothing could have been born in northern Kemet, in the delta, because it's marshland. These are questioning techniques. These are just thinking ideas. You can't build no pyramids in the marsh. You can't even begin to build anything on marsh, because if you live in marsh, you have a marsh mentality. But if you live in solid ground in Kemet and in, 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 in uh, Upper Kemet, which is the south, and in Ethiopia and Sudan, if you're on solid ground, and if you go to Namura Tunga, Namura Tunga being in northern Kenya and southern Ethiopia, I use the two because they're the same people. You see, it wasn't until 1885 that they carved Kenya from Ethiopia. These were the same Cushitic people in this area. So it's very important that as we develop these philosophies, we understand what it is that we're facing here as a people. The writing system, the pharaonic system, was in place in Lower Africa. In the Muratunga, there is evidence of Cushetic people looking at seven different stars and constellations, developing ideas as how to begin to look at stars. They were tracking Sirius. They knew how to look at Sirius in the Muratunga. So if they knew how to look at Sirius in the Muratunga and there is no evidence of people in the northern climes looking at Sirius, and then you look at an entire system such as the Kemetic system or the Dogon system who have a very special affinity to Sirius, I would dare say that idea came from Africa. Not unless you want to believe in some miracle, which I have no problem with, but we ain't dealing with that here. Because we have solid ground to work on here. So why make up hypotheses, as our brother would say? No need for further research. That's not a hypothesis. In the vernacular, we have another word for that, but I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Monitoring acceptance of the solution. In other words, you generate related ideas, but then you monitor acceptance of the solution. In other words, is it valid? Does it work? Can it continue to be worked? You just don't accept it and let it go. You test it and you retest it, you revise it, you look at it again and again. And then you draw your conclusions. Very important piece. To the first piece that we're talking about in terms of problem solving. Number two is decision making. Number two in decision making, you state your desired goal or your condition. A lot of young folk have a problem with that. They do not know how to state their goal. They don't know what they're looking for. But I don't blame them because I didn't know what I was looking for either when I was back there studying. It wasn't until I sat before the feet of John Henry Clark that I was able to state my desired goal or condition. It was not until I studied the works of Naeem Akbar, Dr. Ben, Richard King, that I began to understand how to even state a desired goal or condition. I didn't even know what a goal or a condition was. But how can you? Because whether you realize it or not, you may think that this society, Western civilization, is going into a particular direction, but we are aimlessly moving through space with no concept of our purpose on this planet, not to even understand that the Earth People talk about getting into a satellite and flying around into a spaceship. The Earth is a spaceship. 
we are traveling in space at phenomenal speed. We are following the direction of a sun, and the sun is following in the direction of a whole new universe. And it is only those who are aware. Remember the symbolic story of Noah. They laughed at him for 40 years. Brother was building the ark. He was telling people a flood was coming. They laughed at him. They told him, you don't know, you're a fool. He said, there's a flood coming. He said, because I can sense the creator's voice. And anyone that doesn't understand where we're headed, we're in very serious trouble. Because there's a flood coming. And we are here, assembled, to build an ark. And we're going to take two of everything. Because a lot of people are not going to follow us. You know that. You know, and, and I tell people, you know, we, you don't, you're not going to have a lot of people. A lot of people don't sense what's going on out there. They, they don't understand. That's why only one or two, a pair of each, so that you can continue the law of opposites, compliments. Because, see, a lot of people are not going to follow. They're going to call us fools. Because they don't see and know that there are changes. You can't go back. The law of the universe says you can't go back. Civilizations can only move forward when they're pushed. They can regress. They can't even stand still because the act of standing still is in fact the act of regression because the universe is moving forward. And as you move forward, you stand still, you're regressing. We are pushing the universe and our actions are cleansing the universe. And the universe is cleansing its own blood system. And everything you see happening is going to happen no matter what. What we're experiencing is like the common cold. It's going to take its course no matter what you do. Number two, stating challenges to goal condition. You must know what you're going to face. Our brother Alton Maddox has many gifts. But one of his greatest gifts is the gift of prophecy. The greatest leaders know what the future holds. I would never follow a leader that didn't know the future. If a, if a leader say he didn't know what was going to come up ahead, you, I'm not going with you. <laughs> I'd rather just stay where I am. But these retreats and all that happens in the UAM is an act of prophecy. It's an act of knowing what the future holds so that when the future comes, you'll be ready. And this is what I grew up on. My mother used to say, Skip, that's my nickname, Skip, the doors may not be open now, but whether they're open or not, you prepare yourself so that when they open, you'll be able to walk through. So people looked at me and they said, but what you studying this African stuff for? You know, they used to put bets on me. And the only way I used to know that they put bets on me was when I used to come up to them. And they say, give me my five dollars. I told you he's either going to say something about Africa or Malcolm. <laughs> now, is that an act of prophecy or what? <laughs> Brothers and sisters were putting money down on that. <laughs> but if you notice, the two most important concepts amongst us today is Malcolm and Africa. So we had the gift of prophecy. And so prophecy is very important and you must be able to state your challenges. And you can't state a challenge unless you know the future. Because your challenge hasn't come yet. It, you can see what's coming down the road. Identifying alternatives. What are your solutions? Alternative solutions. What are your alternatives? That's the greatest thing we can give our young people. As, as, as counseling goes, and sometimes I do counseling. I'm not a counselor, but I counsel. I counsel counselors. And one thing I found out about counselors is that the people who need counseling the most are counselors. But only rightfully so because they, they carry so many people's stuff around. They, gotta, they need someone to get their stuff off on. And they need somebody who can, yeah, bounce it off, you know. 
But in bouncing off, you must make sure it bounce off. Don't let it stick. You know that saying, I'm like rubber and you're like glue. What you say bounce off me and stick to you? So a counselor must be somebody who can allow things to just bounce off. Some of the greatest psychologists, well, some of the most greatest psychologists are the ones with the most problems, but some of the greatest psychologists are those who are good listeners and who can repeat in a clear way what the person is saying. And then the person starts to listen and they begin to realize they're spouting all of their challenges and all the things they're going through and what holds them back and the psychologist or the counselor is nodding their head and repeating what they're saying. Oh, going to your parents' house creates this. Oh, okay. And pretty soon, the person begins to listen and say, am I saying this? And then pretty soon, what the counselor does is offer alternatives. The worst thing you can do is tell somebody, because first of all, most people come to you with a problem ain't coming to hear what you want to hear or what you have to say. They're really coming to let it out. Hoping that in letting it out, something will come that they can deal with. So our job as counselors and as adults with our young people is to just repeat what they're saying. You don't have to give them no solutions. You know, and I don't, you know, I, I'm sure that we have spoken about the situation with OJ and I want to be very careful. But being that it's very clear, many young people have come to me and asked me. I have never told them what I feel, nor have I ever told them what I consider to be right or wrong. I just take them through the process of learning. What happened? How do you feel? What is right? What is wrong? What is this? What is that? You don't have to give solutions. You don't have to be the answer. The same is true with our period of bondage that they call slavery. I never tell people that it was wrong. I take them through the process of what happened. You don't have to tell young people what's right and wrong. Take them through the process, they'll come to their own conclusion. And once they come to their own conclusion, you've taught them how to fish and they'll solve any problem that comes that way again, considering possibly if they try to put them shackles around their hands again. But if you tell them, you don't give them the opportunity of thinking the process out to come to their own conclusion. Therefore, when it happens again, they may not be able to deal with it. Okay. Examining alternatives. Okay, you've identified the alternative, but now let's flesh it out. Let's talk about it. Let's examine it. Is, is, is it good? like what we were talking about in terms of the period of bondage. Was it right to do what they did? Was it right for us to do what we did? How can we begin to look at this in another way? Examining the alternatives, ranking the alternatives. What do you think you'd want to do first? If there was a fire in this room, what do you think you'd want to do first? Get out. Get out. That's true. But there are considerations, and Mother Franklin, you are one. Because my rank would be I'd want you and all the other elders out first. I'd want all the children out. I then would want to look at people who were physically challenged. I'd want to look at the different exits and which would be closer. People in the back, I wouldn't want you running out this exit when you have an exit there. People on this side, I wouldn't want you running out this exit or that exit. I'd want you going out there. But what's out there? Well, let's send somebody out there to see. You see, you're, you're ranking your alternatives. What is important? What are the realities that we're facing? Is there a fire at all? Or has someone just called a false alarm? You see? These are the things we flesh out with our young people that for some reason when we're in classrooms, we assume they know all this and they don't. But the reality of it is, is that the adult don't know it either. Because we have not gone through this. There have been some, some do. I'm not saying all don't. There are some dynamic people. Some of the greatest human beings I've ever met have been teachers. So I don't want to downplay that. I'm a teacher myself and very proud to be. So I don't want to downplay that. But the system itself does not do these kinds of things. Because if you know how to make your own decisions, what are you going to do? You're going to be free. You will liberate yourself. No one will tell you freedom is at hand. Because your freedom will be in your hand. You know, freedom is not at hand. Freedom's in your hand. Your, your foot's not in the door. Your body's in the house. Choosing the best alternative, okay? You've identified, you've examined, you've ranked, now you must choose. And in choosing, it's the process of application when you choose. Because that, okay, here is something you identified, talk. 
You've examined, you've talked, you ranked, you talked, but when you choose, you act. And that's the difference. And then, of course, you evaluate your actions. Was it right? Well, if there's a fire in this building and you get burned, you've evaluated your actions. But if everybody has gotten out safe and sound, you also evaluate your actions. Decision making number two. Now let's get into this heavy stuff because here's where Sherlock Holmes comes into play. Inferences. Now, the way in which we look at it is inferences is to conclude from your evidence. Now you know, I'm going to leave that alone because you know where I can take that. To conclude from your evidence. If there are two words that are Adela B. marked in my mind, it's reasonable doubt. <laughs> Out of inferences, to conclude from evidence of what you have. Because you see, a lot of people don't conclude from evidence. They conclude from hearsay. They conclude from he say, she say. They conclude from what they perceive. And the problem with perceptions is that perceptions are your senses and your senses can deceive you. Conclude from evidence. Evidence. What do you have in documentation? Forget about what they say. A, inductive thinking skills. Inductive. Let's look at that definition. Reasoning. Reasoning in which general principles are derived from particular facts or instances. Determining cause and effect. One of the most important concepts in our universe. Cause and effect. You do this, this will happen. You do this, that will happen. Determining cause and effect. If our young people knew this, they say that at one time, one out of four of our young brothers were in prison. Now they say one out of three. If we determined cause and effect, zero of us would be in prison. Because we would know what the effect of the cause was. My mother used to say, you really want to get back. You've got a big mouth, boy. This is back in the day. So you've got a lot to say. What you really want to get back at them? Get an education. Get an education, and you make them get on their knees and cry. That's the key. I've watched our young people play into their hands. Particularly our children who are in our challenge classes. If a teacher's having a particularly bad day, and this is not a good teacher I'm talking about, and they feel like getting Kwame out of class, they say, Kwame, how are your mother today? Kwame will go off. <laughs> Because Kwame's, for some reason, mother may set him off. Talking about his mother may set Kwame off. So say, Kwame, how you, and he might have a little twerk, or she may have a little twerk in her voice. How's your mother today? Kwame will go off. That's it for Kwame. Cause and effect. But if Kwame, if I could get to Kwame, I say, Kwame, you know what's going to happen. Let them say what they want to say. Cause and effect. Our young people don't understand this. They play on our children's feelings. I remember one time I was in a junior high school and this uh, gentleman didn't look like us, brought his child in to school. Child was, I think, in the fourth grade. Child got a computer at home. Child belongs to a computer club. Child has everything computer. Fourth grader came in, in a junior high school, eighth grade class, and that child was just zipping through the computer. He said, look at my son can do this. What's wrong with you? Half the class went off. He was lucky he got out the building. He ticked the class off because he was attempting to denigrate these older students, but he never told them all the things that the child had. The one thing he never told the child was the money that he made by denigrating the students was the money he spent to buy the computer in the first place. To send him into that special computer club in that special neighborhood. But you see, our children don't have that sense and they're not brought up from this perspective. Therefore, they can be played with. And then, of course, the next step is, of course, Rikers Island. So these are, the face, these are the things that we're facing. But again, skills is what our young people need to learn. Because if they had this skill, they would have played it off. You see? And so this is what we have to work on with our young people. 
analyzing open-ended problems. An open-ended problem is a problem that is open-ended. It has a lot of different solutions, but you must analyze what the open-endedness of it is and where do you go with it from there. And these are the kinds of things that we're looking at in terms of inductive reasoning skills or thinking skills. Reasoning by analogy. But I cannot put analogy down without putting symbol, without putting metaphor, without putting allegory. And if I had room, I would have put a comma and put hip hop. Reasoning. Because that's what our young people are doing in hip hop. Hip hop is not rap. Hip hop is a culture. Rap is a manifestation of hip hop. It is a part of hip hop. But hip hop is a culture. Our young people have a culture. When I listen to our young people talk, they are speaking on an allegorical perspective. We may not like those curse words. We may not like the terrible things we hear. But go beyond what you hear because my mother used to say, but it ain't bad, it's good, Skip. I say, yeah, it's bad. But it's not bad, it's good. But it's so good it became bad. And when it's better than bad, it's bad. <laughs> And when it's better than bad, then I got to get my body into it. And we are a metaphoric people. This is how we play in our life. This is the way in which we enjoy it. Making inferences. Making the conclusions from the evidence that you have. Making them happen. Determining relevant information. You see what we've experienced for the past year and something? All of this comes out of skills. Had we had skills, we'd have had no problem. But guess what? We had skills and we had no problem. The people with the problem are the people without the skills because they don't have this ability. They didn't understand what was going on around them. And as Richard Pryor would have said, they wouldn't have known it if they tripped over it. The reality of it is, is that we are placed here at this time to fulfill the universal prophecy. We are meant to show them the way. Because they don't know, but the only way we could show them the way was to come over here. And since none of us were going to volunteer to come over here, they had to drag us over here. So we are part of the book. And believe me, this process is going to unfold. And it's very important. Don't worry, I left a young one doing that. That's all right. <laughs> That's all part of it. She can stay here. I'm so used to working under those conditions, I don't know what to do. I wouldn't trade it for nothing in the world. Music to my ears. It's when I don't hear that, that I worry. You know, a young one is coming up on two. In fact, today, uh, our son Heru is uh, 21 months. And as I look around at our young people, and I, and I study the work of Amos Wilson, I come to understand how, how brilliant and prophetic that brother was. But you know, also, as Bob Marley sings, you know, uh, how, long will we stand how long will we stand aside and watch our prophets? I'm not getting the words right because I'm trying to knock it off right away, but he's talking about to fulfill the book, you know, and as much as I, I miss our brothers and sisters who have gone before us, I can't help but understand that it was their time. And they did all they could on this level in order to return back on another level. But the work of Amos Wilson was phenomenal. And while I had every... And while I have all of his books and anxiously looking forward to the blueprint, I, I read his work now and I see really how prophetic he was. Because, and you will see it happen even more with our young people. And their absolute brilliance. You know, my son was, uh, came a little early. And he was put in intensive care. And there's a, play, there's a room down the hall that is for children who have come out of intensive care but still need attention. Down the hall. And when I went in, they had children of color, children not of color, male, female. The first to leave that room were the young African girls. They were the first to leave. They were the first ready to leave. The first to mature was the African female. The next to leave was my son, the African male. I didn't see the others because they never got there. And 
as our brother was transcending, I recalled his work in the psychology of the black child where he breaks down right. the development of our children. Yes, he does. And I, I also got a little concerned because I know they know. And so I'm not surprised when last time they checked, one in four was in prison, and why now one in three is in prison. And the only way you can get up here is by passing a prison that's full of us down on that road across from James Way. What I find most interesting is that the tops of the buildings are pyramids. But those pyramids are going to save those young people that are in that prison because that power is going to come down. And if they think that corn is growing now, wait till you see what's going to grow in that prison. And you let us in there. Okay, determining relevant information, recognizing relationships. You've got to recognize relationships. Again, part of the metaphor. You've got to understand the relationship. When I used to say something was bad, I was making a relationship with what was good. Whether or not it was acceptable to those who were listening didn't make a difference. What was important to me was the person I was talking to. If my buddy said, yeah, that's bad, that's all I cared about. If someone I was talking to didn't understand, I said, well, hey, it's an African thing. <laughs> Solving insight challenges. Insight, I wanted to define because of its importance. Insight is the capacity to discern the true nature of a situation or penetration. The true nature. Not what you perceive, but what the true nature. What is the true nature? And you must penetrate beyond the outside to the insight. And that is why it was depicted as an eye in the front of the head. So you must solve insight or insightful challenges. In other words, you must go beyond just the outside problem and go deeper in. The Dogon had information on four levels. We teach the same levels, by the way. We just confuse them. You have the word from the front. After you get that down and you grow, you have the word from the back. You then have the words on the sides. And then when you're ready, you get the word from the inside or what they call the clear word, which means the spirit, the clear word, the word of the insight. You have penetrated all of the periphery. You have penetrated what you see on the outside, okay? What you see on the outside is deceiving. See, because you can look at an oasis and think you're looking at something. You can look at a mirage and think you're looking at something. It's not until you get inside that you understand, you see? It's not until you get into the center of the hurricane that you understand the damage that the hurricane can cause. But what's so interesting is that in the eye of the hurricane, yes. it's calm. So, so as we begin to flesh out and deal with these issues, you can see yes. the allegories that we can make with our young people. Imagine being in a classroom and discussing issues like this right. and working this way. Our children gravitate towards this. They play on that. In the schools where I go, they call me Mr. Hotep Man. <laughs> From the inductive, we go to the deductive thinking skills. Deductive, a logical method in which a conclusion necessarily follows from propositions stated. Now again, you know, with all that we've experienced, you can relate all this. Because this was the thinking that went on. This is the thinking we have always used. You have a large intellect, you have a clear intellect, and you have a fine intellect. Malcolm, our brother Alton, our sister Leola, because Alton would not be Alton without Leola, let's be clear. That's right. And I appreciate his recognition of this constantly. I would not be who I am without my African queen. That's right. And for those who have the queens that support and do all those necessary things, we can see this occurring. A large intellect is an intellect that has a lot of concepts. A fine intellect is an intellect that can pinpoint the intellect and the uh, clear intellect or the, um, the, the large, the clear, and the fine. The fine is the one that can pinpoint. The clear is the one that can, I'm sorry, the ready. It's the fine, the large, and the ready. The ready intellect is the intellect that can call upon command the knowledge they need. Malcolm was a clear example of that. He, had a fight. he could pinpoint what he was saying. 
he had a lot of concepts, and the moment someone asked him a question, the brother could, he was ready, ready. We can, that is not something that you are born with. That's something, that's a skill. You work on that. And these are the things that if we work with our community and our children, we can develop. Because they already have those, already. So it's clear that we understand that. Yes, sir, please. Yeah, I would say 206, learning. Cooperative learning, which a lot of people are getting into now, which has always been around. In other words, the way in which we set up our center is that we have round tables and children sit at the tables. We don't have the rows and the columns. See, the rows and the columns are set up so that people will, well, the teacher feel intimidated. And that if you bring groups together, children will pretty much figure out the teacher don't know what's going on. Because they talk among themselves. But if you keep them in rows and columns, everybody is separate. And everybody's focused in up front. Thank you, my sister. Therefore, you cannot develop those kinds of issues or concepts in a um, rows and columns setup. One of the most important things that they've come to realize is that talking among students is very important. You know, silence is not always golden. Sometimes silence is deadly. And it's very important that our children, if our children, you know, our lunch hours, for, for those who are teachers, probably one of the times that is regretted the most is lunch duty. And the reason why lunch duty is truly regretted is because many of our young people really begin to let out their melanin during the lunch period. And the reason why there's a problem is not because the children have a problem, it is because they have been so suppressed all morning long. Not being able to talk, not being able to move. When you bathroom them, they call the children. I'm sorry? Exactly. And that is not the way of the world. You're not supposed to be restricted. That's why when they, they call it bathrooming children. It, was, yeah, it sounds like cattle, like you're going to walk a dog. They, they bathroom children, and the children online are like this, and we're constantly telling them, stand still, stand up straight, blah, blah, blah. But, but they can't, because they got to move. That melanin got to move in. And then in many classes, they punish the children who are really of whatever nature by, well, you can't go to gym class. Well, that's the last thing you should do to a child like that. If anything, when they act like that, send them to gym. Because we are a people of movement. When we were in Africa, we moved. We learned under the Baobab tree or the Yegba tree. We were sent by our elder from one side to another side to do something, to act, to do, to move. Yet now we restrict them. We make them stand still. So that when lunchtime comes, here they come all doing their thing. Hotep, my brother, thank you. We, they, they move and at lunchtime, the talking level is so high that they need to bring bullhorns in to talk to the children. But if the children had been allowed to interface, to interchange, to share during the morning classes, there'd be no need for the explosion at lunch. But you see, it's the way the system is set up. And you have no choice. So this is the things that we see. Thank you for sharing that, because that allowed me to talk about cooperative learning, which is very important, something that we've got to get back into. Cooperative learning. And to have circles. And in the, I don't even believe in having square seats. Ch uh, tables, circles, so that everybody can see each other. To have times during the day, you know, a lot of teachers say, oh, the last thing I want to do is have them send all them uh, those desks back and have them sit in a circle. But a well-disciplined class, a class that knows that they can express themselves, is not going to give you problems. I don't have those kind of problems. I have other problems. There are things I have to overcome with young people, like all other educators do. But once we get together, there's one thing that the young people know. There's two things that young people know. I love and I respect them. And that bottom line allows what we need to do to happen. Same thing with that sister from South Africa. When she had 200, all 250 children knew that she loved and respected them and wanted the best from them. Therefore, they loved and respected her back and gave her their best. It's a natural, it's reciprocity. It's like the sun rising and setting. You would never doubt that the sun would rise and set. No more than I would doubt that children will do the right thing if they're around people who do the right thing. Please, my sister. It's true. Yeah, it's true. Absolutely. That's all you need. Yeah. And children recognize that. They certainly do. 
-hmm. That's right. And they would tell you. That's right. That's right. And you know, that's an interesting thing because all children like to feel as if they help. And you know, in fact, sometimes, sometimes bless their heart to get to the way. Because once, once they find someone that they can teach something to, oh, then they want to teach you everything. So then they <laughs> bless their heart. I love it, but uh, but the, the the idea proves the point that they will go beyond all. And some of the roughest necks, some of the ones that would have been in all these different classes are the ones that will come back. And some people say they surprise me. They don't surprise me. They merely do what I know they can do in the first place. What surprises me is that we don't know that. Please. Russell Means. Okay. Russell Means. Okay. Yeah, that's the dynamite brother. Okay. So we have defined deductive. Deductive, number one, using logic. Of course, now logic, be careful of because logic changes with the culture you're dealing with. So it's important to be careful what logical is. Because, you know, you can be logical and living in an illogical society. And you think you illogical. You follow what I'm saying? And you can be illogical, living in a logical society, and think you logical. You see? So it's, very, it's important that we be careful with this word logic and we, we understand what a logical method is. And all you got to do is return back to ma'at. Yes. If you're ever wondering what is logic, ma'at is logic. The balance is logic. Using logic, spotting contradictory statements. Now pick up the Daily News. The New York Post. <laughs> And you can see this. You can understand this. Okay, thank you. You can understand this and know this. This is how you can look at contradictory statements. From a historical perspective, if you take the Constitution of the United States, and you will spot almost immediately a contradictory statement. And here's the contradictory statement. We the people. Because we the people didn't put that together. A group of people known as the Haudenosaunee put that together, who the French called the Iroquois. They called it the Kaia Nerikawa, which is the great law of peace. Who in 1754, Ben Franklin attended a conference with the Haudenosaunee and learned of the way in which they brought their sachems together. And because there were 13 sovereign states in the United States, Ben Franklin was attracted to an idea of how you could bring together 13 sovereign states, remaining sovereign, but at the same time answering to a federation. So we the people didn't put that together. The Haudenosaunee put that together. But even if you look at it a deeper way, we the people did. Because African folk and women folk who are part of the people were not in we the people. It was not by the people, and it definitely wasn't for the people. But I'm in the legal aspect, and our brother, Attorney Maddox, can take care of this, so I'm going to leave that alone. Right. Analyzing syllogisms. Again, I thought that was an exceptional word that I had to look up. A syllogism is a formal argument consisting of a major premise and a minor premise leading to a conclusion. Take them through the process. Kepra. Take them through the process. You have a major idea, you have a minor idea, and all of this is going along leading to a conclusion. It's not aimless. It's leading to someplace. So you want to, with the students in deductive reasoning and thinking skills, to analyze this process. Solving spatial challenges. Spatial equals space. The Chemites would have called this nunet or shu. Page eight. Divergent thinking skills. Listing attributes of objects slash situations. Generating multiple ideas, which could also be called Fluency. In other words, you're generating 
multiple ideas, not just one idea, not two ideas, it goes back to, again, you could play back and forth, it just goes back to relating your ideas, multiple ideas. Nothing is just one. Everything taps into another, has impact on other. Our children don't know this. They don't understand the ripple in the water. The ripple in the water affects everything. The proverb uh, that that no person is an island unto themselves, that whatever you do has an impact on the universe. You cannot impact the whales and not think that that's not going to impact us. You cannot get rid of the gorillas of the Virunga Mountains and not have an impact on the entire ecological balance of our world. You cannot mistreat women. You cannot mistreat African people. You cannot mistreat Asian or Native Americans and not think that what went around will not come around. You can't. Yet this society thinks it can. And that's frightening to me because we keep thinking that they're going to pay the price. We all will pay the price. Because when they are impacted by it, we will be impacted by it. And that's why Dr. King said to free them, to free us, we must free them. As much as we don't like to believe that, it is true. And that's one of the things that we have to look at. Generating different ideas or flexibility. Different ideas, flexibility. The ability to see, like in the Netchers, for example, to look at a Netcher to understand that you can look at the sun and call the sun six different names. Atum, Ra, you can call uh, a number, uh, you can call it a number of things again because of, I, I, I pull that out. You can call it a number of things and it takes a different. Atum is another name. Uh, the Phoenix is another name, please. Heru is another name. You can give it the symbol of a circle with a black dot in the middle. You can give it the symbol of a phoenix bird. You can give it the symbol of an eye. It's a different idea, but it's the same concept. Multiple ideas. It's fluent. Generating unique ideas. Generating unique ideas. Not unique in the cosmos, but unique to humanity. Because nothing is new under the sun. But to a young person, their idea, from their perspective, is unique. From their perspective. It is like there is an accident in the middle of the street, and there is a person on every corner. In order to understand exactly what happened, you just can't go to one person. You must go to all people, and if the person in the middle at the accident is still alive, ask them too. Our problem is we've only gone to one person. Therefore, we see the world only through one eye. Generating detailed ideas or elaboration. You elaborate on the idea. You detail it. You give it its flavor. You give it its understanding. You time it. You space it. You give it its historical and its geographical bearing. Synthesizing information. You bring it all together. Synthesize. You bring together. Photosynthesis, what light brings together. Synthesize. You bring it together. So with all of these thinking ideas, it, although they're divergent, although they may be multiple, different, unique, and detailed, you bring all that together and you come forward with a synthesized idea or notion. Evaluative thinking skills. Evaluative thinking skills, we begin with distinguishing between fact and opinion. I saw somebody. I think I saw somebody. Is that a fact or opinion? That's an opinion because I may not have seen anybody. I may have just said that. Okay? Now, if I said I'm standing here, that's a fact. You can monitor that. There's a difference between fact and opinion. In this country, one of the most serious problems is we don't know the difference between fact and opinion. We take opinions to be facts and we factualize opinions. Look at the pyramids. Look at Lord Carnarvon. 
I'm only going to call him Lord because that's what they call him. He ain't no Lord to me, but let's call him Lord because that's his, that's his first name, let's say. <laughs> and Howard Carter, okay? Go down into this tomb and they bring forward certain facts and still no one will say that the 18th dynasty was black. He brought forward this black statue. I got the statue in our center. It's one of the bookends. It's black with a gold staff, gold makeup, gold skirt, gold sandals, gold nemes, black face. But people will tell you there was a fire. Well, that was a particular fire, wasn't it? Funny how it didn't touch the sandal, the eye makeup, the skirt, the nemes. It just touched the skin. That alone should tell you that the fire was black. So if the fire was black, then he must have been black. If you want to deal with fantasy, let's deal there. Fact and opinion. We still arguing and debating this fact. It's not a fact to argue. And you see, the problem is, we still argue. We should be long gone from there. That was yesterday's discussion. The fact is, he's black. Let's go back to Wade Nobles. He's black. You can say what you want to. You see? I like this. I like that very much. Because that means a lot to me. That says everything I need to say. Out my face. <laughs> Judging credibility of a source. Observing and judging observation reports. Do you know there is not one piece of evidence that shows that the Kemetic civilization was built by any other people than an African people? There's not one primary source that exists that will substantiate that. Not one. Not one. Yet, we will take secondhand, secondary sources, and they have made us to believe their primary sources. My argument is the Memphite text. My argument is the Shabaka stone. My argument is the Bremerin papyrus. My argument is the hymn to our ten, which I have copies of up here. I have two different versions of it. Please. They're telling a lie. They're telling an untruth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, you say, okay, yes, absolutely. We are accepting their observance and their judgment of their reports. We, we are accepting that. We are saying, okay, we accept. There is not one piece of evidence that exists that will substantiate that. Yet we have incense holders from Nubia that show the entire pharaonic system in place in Africa amongst African people nine to 12 generations before the first dynasty of ancient Kemet. Yet with this information of primary source, the incense burner, we don't look at that as a primary source. That's revisionist history, they say. This is a primary source coming up out of the L14 tomb of a pharaoh of Nubia. And here you have some report that someone has said about what someone else said, this he said, she said, that they are using as a primary source, which goes back to an evaluative thinking skill, which we could never even have gotten into the argument if we had used the concept of observing and judging observation reports and using the credibility of the source itself. Say again. Weighing and judging the evidence that you have. Identifying central issues and challenges. You see, if you don't know what the central issue is, if you don't zoom in on the centerpiece, you can't deal with the other issues. Because everything flourishes. It's, in, in, in physics, it's called centrifugal. That, that the draw, while it is catapulted out, it is constantly drawn into the center. Centripetal is the opposite. Okay, it is constantly being drawn in to the middle. Centrifugal means it's sent out but it is constantly being drawn into the centerpiece. Well, the issues that we're dealing with here, the things that center around all of the other issues as the planets 
circle the sun. If you do not look at the central issue, you can't understand the peripheral things that are going on. Therefore, people would rather get on to, to side issues. And that's where we get tripped up because we get caught up in the side issues which have nothing to do with the central issue. Once we get into the central issue, then we can understand why the side issues are what they are. But if you argue the side issues, you'll never get to the central point. Therefore, the argument will be forever. Therefore, the challenge becomes a problem as opposed to a challenge. Recognizing underlying assumptions. You've got to understand. Doc, uh, Dr. Theofalio Benga calls it curious preoccupations. I like, that. I like the way he says that. Recognizing underlying assumptions. What are the assumptions that people are saying? What is the agenda that people have? Other than just, why would somebody create a math book and talk all about what people of European descent created when the very number system is Hindu Arabic? The very numbers they used, they got from the Moors. Because the Moors, you see, even when they say Hindu Arabic, it's not Hindu Arabic. It's Hindu Moor. Because the Moor introduced these numbers to Europe. But because they say the Moors were Arabic, it becomes Hindu Arabic, but it is not Hindu Arabic. It is Dravidian Moorish. But you don't have history. That's right. History of the world and what? And you don't study the white man and the white man's life. You've got to send the white man back. That history is very relevant. Because again, there are two things you must center yourself in in life with our young people. And as you're dealing with all these issues, there are two things, time and space. Time is history, space is geography. You see, and if we don't put this together, they'll take a lot of things out. And the things they take out are the very things that create, as we say, the central issue. The number system we use today is Dravidian Moor. It is not even so much Moorish, so much Dravidian as it is Central African. Because out of the Central African came the foundations of the philosophy that would bring forward all of the other ideas. So again, you go back to the central issue and not the peripheral. Not to take away from the Dravidian, not to take away from the Moor, but to give to the originators of what we're saying. You see, the history of it, because it's key. Because I don't mean to take anything from anybody. I just want to go back to the center, for instance. One of the problems that we're facing in terms of the pyramids of America is that we are not giving the Native American credit for building the pyramids. We are under the impression that Africans built the pyramids. No, they did not. The Africans gave the technology to the Native American, and the Native American was so astute, was so intelligent, and so brilliant that they were good learners. And in turn, they gave to the African knowledge in pharmacology, which is pharmacy, and agriculture that the African didn't have. And the, the evidence of this is a peaceful coexistence. Sometimes a little skirmish, but that's the way humanity goes. But the evidence of it is that you don't see Africans coming to America se selling Native Americans gold. You see Africans teaching them how to build a funeral mask out of jade the gem of America. You see, we weren't trying to sell them our wares, we were trying to share our knowledge. Our idea was not to come, there was many African folk, there were more African folk in Africa than there were people of European descent. But when Africans came to America, their idea was not to colonize America. It was to share. Of course the African could have come, but they loved Africa so much, they came to teach and they returned. It, but when you leave someplace you don't want to be, you colonize where you go. But when you love your home, you visit and you go back. You see, these are the issues of critical thinking skills that giving our children give an underpinning to the great morality and the Maatian ethic of African people. And so that's what's important to me. I'm not trying to say that Africans came, because sometimes we end up doing to the Native American what the Europeans did. That the Native American was waiting here, waiting to be enlightened. The Native American was a brilliant individual. Had come to understand his and her environment. Not to mention, of course, that the first two strands of the African in America was, of course, 
the, I mean the people of America, were African. And that's the work of Renoko Rashidi. The Twa people were the first to come to America, and then the Clovis Folsom people, or the larger type African, were the second. And then came the Algonquin, which was the first uh, depigmented African to come to America. And then in great numbers came the Eskimo. And so the gene pool of two Africans and two yellow Asian became red. That's why they're red. They were called red because in the color hue, the balance of brown, black, and yellow is red. So the Native American is an African and an Asian. Detecting bias, stereotypes, cliches, self-explanatory. Recognizing loaded language. Self-explanatory. I could give you a phrase, but I'll leave that alone also. Because I know all this is played out, and I really don't want to play on emotions. And after a while, it gets to the point where we must move on. And we really do. Believe me, there's so much we could say about what has happened these past couple of months to us as a people and just to the nation and to the world itself. But you know, sometimes you stop and you understand what's important. And when you understand what the central issue is, the central issue is the emancipation and liberation of African people in this area. Right. Evaluating hypothesis. Evaluating it. Classifying data. Knowing where what goes. Don't put the wrong thing in the wrong way. In other words, if something begins with a B, don't put it in the A section. Put it in the B section where it belongs. Our problem is that we got things that belong in the A section, we got it in Z. And the problem is we don't know the difference between A and Z. Predicting consequences. Very important. Going back to the concept of prophecy. Understanding what your consequences are going to be. The cause and effect. Understanding. Predicting your consequences. We could have predicted consequences. The Honorable Marcus Garvey predicted consequences. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad predicted consequences. Malcolm predicted consequences. Bob Marley predicted consequences. Pedro Albizu Campos predicted consequences. Bookman predicted consequences along with Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. We are living their consequences and we are in fact their prediction. And that's what frightens them the most because we are the future of America. Demonstrating sequential synthesis of information. Demonstrating sequential. In other words, ensure that you put things in sequence. Don't put things ahead of their time. Don't put the horse behind. No, doesn't the horse go before the cart? Okay, don't put the cart in front of the horse. And if you will notice in the number system, when, once you get to 10, which is like a little... Uh, arc, that the singular numbers go to the left. So that would be 11. And then number 12 is planning alternative strategies. In other words, remember going back to your alternative strategies, ensure that you can plan alternative strategies. And by the way, this is page 10. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. The religious Pat Robinson? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's been a theme in New York and California about four and a half years ago. To make a long story short. Then I have over 500 of our children in that school. When we call, a group of us tried to get information on the school through the New York Court of Ed. They had, they had the register, they had those credit books. This was parent. Uh, quite frankly, if the parent goes along with it, there's very little you can do. That's what we Bottom line. Uh, the one thing that I would suggest you... Okay. Sure. Sure. I would assume that it's a religious school. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I've often offered, uh, offered as suggestions and solutions to all of these types of problems is that we as a people must uh, put up... Yes. And I, I would challenge that at any point in time, 
that we could put a school together designed as we as a people see fit. We will so far surpass them, those parents will be begging to bring their children into our school. Yeah, we see, these are the things we're facing. The realities that we're facing is that, and I believe that another very serious problem is that what Professor Clark teaches us is that, you know, what we're doing now, and I've visited certain schools of African descent, you know, African perspective, and I've been to different places around the country. And what I've noticed is that it's like what Professor Clark teaches us is like putting clean water in a dirty glass. See, the method is as important as what you teach. You see, you could teach European history from an African perspective, and the students will learn everything. You could teach African history from a European perspective, students learn nothing. It's the method that's very important. And if you don't tap into the method, but you see what Christian schools have with Christian students is the method is Christianity. And once the method matches the mind of the child, you'll have success no matter what you teach them. You see? When children get up in the morning, and we could go into a whole nother thing, but I'll let Khalid Muhammad do that. When children get up in the morning and pray, they psych themselves to learn. They immediately psych themselves, no matter if they believe in the prayer or not. Once you put your spirit into it, no matter if it is the proper spirit or not, you're going to gain what they teach you. It works. And what we have got to do is find a way to tap into our African children. See, we're fighting an entire battle. We have been, by the pains of torture and death, been made to hate ourselves. So we've got a monumental challenge ahead of us. We've got to find our children, our children, who want to learn this. And once that happens, we can perform things that are called miracles. But they're merely ideas that their time has come. But there's very little that can be done under those conditions if the parents go along. Very little. Very little. Yes. 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 Yeah. Well, the thing that you have to realize also is that um, uh, the, the, the realization, of course, is that the future will have no place for them. You see, the future will, and as I say, not all of us are going to make it. And for many of us who have grown up in a certain, and you see, remember that, that people, uh, well, from the Caribbean, but in particular, Haitian, uh, and those of Puerto Rican and Dominican and Cuban descent, Candomblé of Brazil, Santeria, Espiritualismo, all of these different faith systems deeply rooted in the Christian church. Um, they are very steeped in spirituality. And they will pay whatever they have to pay, do whatever they have to do to get their children in the school. And there are realities that we have to face. And my, my reality is, is that if I could do it and build a school, I could guarantee you and if I could choose the staff, I could guarantee you of certain things. Because I have been to schools where children in the beginning just didn't want to hear this stuff. They just didn't want to hear it. And by the time that the class was over, they were saying they kind of enjoyed it. I did a piece on, uh, I, I, I did a three-part series with a class on the Eye of Heru and teaching fractions. It was a three-part series. I didn't teach them the fractions right away. I told them the Usirian drama first. I played it out, told them a story. That's the first, thing. put down your pencils, your pens, clear your desk, let's talk. Formed a circle, I told them the Usirian drama. The next week when we came in, we talked about the piece where, and you know what, it, what I did was that I left it right at the point where Setesh plucked the eye of Heru out. Oh, the children, I mean, with that Mortal Kombat stuff. <laughs> and I played that story to the hilt too. Okay, you want violence? I'll give you violence. <laughs> we played that Osirian drama out to the hilt. Them children was on the edge of the seat. Young Latina came to me at the end of the class and said, Mr. Coleman, I know you got to go, but can you kind of give me a hint as to what happens? <laughs> That's where they were with the story. It wasn't me. It was the method of telling the story that got them 
Forget about the fractions. We're not there yet. The next week I came, we continued the story. But we dealt with the psychological dimensions of who was involved in the story, the good, the bad, the, the, the determined aset, the prophetic nebetet, the evil setesh, the hurt Heru, who turned to Heru Kuti, who battled his uncle. So then we dealt with that piece to it. And then we broke the eye down. The eye was plucked, it was on the ground, and the eye didn't bounce, it didn't splatter. It cracked in six pieces. Oh, children said, six pieces? <laughs> I said, yes, that's how Satesh was. He just chopped it up. And then we dealt with the fractions. The one half, the one quarter, the one eighth, the one sixteenth, the one thirty second. We dealt with the concept of hal having, H A L V I N G, the, the basic way in which Chemites used to do their multiplication and division by having everything, and then in having, you multiply. Because you cannot have one half and not produce two. Because one half means you have two of one. You cannot have one quarter without having four. You see? So, as they divided, they multiplied. So we did little problems in addition and multiplication and division and subtract. And then pretty soon all those young people that said that they didn't like mathematics, all of a sudden knew how to find a common denominator. Right there, I should give you some questions if the relationship was truly as venomous as many people say it was. But nonetheless, Du Bois is asking for a job. He says, Hey, your wife is my reference. She knows of me, but also this person at John Hopkins knows of me as well. But he's asking for a job, and then later on, he, you know, just because just for the disbelievers, I I include another letter that is more specific shortly after uh, that indicates that Du Bois had some serious intentions in terms of doing research at Tuskegee and making Tuskegee his base. Because certainly he did want to put the, um, the study of the African person in the American context on a more scientific terms more scientific terms he was looking for a place to do that he thought he could do that at the university of pennsylvania i don't think it worked out like that but he does produce the philadelphia study the study of the, the philadelphia negro right so he he does get into uh what would seem like a sociological perspective or a sociological study of the african population in philadelphia uh, but he, even before he gets there, he is talking to Washington about his plans on how to uh, do this on a larger scale at Tuskegee and how to how to make this part of the program, right? So, so part of Tuskegee's curriculum, so to speak. He writes, and this is from Du Bois. I'll tell you when he. Uh, well, I can't tell you the date, but this is actually in the um, Booker T. Washington papers. And actually, if you get the book, you'll see the citation. Nonetheless, uh, it is part of the Booker T. Washington papers. And this is the actual letter. Well, dear Mr. Washington, I feel I should like to work at Tuskegee if I could be of service to you. My idea has been that there might gradually be developed there a school of Negro history and social investigation, which might serve to help place more and more the Negro problem on a basis of sober fact. 
I think that in time, various colleges like Harvard, Chicago, John Hopkins, and the U Penn would would join in supporting such a movement. What do you think? At the present, I just know how I could be of service. I can teach most primary and secondary branches, preferring, of course, history, economics, social problems. Same as he says before, I have had an indication that I may possibly expect an offer from the University of Pennsylvania for a year, after which, if needed, I could come to Tuskegee, perhaps, have the active aid of a great institution like New Penn. In any case, I am willing and eager to entertain any proposition for giving my services to your school. That's a rough reading, but the point is, is that, you know, his intention after his year at the University of Pennsylvania is to come back to Tuskegee and establish a scientific study of the African experience here, or so he said it in, in the other term, the Negro, right? Uh, so, but so this is his second uh, correspondence, not second correspondence to Washington, but the second correspondence in which he writes and asks for a job, employment. And he's, and he's fully aware, like I said, that this is not, um, that this is not a vocational and industrial school. Because if that is the case, why are you asking for a job? You know, you're not talking about wheel writing. You're not talking about the printing press. You're not talking about the industries that you're skilled in. You're talking about engaging in a scientific study of the African experience in the United States, right? And you look for a home, uh, an institution to house that study, that scientific study. That is not uh, of a Western nation, nature, right? So in other words, a non-white institution to do this, right? So, um, but that being said, that should kind of sort of dispel that. And, and I get into just the the nine-year relationship that they have. Unfortunately, and I'll give this up here, unfortunately what ends up happening is in the summer of 1903, Du Bois is, at, is in Tuskegee. And we can put him on the campus because he's writing letters from Tuskegee. Um, the only reason that I don't argue in this book that Du Bois in fact taught at Tuskegee, at either in the summer or on the side of you of writing, of, on the side of you know uh, teaching elsewhere is because I was never able to locate a syllabus. However, there is every reason to suspect that Du Bois in fact did teach courses at Tuskegee here and there, and very likely in the summer and in interim periods. Now he's in Tuskegee in the summer of 1903, and 1903 should ring a bell for historians and people who study this conflict between Du Bois and Washington because it is the same year that The Souls of Black Folks is published. And how does that make sense? How does Du Bois end up publishing a book that essentially begins this uh, issue between Booker T. Washington and him in the public realm when he is there at his house, sleeping at his house, eating his food, uh, communing with his family, well, what also happens in the summer of 1903 are some riots, race riots, that happen in Boston. And Monroe Trotter is leadership in Boston. And what happens is Du Bois goes from Washington's house at some point that summer and visits Monroe Trotter, who is Washington's chief critic, Washington would consider him would have considered him an uh, enemy and a uh, critic in the public realm. This was not uh, unknown at the time. This was an understanding. And Du Bois goes to Boston and he publicly congratulates Monroe Trotter on Trotter's handling in the public realm of the riots. Now, Trotter's not involved in them, but he speaks publicly about him, about the riots, and Du Bois actually congratulates him on his commentary in the public realm about the riots. 
This is a problem for Washington, and this is the source of Washington's issue with Du Bois. Uh, aside from this issue, he does not exactly have any other issue with Du Bois, but here in lies the conflict. Du Bois aligns himself with Monroe Trotter in a very familiar way after having had a lot of personal contact with Washington, his family, uh, at his home in Tuskegee. And this was not, uh, like I said, I can't stress it more. Anybody who researches this or gets into the personal papers of both, we would, you know, it's well established that they are very familiar. And do you know how many students we have here in Canada? Anybody knows? No. We study. Send me. 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 history. Before Egypt I existed, deep in the valley of Mother Africa I roamed because that was my first home. I am black history. Settled the land, domesticated the animals, built pyramids and great cities everywhere I went. I am black history. Cold black, blue black, brown black, Yellow, black, red, black, white, black, all the colors come from me. I am black history. Before Abraham, before Moses, before Jesus, before the pyramids, I was here settling the earth. Tomb robbers, culture vultures lied about me, claim I had no history. When I am the first fruits that our creator had produced, I am black history, resilient, gifted, blessed, survivor, teacher, builder. Greatness dwells in us, for we are the original children of the sacred dust. I am black history. Slavery tried to wipe out my beginning and create a new me for the benefit of others. Killed so many of my kin on those ships, in those dungeons, in that new land, with that whip, with that gun, with that racism. Separated me from my language, from my people, from hearing the sacred drums. Told me my God was their God. Beat me, mistreat me. Break my sister, my mother, my brother for sports. I am black history. Still strong. Still surviving. Any and everything that tries to weaken and destroy me. The lost fruits of Mother Africa that were scattered on the shores of Santo Domingo, Puerto Rico, Panama, India, Mexico, Trinidad, Guyana, just to name a few will one day awaken and grasp the truth that Africa is their beginning roots. I am black history. Regardless of my current state, I was born great. And as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the ending. I am black history. You are black history with your accent, with your straight hair, with your light skin. Reclaim your hair heritage and get that denial out of your brain and break the change. I am black history and you are too. and hypocrisy. 
an America that treats all its citizens with respect and dignity. Oh, America, with your pretty words that speak of democracy, while your actions have kept our people under your subjugation, kept the seeds of racism growing, kept decency on the run for those who you deem unworthy of the American dream. The new America is an angry America. Angry that someone would dare challenge them on American soil. Angry that they were caught unprepared and could not withstand the attack of others. The new America, where people of color still fear the police, still face opposition because of religious belief, still searching for justice, better housing, and a true bite up from the American pie. The new America is being sponsored by the makers of control and all their not so subtle components. America has been wounded. Her ego has been brought to the surface of consciousness. And she must now face an enemy who does not fear death, doesn't buy into the hype that America is invincible, doesn't mind shedding American blood on American soil. The new America is not so new after all. <laughs> Looking outside, I wrote this piece coming on one Sunday morning. I was up there on Atlantic Avenue by the, the men's shelter. And I said to myself, where has all the greatness gone? The homeless is not you, black man. The confused, the scared, the thug, the three-fifths of a man they tried to create. None of them are the true you. Black man, black king, you are the ruler of everything. Where has all the greatness gone? Is it being suppressed, oppressed, made to lie in wait, or victim of a diabolical plot to keep you stagnant, unsure of your abilities, and no faith in your God? Slavery hurts your generations greatly. Drugs unemployment has been affecting you lately. Where has all your stamina gone? Have you forgotten just how strong you are? Or have they weakened you so much that you have given up? A hollow man is what you have been. Always searching, always hurting, never really certain if you're going in the right direction. Where has all the greatness gone? Seeing many of you in your current state explains many of the problems that fall upon our race. Black man, it's time for you to rise and find a solution to stop the pollution of your natural strength, natural gifts. Time to stop pretending and not worrying about offending those who openly and secretly try to keep you down. You who named the stars and walk on this planet first. Where has all your greatness gone? Your footsteps are not being followed by your children. Your sons seek to rise above you and not respect you. Your mate constantly puts more pressure on you. Society is always testing you. The streets are always challenging you. So many of you are unaware of your true history. So many of you don't know or refuse to know that you are the descendants of the first man, the first fruits that the creator made in his image. Slavery survivors, inventors, mathematicians, gifted builders. When the world was new, there was nothing you could not do. Where has all your greatness gone? I hear those words in the faces of our children. Our women see us portrayed as criminals, servants, low life and no life on the television. I read the statistics of our death rate, of our prison fate. 
My soul weeps. My eyes sometimes stare in disbelief at the damage done to black men and other men of color. The children are watching. The ancestors are weeping. And the spirits keep repeating, where has all your witness gone? I'm going to leave you with this. It's called this Warriors. Where are the Warriors? The battlefield has been stretched. The enemy has gained more strength. The people are still scattered in their unity. Where are the Warriors? Seeds of Shaka. Seeds of Malcolm. Seeds of Denmark. Of Hannibal. Of Harriet. And all the others who carry warrior seeds. Now is the time. Prepare yourself. Align yourself for our people are still under attack. Our people are still disenchanted, still angry, still in search of dignity and respect. Where are the warriors? How come the drums stop playing and no one notice? How come we approach each other with caution instead of love? Warriors, have you been too subdued, duped into thinking that our race is not sinking into the depths of despair? Warriors, do you not hear the call in your soul from the ancestors or see the pain in the lives of your people? See the pain in their faces. See the destruction in some of our neighborhoods. Warriors, the blood is calling. Will you answer the cries of the innocent, the cries of injustice, and the cries of those who have given up and accept their conditioning as normal? Warriors, our hope depends on the likes of you. How long will you remain dormant while racism and its crew flex themselves with arrogance and disdain for the nations of color. Where are the warriors? Is one in your home, in your heart, in your family who is willing to stop the killing, willing to stop the onslaught, willing to not pretend that millennium slavery does not exist? Warrior. If you don't stand up, speak up, represent us, then everything that our ancestors fought and died for will have been in vain. Warriors, if you are here, stand for me. Make a sound for me. Let me see it in your face or hear the flames of your words. Warriors, I have been commissioned to write about our dreadful condition and remind you that now is the time now is the time, like the sun you must rise. Prepare yourself, show yourself, you are divinely protected. Where are the warriors? Was that genius or was that genius? Was that genius or was that genius? What you have here before us. Okay, uh, Professor Kaba, as we know him at City University, is certainly also a college professor. And what I have noticed about him personally is that he has a certain sensitivity to the learning needs of our black children. And that's very, very important. Uh, I think they call it program instruction. But so many of our young people are bright, and we just don't know it. Yeah. They don't even know it. And the brother has a certain sensitivity that allows him to enter their space. Because you know, as African people, we are, we are multidimensional. We have a lot of identities. And we are very bright. As an instructor, one of the things I learned that I must not ever do is give multiple choice exams because our young sisters and brothers can tell you why every choice is the right choice. <laughs> Up to them, there's a logic they have, all right, before it gets contaminated. Yes. 
And our brother has the ability, the capacity, the love, the knowledge, the skill, the competence to tap into their genius. So I'm not going to say anything else about the brother. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to ask the drummers and our young African children to escort our brother before us so that we can learn and love along with him our Africanness. Let's hear it. Drummers. resurrection, the rebirth, and the renaissance yes. of the United African Movement. Yes. And it is so good to be here. It's so good to, to have this energy, because, you know, it's, it's lonely being African and conscious out there. Yes, sir. It's real lonely. Yes, sir. And so it's always good for us to get together this way and uh, share this time to let us know that we're all in a struggle. The struggle continues, and it is not over until we win. Yes. And I would really be remiss if, if in being here this way, I did not just stop, just very briefly, and to honor and to respect our sister Clara Jones. Yeah. Because it was really here in the United African Movement that I had a chance to meet and to know sister Clara. And since the last time I've had a chance and the honor to speak here, our sister has joined the ancestors. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I always pay homage and honor to foot soldiers. Because although generals direct us, it's the foot soldiers that win the war. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, Sister Clara loved us very much. And I know that there were things that she told me that made me feel so good when Time was that you wonder what it's all about, and you know, we, we, we all get there. At those moments where we wonder what the struggle's about, is it all worth it? Um, is, it you know, is it all going to turn out? It was Sister Clara that, for some reason or other, always was able to call and to, to reassure us. And I know on a personal level, uh, when she became part of the per aunt, the type of support that she gave us weekly, not just in terms of her spirit, not just in terms of her emotion, but she also put her money where her voice was. Yes. And uh, she gave very generously to us. Mm -hmm. And that I always appreciated and remembered. And so I'd like to just pay homage, and I know we've done libation, but I just want to call upon the spirit of our sister Clara. Because on so many occasions she talked to us about how she wanted things to happen a certain way. And I know that she watches and she guides us and she keeps us strong during these times. So it's to Sister Clara that, I, that, that we offer this evening's presentation because she loved us and our children, we as a people, and she was very proud. 
and just some memories that she shared with us. When once we invoke that her name and we bring her into the room, she's with us. Yes. And so I'm I'm, I'm happy to invite Clara again to be with us this evening. I should. I should. Brothers and sisters, it's a struggle out here, <laughs> but it's a worthy struggle. It's a very worthy struggle. In fact, our our ancestors made Kepra the dumb beetle, the symbol of the process of life, the process of becoming. Our ancestors were geniuses. They, they, they were absolutely brilliant. And every day that I get a chance to study our history and to study our culture, I, I, I get a deeper understanding of what, what our brother, a, uh, Dr. Asa Hilliard, not before, told us and what uh, our other brother, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, told us about what he called African deep thought. African deep thought being that type of thought that, un that unless you're there, you can't think it. And it doesn't take a PhD or an MA or an MS or any other of those alphabet letters we put after our names that gives you that African deep thought. It, it, it's one with nature. If you want to look what the answer is, nature has all the answers right in front of us. And all you got to do is tap into it. And our ancestors knew how to do it. And I think that one of our challenges is that we are not doing it. Uh, we're looking to outside sources and to machines and everything else for answers that nature pre pre provides for us. We go to the doctor and we get all these different prescriptions and all these different medicines and everything else. And all you have to do is just look at that black cat that gets sick and watch what the black cat does when the black get cat gets sick and you'll notice that the cat will rest, it'll drink a lot of water, and it'll drink green things. And it heals itself. Don't get a doctor. In fact, animals get sicker when they go to the veterinarian. They're better off by themselves. Well, when we get sicker, we're better off just healing ourselves. But we have been bitten by a vampire, and once bitten by the vampire, we act like the vampire. And much of what we seek becomes that, that, that which we watch the vampire do. That's true. And, and this is what our society has become. Yeah. And so the United African Movement, headed by our, our brother, Attorney Maddox, uh, probably, I say it all the time, I, I say it privately, I've said it to him personally, he is the only person I would want to follow right in 2000. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because brother has battle scars. Because I see too many people out here talking about the battle that they've been waging, but they don't have battle scars. And, and I want to know what kind of battle you can be in that you don't have scars. You know what I'm saying? And I know that our brother has battle scars and he's shown them. But what's happening is that he has healed himself and, and our support of him also heals him. And so it's important that we understand the real deal and what it is that we have to do for our children and for our people and for the curriculum that we've been working on. And this is a very real curriculum. And if, if I could leave anything with you this evening, if there's any message, as simple as it may be, it would be that there is a curriculum of thinking for African peoples. It's a universal principle governed by the laws of Mahat, here before us to follow. It has nothing to do with going to school. It has nothing to do with passing tests. It has to do with becoming conscious of who you are within the cosmic reality. Mm. And Kepra becomes the symbol of that because Kepra is a dumb beetle who lives from eating cow dung. Mm -hmm. Eating feces of Hekeru, Hathor. Mm -hmm. And think of the symbolism that our ancestors were giving us. A dumb beetle. A beetle that eats feces as probably one of the most important symbols of life. You can see how dynamic they were because they took one of the lowliest, what we might consider them, one of the lowliest creatures and made them a symbol of a process of life. <coughs> the dung beetle will lay its eggs, put them in dung, and the baby beetles will come forward, eating through the dung to light as the mother rolls the dung along the Hapi or the Nile River. That's the process of life. 
not just of the dung beetle, but of the process of life coming into existence, what preserves it and keeps it living, and then what takes it away. Dung. Think of that symbolism as an African people. Haven't we had to eat dung for the past 400 years? And yet that has been our life. There are times coming upon the world now. There's going to be a lot of dung out there. You're right. <laughs> if you can sense it, it's sort of kind of hit the fan already. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's spreading all over oh, now. Yeah. Not just in our community, but in all the communities. Right. Deep. Right. Yeah, because you see, they, you know, you, you, you hear yeah. people say, you know, it's not supposed to happen here. That's what they say. But it is. Right. Right. So if it's happening here, you better watch out. That's right. yeah. And if you want to find out how to deal with all that dung that's being flung in your neighborhood, you're going to have to come to the masters of those who have been able to deflect the dung, and that has been us for the past 400 years. Make that brain, brother. Because there has not been one thing that could happen to a human being that has not happened to us as a human being. And yet, as Maya Angelou says, and still, all that dung. So that our ancestors were teaching us something in, in, in their prophecy by saying that don't curse the wind that sends the dung, bless it. Because for every time you have to deal with it, it perfects your character. So, so don't curse the bad times. Because the bad times actually is what's shaping your character. And that's a very important process because, and I think that this was the secret of our ancestors who were able to deal with those types of situations because clearly I am ashamed to even think about talking about hard times considering what our ancestors were. Every morning that I wake up, I call upon my hero, Harriet Tubman. And I, I ask not that the spirit of Harriet Tubman enter me, but that whatever spirit entered Harriet, let that spirit enter me. And so that when I even think about talking about how rough times are, Harriet comes to me and says, Hush your mouth. <laughs> you have no right to speak. Here I am, 93 years old, up in Auburn, New York, with a collection plate, collecting money for a senior citizen's home that I'm running. The government hasn't paid me for all that I did. Because I'm one of the heroes of the Civil War. That's what Harriet tells me. Right. I'm one of the heroes. Mm -hmm. Because you see, all them other folk could have hid behind their color. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't hide behind my color, so I used to put all sorts of masks and I, I used to go, people didn't even know who I was. That's right. So that when you think in terms of talking about hard times as a people, you just think about all of the dumb that our ancestors have been through mm -hmm. that help us along this struggle, that help us along what we have actually been through as a people. And as I talk to our people, I explain to them that they are the best of the best. And I, and I don't say it in the sense that because of the nature of the complexion of your skin, you are excellent. I say because of the conditions that people have put you through, despite and in spite of being able to still I rise, they have made us superior. We didn't say make us superior. What they did to us, and despite what we've been able to do, made us superior. And the fact that we could be in this room right now and do what we're doing right now is evidence of that miracle that our ancestors gave us. And so in the morning when I wake up, I can understand why the elder sister on the elevator says, bless God for allowing me to wake up. Because today is ours, but tomorrow is promised to nobody. And the fact that we're in this room right now, no matter what our age, no matter how young, no matter how elderly we may be, just the fact that we're here breathing yes. is a gift. Yes. Yes. And so all that dung that's flying around, mm -hmm. all of that is icing on the cake. All right. mm -hmm. Because our first blessing was that we woke up this morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even if you have a bad day, it's a good day, because at least you're alive and you're experiencing. And every day as an African people that we are able to do this, yeah. I tell our children, understand that we are God having a human experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. Don't look for it out there. Don't even look for it in here. Mm -hmm. 
You are God having a human experience. Our creator, he, she, that other thing. Come on, brother, we got to get real. I can't fathom a male God alone. Man, I can't see it. That bothers me. That gives me what's called cognitive dissonance. I know the truth and I can't deal with the fact that I could perceive a God being only a male. I can't see that. It is both male and female, divinely created. And what makes that creator so unique is that it is the only essence that is in fact both male and female that exists. And so what this creator did is that in order to procreate him herself, they divided themselves into male and female of all different concepts. Because that's the parable behind Noah's Ark. Because that is a good book. It's a good book because it's our book. It was just rewritten by the wrong people didn't know what they were talking about. Because you know the Greeks don't have a language. The Rosetta Stone was three different versions of comedic language that the last one was the only one the Greeks could understand, so they took that, and that became classical Greek. They added some things to it. But classical Greek is another form of Egyptian writing that the Greeks took, and now when you decipher the Rosetta Stone, they tell you that the top part is hieroglyphs, the middle part is heretic demotic, and the last part is classical Greek. That linguistically is impossible. Because how can you decipher a language that you don't speak into a language you don't understand? Now somebody should have asked that question. But when you're bit by the vampire, Dracula rules. He don't want to suck your blood in the first place. So he injects the parasite of ignorance into us, so we don't even know who we are. So that book that we call the Bible was a book Rewritten version of the pyramid text, mm -hmm. the coffin text, Absolutely. and the book of the coming forth the day by night, yeah. called by them the book of the dead, yeah. because they found it amongst the dead. Yeah. All right. yeah. They call it the book of the dead because they found it amongst the dead. Right. That's like us going into a hotel, and we call the Gideon Bible the book of the hotel. Because yeah. <laughs> we find it in the hotel. So we're going to call the Gideon Bible the book of the hotel. <laughs> As we go deeper and deeper into our history and our culture, brothers and sisters, there is such a phenomenal power. Yeah. But you see, if someone creates an illusion, mm -hmm. and you embrace that illusion as a reality, mm -hmm. it is a reality. Mm -hmm. It's your reality. Right. 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 It's your reality. Right. It's an illusion, but if you make it real, it's your reality. Right. And this is what we have faced historically throughout our time. So when we talk to our children, we explain to them, we're not talking about just attempting to say you're the best of the best to make you feel good. This is a tribe and, su and succeeded in making us and carving us through Kepra, the best of the best. And I take them through the process. Because you don't really have to tell them, you just take them through the process. What happens? When someone comes into your community, you're out there playing with your friends, or you're going out to get water, or you're chopping wood, or you're, you're having fun as a child does, and someone comes that you don't even know, don't even look, and they never saw no one look like that. They, they come pull you, put you in chains, hurt you, you're a child. Just that alone is the experience that only the best of the best could have survived. Mm. That being, the fear of being yanked from your community where you feel comfortable. And I describe it to the children as your playground. Mm -hmm. Either in your schools or in your home, someone just come and yank you. Yet you're able to survive that. And then they take you and they drag you from one part of your country to another part of your country with chains on, with neck brace on, with all sorts of stuff on. They drag you across them. In order to survive being pulled across like that, only the best of the best could have survived that. Right. 
And then after they get you over to the other side, they, they put you in a dungeon. And they put you up upon each other. You have never lived like this in your life before. And until it's time to ship you, which you don't know, you have to survive that. Only the best of the best could have survived that. They then take you and put you in a hole of a ship, of which you've never seen before, you don't know. You don't know the people who put you there. The people who put you there you never saw before, you don't know them. You ain't seen your parents in a couple of weeks. You haven't seen your auntie, your grandmother. You're scared, you're hurt. And for a number of weeks, they, you're on this boat being treated to some of the most inhumane conditions that a human being could be exposed to. Only the best of the best could have survived that. We're not talking about superiority or inferiority. We're talking about the power of survival. Mm -hmm. The dumb that you gotta eat in order to perfect your character. You become better through this process. Mm -hmm. This is no imagination. This is just talking through this and thinking what people have gone through. And then after they get you here, you know you're gonna try to break. And so they begin to torture you. They begin to beat you. They begin to do things to you that you could never imagine could happen to a human being. Yet, they, yet despite and in spite of that, still you rise. You survive that. Only the best of the best could survive the torture and then you're sold to a plantation to be told to do things you have never heard of before, you have never done before in this sense. And for hundreds of years, generations of you, are passed down with this inhumane treatment, always wondering when it's going to end. I, I often think of the song by R. Kelly, and I often tell people, because I was part of a rites of passage program on Rikers Island, and I remember part of the, the program had a young brother stand up, you know, they had different parts of the program, and one of it was for, the, him, for a song, and he stood up and he sang, I believe I can fly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I respect the brother, but he didn't sound like R. Kelly. Oh. <laughs> but it was in that droning, sad voice that for the first time I heard the words of the song from another perspective. Because as I looked out, as I heard the song, I was looking at a plantation with enslaved people on it. And for the first time, those words of I believe I can fly, when you go home, listen to I believe I can fly again. Think of those words as our ancestors on a plantation singing a song about what would happen if they ever got the wings to be able to fly, what they would do. Well, what they would do is who we are. We are their dreams. We have no right not to fulfill their dreams. So whatever the other dumb they're going to fling to us, we can handle it. Because if they could handle that, we certainly can handle this. Mm. Right. And only the best of the best could have survived that. And then coming up into the 1900s, the civil rights movement, the struggle, the dogs, the fire hoses, that the, wa that the water came out of the water hose so strong that it literally could rip the clothes off your back. Mm. And for those of you who were down there experienced that, you know what I'm saying because you went through it. Only the best of the best could have survived that. And now our children, after having been the ones that our brother Lister Bill Middleton said, you were the first to read, the first to write, humanity sprang from your black sea. Mm -hmm. Now we're being told that we're little. Mm -hmm. We can't pass the test. Mm -hmm. We can't learn. We are genetically inferior to the most inferior genetic people on the planet. In fact, they're so genetically inferior, when we flung our dumb, that was our dumb. <laughs> Yet that dumb is telling us we are dumb. And what's sad is that some of us are believing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Harriet Tubman once said that her proudest moment was that 
she could say that she actually freed thousands of slaves. And she yeah. said her saddest moment was the fact she could have freed thousands yeah. more had they only known they were slaves. Wow. Go out there on Flatbush and Fulton. Yeah. See, one of the things that Attorney Alden Maddox taught me is that being a slave is a mental thing. Yes. I remember one time he was talking to us and he said that there were Africans that were on a plantation and never one day was a slave. They were prisoners. That's right. That's right. They were held in bondage against their will. Yes. Yet there were people walking up and down 125th Street who were slaves mm -hmm. because mentally they had given in to the illusion that became their reality. I spent a number of years in the New York City Board of Education. This November 12th, I just hit year number 27. I'm in my 28th year. And I am the spook who sat by the classroom door. Because I've always seen my job as coming back to our community and reporting to you what I see happen. And what I'm observing now is something that I've said frequently. Uh, it's, it's just reinforced constantly. And that is, is that the Board of Education, or the Department of Education, this education. well, they're not failing. They're succeeding yeah. because their purpose is to yeah. educate yeah. our children. Yeah. They know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And they're very good at it. Yeah. I, I'm presently in a junior high school, and I'm working with 7th and 8th grade students that are they, they're just absolutely brilliant. I mean, when I see them, you know, no matter what they do, although it may not be appropriate, within them I see a nemesis. You know what the pharaohs used to wear? I see them with scepters in their hands. And that's how I talk to them. See all this other stuff, the, the pants falling off, the booty, and the shoes untied, and the hat on sideways, and all this. See, I, I forego all that, and I see royalty. And, and I speak to the royalty. And sometimes I even, when, when I can't get through to the royalty, I start talking to the ancestors. And I open up my conversation with the ancestors by saying, I know you know better. Because the ancestors do know better. Because if I talk to the child, the child don't know better. Because the child knew better, they would do better. It's the ancestor deep within them that I'm trying to pull out from the recesses of their memories, from what is called in India, came from Africa, the Akashic field. I'm from the waters of Nun, as our ancestors would call it. I'm trying to pull that ancestor up to take control over this young person because I know you know better. And when you talk to children like that, they sometimes stop and they say, yeah, I know better. And then I started having a dialogue with the ancestor because I know the ancestor know better. And this is what we have to start to do with our young people. Brothers and sisters, our young people, they're absolutely brilliant. Today and yesterday, our children were tortured in the fifth grade. They took what is called the language arts test. Next week, the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade is going to be tortured. Because they're going to sit for 90 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour and they are being told that the very culmination of all the things that they know in reading is going to determine what type of intelligent child you are. When that does not in any way, shape, or form measure a human being's intelligence. There are two ways you pass a standardized test, and I teach children this. When you know the right answer, and when you know all the wrong answers. But you don't have to know the wrong, right answer to pass that test. And our children are being faced every day by this. They are the best of the best. They have the ability to do whatever it is that we need them to do. But we have to have the courage to tell them the truth. I, I, I'd like to say this. I, I, because we, we're really at the point where we can't really spare our words anymore. I honestly respect every religion that exists, but it's hurting us. It's hurting us because the interpretation that we have taken 
of these religions comes from someone else's perception right. of God. Yeah. They are involved in an angry and jealous God mm -hmm. that grew up in an ice age. Mm -hmm. We come from a creator force mm -hmm. where the medium temperature was 80 degrees in the ship. We come from a creative force that all around us, when the mango was ready, the creator just let it fall in our hands. Mm -hmm. The bananas and the apples. Mm -hmm. We grew up with a psychological perception that we didn't have to hoard things because there were hundreds of them on the tree and none was going to go wrong. And if somebody came by that was hungry, take what you want. And because you knew you were going to come upon another tree down the road, right. you didn't take a hundred off this tree because you knew you were going to get another right. five Absolutely. down the road. Right. So selfishness and, and envy and jealousy never came upon you because you understood that reciprocity was in existence. So therefore, the creator of the original world was a loving, sharing, positive experience. Right. People coming out of the Ice Age knew not this creator. Right. They came from an environment that said, if your best friend or even your wife is chasing that pig, mm -hmm. don't kill the pig, just wait till they eat the pig and then eat them. Yeah. <laughs> but then you eat the pig and them too. <laughs> Fatten it up. And then eat your best friend. You don't believe me here? Read, read a book called Man Eater. Still doing it. Still doing it. For a cook a woman the other day. Now you've been in This is right in front of us, brothers and sisters, and yet we still cling to the belief systems of a people who built the belief systems, enslaved us, and manifest destiny said their God told them they had a right to do this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And can I just drop the other shoe? When we're talking about modern day Islam, mm -hmm. I want to remind you that before you start taking sides, I'd like to remind you that the people that we today call Palestinians mm -hmm. were yesterday's Philistines. And it was the Philistines that destroyed the African Canaanites and said that God told them. They could do that. So before we take sides with anybody, Keep in mind that Judaism is based in Atonism mm -hmm. of ancient Egypt. Right on. Christianity is based on Amonism of ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Islam is a combination of the two mm -hmm. that the Moors of Africa brought to its highest point. Mm -hmm. right Read Dr. Ben's work. Right, right. Just understand that Africa is the mother of the world's major religions. Right. Right. And when the warlike mentality was, was thrust on us by these Europeans, what they did, they didn't understand the one concept of spirituality. So what they had to do was they had to take that one thought, that universe, that one word, and chop it up. So some of them took part of it, and their interpretation became what we today call Judaism. Another took another part and took it and made it Christianity. And some of them said, we don't want either, so we're going to blend them both. And now they say that they call it Islam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have nothing against any faith system. You have a right to believe. Right on, but all I say is, if you're going to preach it, reach it. That is. But don't preach one thing and then practice another. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't you tell me that your God gives you right to destroy people. Right. Or that you have a right to put women on the unequal terms. Mm -hmm. Because if you understood God, you'd understand that God is also a woman. Right. So when you enslave your woman, you're enslaving the other half of God. Right. Don't tell me that about your religions. And you see, brothers and sisters, a lot, a lot of folk get very tight with me when we start talking about it. But that's okay. Can't have it through. Because the one thing I appreciate about Malcolm X is that Malcolm never taught us or told us what we wanted to hear, he told us what we had to hear. And he took that chance because he understood that the price of freedom was death. 
And the day you will find your liberation is the day that you lose your fear of death. Now, I'm a human being. You have a right to, to have fear. That, that's a human emotion. You have a right to have fear. But you do not have any right not to have courage. Because courage is what negates fear. And then pretty soon you start acting courageously. And we have to get out into our community and start talking to our people in ways that they can understand. I respect your faith system. But just understand that underneath what you're looking at is an African philosophy. You know, it was Bukma, Haitian revolutionary yeah. from Jamaica. Yeah. Troublemaker, they said. Yeah, yeah. Freedom fighter to me. Yeah. Troublemaker to them. Yeah. But that's the way it is. See, because Khalid Muhammad, he was the most loving man I ever knew. I love Khalid. Yeah. I often say that white folk need to hear what an angry black man sounds like. Yeah. But you've been hearing that other stuff too long. You need to hear what a real man that's angry at you sound like. Right. He was a good doctor. <laughs> See, because I won't go to a good doctor. I won't go to a doctor that's going to say, you know something, you sick. <laughs> you are sick. <laughs> and I have a remedy for your sickness. Yeah, right. I don't want to go to the doctor that say, don't worry about it. That cancer going to go away. Mm. It's going to be all right. Don't worry about it. Two months later, you're dead. Yeah. I want to go to the doctor that say, no, man, you sick. And I got the remedy for it. Khalid was their doctor, but they didn't like the prescription of their doctor because they wanted to believe that everything was all right when nothing was right. And now they're living the repercussions of this. Because what's happening over there in Iraq, another black man, by the way, read African presses early Asia. You see it. Mesopotamia, Elam, Susa, media, all that was black land until those Ice Age people came. Yeah. See, you see, they get upset with Dr. Jeffries when he starts talking about Ice Age people. Because all of a sudden, they start getting ancient memories of where they came from. <laughs> I don't want to be reminded of that stuff either. It's cold. When summertime comes, don't tell me about the winter. I want to know about the summertime. Brothers and sisters, we have to get to the point in our lives where we understand. There, 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 there is a point now that we're just going to take a break. Uh, we're going to come back and I'm going to now flip the script and I'm going to talk to you about what our ancestors developed in terms of the cosmic reality. And in the 60s when we talked about black is beautiful, it wasn't just to make us feel good because they had told us for so long that it was bad, that actually black is beautiful because everything comes out of the black. Even starlight is nothing but coagulated blackness. Just like carbon creates a crystallized diamond, cosmic blackness creates the stars. They call them nano diamonds. With that, our sister Geneva Bites. Hold that. I'll be right back. Having, uh, having spoken about what we spoke about, uh, that, that what we spoke about earlier, when we think about basic things that 2008, here in what we call the United States of America. <laughs> and, you know, under, just understanding what we've experienced, what we're dealing with, what we should be able to understand, and, and where we should go from here. But particularly, if I can uh, just look to our children and understand our children, and some of the things that our children should really understand. One of the things as an African people, as our research has gone forward, and there's no way that I personally could claim, um, I first ex extend, you know, much of, much of who I am and what I am, my parents, of course, but I would be just remiss if I did not call upon the spirit and the guidance that uh, Professor John Henry Clark gave me throughout my life. Yeah. And I think that that probably, along with wonderful family and all those other pieces, outside of that, I think that one of my greatest fortunes was to have an, 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 an elder brother, such as Professor Clark, take interest in a young brother. 
I've told the story many times before, but for those who may never have heard the story before, I just share it. And those that have heard it before, we, we can all just work together on this. But, you, you know, John Henry Clark is my intellectual father. And I would also be equally remiss if I didn't call upon my intellectual mother, Dr. Sharshi Charlotte McIntyre. Yeah. That, is a, that is a scholar that we many times do not call upon. And for those of us who have ever been in her presence understand her power oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and her down-to-earthness yes. and her ability to bring warring factions together. <laughs> and I, I've seen her do it. People who for all intentions and purposes may not get along, but she had the ability and the power and the maternal wisdom and the paternal power to bring these forces together. So Shashi McIntyre, I, I frequently call upon because of her, her dignity, her grace, her intelligence, and all that she did. But when I was in the seventh grade, 12 and a half young years old, we, I grew up in the Amsterdam houses down by Lincoln Center. And like in all of our communities, we have conscious, what we call them, old heads. When I might have been 9 and 10 years old, they were like 15, 16, 17. Serious brothers and sisters that took culture seriously, came from a long line of people, project bound, but clearly beyond the process. And they used to get a group of us together that they felt were conscious, or at least on the road. And prior to becoming a born-again African, my name was Booker T. Coleman. And they said, Booker T., wow, what a name. And I remember that, uh, and I'm junior. My father's from Alabama, Tuskegee, Alabama, and went to Tuskegee. And, and my, my grandmother, his mother, and Booker T. Washington were friends. And it was through that friendship my father was named after him. And so then I inherited the name. That's why when I corrected my name, because I didn't change my name, I corrected it. When I corrected my name in 2002, my father had already transcended maybe 10 years. He had joined the ancestors. And I had to go into deep reflection with him to talk to him and to explain to him why I had to correct my name. And basically, when I come before our community such as this, and I speak to you of the parasite, I speak to you of the, of the vampire. It is very difficult for me to speak to you of the vampire and then tell you that my name is a vampire's last name. And I got to a certain point as I got older that I had what's called cognitive dissonance. I, I had a problem with that, so I had to correct my name, and I had to go into what I would consider spiritual reflections with my father to explain to him why Booker T had to become Kaaba Hiawatha Kamene. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is I did it legally, and it's funny that they took my name for free, and they made me pay $290 to get it back. <laughs> but I will do anything to shed the vampire's name. So when I was Booker T. Coleman Jr., seventh grade, they brought me up to a place in Harlem. I don't know where it was. And I remember they sat us down in the room, and there was a man talking to us, to, to the group. They, they, you know, there were elders, and there were young, and there was a, all of us there. And I remember at the end, they brought the young people up to be introduced to this speaker. And when they got to me, they said, this is Booker T. Coleman. And I remember, I'm speaking, of course, of Professor John Henry Clark. And they, and they said, this is Booker T. Coleman, and he, and he looked at me, and I can honestly tell you that I have to look up to him. You know, sure. physically speaking, he was a giant, mm -hmm. but he was short of stature. Mm -hmm. But when I met him, I was shorter than him. Mm -hmm. And I had to look up to him. So I can honestly tell you, when I met him, I looked up to him. And he said, wow, Booker T, you're going to become a great teacher one day. And this is when I was 12 and a half years old. And he gave me my first homework assignment. A homework assignment that I give each and every one of my children and everyone else that I ever come in contact with. Because whatever it was that I felt was important comes to you the first time. And this is what Professor Clark said. He said, I want you to go home 
And I want you to look in the mirror. And I want you to tell that person you're looking at, I love you. And mean it. Because if you can't do that, there's nothing I can do for you. And I've often thought about that as, as us as a people. Searching for our ancestry and looking at ourselves and coming in contact with children that say when they get money, they want to fix their nose. Their nose is too big. And I say, can you breathe through your nose? They say, yeah. I say, well, it must be just the right size. I mean, if you want to tell me you can't breathe through it, then I think we're going to fix it. But if you can breathe through it, then you're all right. And when I hear them call each other crispy and darky, I often tell them, well, you know something? Well, you better thank them crispy people because if it weren't for them crispy people, you wouldn't be here. Because it was the dark of the berry that was the sweet of the juice that was able to absorb the sunlight that created human life on the planet in the first place. Mm -hmm. right. So you better go and get the thickest lip, widest nose, darkest complexion, kinkiest, nappiest hair person and tell them, thank you for letting me be here. Because we don't see this, we don't understand this. So melanin is something that our people should understand. You have to understand it from every perspective that you possibly can. When our ancestors wrote on the temple doors, know thyself, they were talking about knowing melanin. Mm -hmm. That's, right. That's what they were talking about. Melanin comes down to earth in terms of a characteristic, an element, an atom that we call carbon. The blackness of the carbon atom. But in reality, that same carbon atom that crystallizes itself on the planet also exists in the cosmos. The cosmos, the universe, is black. Everything that you see in the cosmos comes out of the black. So in many ways, many of the secrets, if we want to call them that, because they're not secrets, and this is the wonderful thing about the legacy, you see? When we talk about the so-called mystery system of ancient Kemet or Egypt, we're really talking about a time when our ancestors had to code their words because infiltrators or hybrids, the ones who crossed over, were coming in and usurping the lands of Kemet. So they coded their words. They created codes. But if you go inside of Africa, into Ethiopia, where only us survive, only us exist, it's not secret. It's open to those who are willing and ready to accept the knowledge. The teacher appears when the student is ready. That, is, that has always been our legacy. We only coded it when outside people, who when we looked at them and saw how they conducted themselves, we knew that they would take advantage of the secrets of the universe, and that is exactly what they've done. One of the greatest things about our brother, Malcolm X, there were many great things about him, but I think one of the things that made him so great, they call it alchemy. They make movies like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. Our children get all wrapped up in it, but they don't know that they're talking about our legacy of bringing the manipulations of elements and atoms and earth and sky and water and all the things that exist, manipulate them and create other things in the combinations of these things. There's something called the periodic table of elements, of which we all sweat when it's time to learn in chemistry class. But if I could teach that periodic table of elements, I wouldn't teach it as a table, I would teach it as an experience. And that's why sometimes we don't understand it because we don't understand it within the context of how we should learn it. For instance, again, going back to what Dr. Yibo teaches us, there is only one entity that exists in the universe. There is only universe, one word, universe. And when Africans learn the universe, they learn the other cosmic realities of that one word, and then they replicated that universe and began to teach people of this universe in situations that today we call universe cities. Mm -hmm.
universities. Mm -hmm. And this one word is called hydrogen. That's right. And everything that comes out is only multiplications and additions of that one word, that one nun, hydrogen. The sun's job all day long is to take and to fuse four hydrogen atoms. That's all the sun does, all day, all night. When they fuse four hydrogen atoms, they create one helium atom, which is number two on the periodic table, and a bit of what's called light and heat energy that comes down to Earth through Shu, Tefnut, Nut and Ge, mm. and creates organic life. Hydrogen, nitrogen, this is John G. Jackson teaching us this in the introduction to African civilizations. Chapter one, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen are three atoms that you can only put no more than four of them together. You put two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, you have H2O, you have water. You put two parts hydrogen, two parts oxygen together, you have hydrogen peroxide. With the introduction of this fourth element, or carbon, you have carbon. Carbon is cosmic glue that keeps all this stuff together. Carbon is the only atom that can bind with itself and create all of the millions upon billions of molecules that make up our cosmic reality. That same glue, on a cosmic level, is what created African folk on the earthly level. To study biology and not study melanin is equivalent to studying auto mechanics and not being taught what gasoline does for a car. <laughs> You don't even know how the car run. You know what it's made of, but you don't know what makes it function. If they taught our children, no matter what cultural background they were from, about melanin, they would have to teach them another principle of life of which they're not willing to do. And that would be white supremacy is an illusion. In fact, Remember we talked about the four hydrogen atoms, mm -hmm. creating one helium atom, mm -hmm. creating light heat and heat energy? There's something else that this fusion creates, and it's called a free radical. A free radical is a dangerous thing, because it's nature out of control. If that free radical is something wrong with what something good, because bringing those heat, hydrogen atoms together Creating light and energy was a good thing, but there's a little piece of a bad thing. If that is true in the sun, then let me make another analogy on the earth. When we were fused to create organic life that became humanity is a good thing. The free radical is the European. <laughs> That's the bad thing. Yeah. The European is what happens to a good thing going bad. It is equivalent in your body to what makes cancer. Let me break it down to you. The European is the cancer of the human family. Make that right. Don't believe me. And I say, don't believe me. Just watch how he acts. Because the idea is, is that if you tell something to somebody and they believe it, they haven't taken time to think for it themselves. Just observe the way in which they conduct themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying this in the sense that we all do the very best. There's good and bad in all things. Mm -hmm. But something happens to you when you're in the ice. <laughs> and as I quoted our brother Dr. Jeffries, I do have to pay homage to my brother who's sitting in the back. Give our brother Dr. Leonard Jeffries. He taught me that. And so we have to understand this, brothers and sisters, 
Melanin is a, is a serious component to the biology that we have to learn. It is a serious component to the astronomy that we have to learn. We have to study melanin. We have to understand its purpose, its reason, its function, what it does for us. We have to understand the difference between skin melanin and neuromelanin, which is melanin in the brain, and, and what it does. See, because as an African people, I tell folk, you know, don't get into a mixed room and stop asking people, did you hear? Because those little hairs in your inner ear that's seated in melanin, well, to put it like this, it's like when, it's the difference between an AM radio and a satellite radio. Mm -hmm. oh. Black folk pick up more stations. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And so, when you're in a mixed room, don't talk about, did you hear that? Did you see that? Did you smell that? Because the melanin within you allows your sens sensual perceptions at, to, to activate at a higher rate. Right. Magnify and, and, and when it doesn't do that, it's because you've allowed an outside force to convince you that you're crazy when you open yourself up to the ancestral line. Every human being born is born with every possible thing they will ever need in their life to know. Again, going back to the idea of what is called the Akashic Chronicle. They, that comes out of India. But India got that from Africa. Mm -hmm. The Africans called it the Nun. This is, this is written. I, I've been getting interested in a lot of the writings that is out on, on astrophysics and a lot of different things since I've been introduced to the Shabaka Stone. It became very interesting. And I, and I, and I started reading works, some of the authors of people like Urban Laszlo and Stephen Hawkins and Ryan Green and I mean, I can go through the line of these uh, so-called scholars that are said to know. And you know, the sad thing is they miss so many important points. Because all you got to do is go into the index, go into the end of the book, go into the index, and look up Africa. Look up Egypt. And if they don't reference that, they're not talking about too much. And you don't, you don't have to prove it to them. All you gotta do is understand it for yourself because we spend too much time trying to validate what we know to be true with right. them. Yeah, right. and, and quite frankly, if you try to validate something with someone who has invalidated you, you're wasting your time because had they any interest in you, they wouldn't have invalidated you in the first place. So the time you spend trying to validate yourself with the people who are invalid themselves. Because you know, when you go to California, you ask the indigenous people who the illegal alien is, you're going to get a different answer than when you turn your TV on and try to figure out who the illegal alien is. There is only one illegal alien in America. And, and, and yet, we'll watch a situation and we literally will believe, oh yeah, they're illegal aliens. They're, they're taking jobs from us. Ain't no job for you or them. <laughs> Once we understand this, the reason why I'm saying this is because these are things that I think as a people we have to ingrain within ourselves. And we have to start from that perspective on. We have to understand that our ancestors have left enough. And all that's been destroyed has been quite a bit destroyed, no doubt. But with what remains is so powerful, we can begin to do again what our ancestors did. Mm -hmm. This is another concern because sometimes we spend so much of our time trying to go back and bring that forward, not bad, but don't get caught up thinking that if you can't get it, that you can't do it again. Because the same brilliance that was in them is in us. Mm -hmm. We can do it again. Mm -hmm. We can look at the Shabaka stone. And we can decipher exactly how the ancient world said the world came into being. We can take the principles of biology and chemistry and we can see that within the pyramid text. We can look at the coffin text and we can decipher clearly where our ancestors were coming from. And despite and in spite of all of those interesting, difficult for them but not for us, perceptions of their world, we can understand what they were talking about. 
when they talked about the waters of Nun. The waters of Nun that they, that, that they use a pictograph as two waves of water. Okay? That embodies, in today's science, what they call the singularity, which is the Atum, and the string theory, of which they're so proud of. Saying that they invented something. They didn't invent anything new. That existed in ancient Kemet, and they documented it. We have a primary source. I have the Shabaka stone. I made copies of the Shabaka stone. It was stolen from Africa and brought to the British Museum. All right. All right. I went to the British Museum. I made photograph. I got copies. They said to me, you don't have a right to make photographs like that. I said, well, you don't have a right to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> so you do steal hot property. I come in your house, take a picture of it, and you tell me I'm illegal. Well, you should be arrested for stealing it in the first place. It's on the real side. The Aten text. A text found on, on the western wall of a, of a vizier coming out of the 18th dynasty known as I. Right. A-Y. <laughs> Now, that was a, a recopied version of other documents that paid homage and tribute not to the sun, not to Ra, not to Amun, but to the light and heat energy that came from Ra. <laughs> With the mythology or the analogy that that sun is like an eye that looks at its children and creates life. What an analogy our ancestors gave us. What a story they gave us to understand on another level. But it's like when we say that our children have problems learning, that they have dyslexia. Dyslexia is not a problem. It's just another way of knowing something. Mm -hmm. This society says if you can't read, you see you make money with, with reading because you sell books. Mm -hmm. But if you're, a visual, if you're a visionary person, if you get information through visuals, you can't sell that. You also differentiate learning, which stops people from making money. If you stop them from making money, then all of a sudden dyslexia is no longer a curse, but it is a blessing. We really should be developing ways in which to teach our children who we say have dyslexia. We need to find where their genius really is. Because you're going to find that it might be in music. I asked a musician, brilliant brother named Onaje, Alan Gomes. I asked my brother Onaje, you know, I, I asked him, you know, when you dream, do you dream music? Because musicians dream music. Artists dream in pictures. We're so caught up in script, nothing wrong with script. We should learn how to read. But it is not the only way in which we show how literate we are. Because literacy is not writing and reading. Literacy is the ability for you to show other people what you know. You can draw a picture, and that's literacy. You can compose a music, and that's literacy. You can do a dance, that's literacy. Our system holds our children into a way of learning that says, this is what a genius is. Because this is the only way my shallow mind can perceive how great you are. Because anything past my shallow mentality, I can't follow. It's like when I was doing my master's degree, I wanted to do my master's degree with a man by the name of Robert July from Hunter College. And when I went to him, I told him that I, you know, he was the one that did African history. And I told him I wanted, he was going to be my supervisor because they wouldn't let Professor Clark be my supervisor. Because they said he was in the Black Studies Department and I was getting my master's in history. So it had to be someone from history. So Robert July, a man of European descent, had to become my supervisor for my master's thesis. So when I went to visit him, he told me, well, what do you want to do it on? I said, I'd like to do something on the decipherment of the Shabaka stone in Medunete. He said, well, how can you do that when you don't read Medunete? I said, I do read Medunete. He said, well, I don't, so you can't do it. <laughs> okay, well that's your choice coming. You're supposed to be the expert, you can't even. Well that's the position that William Leo Hansberry was in when back in the day when he was attempting to get a PhD in African history. Yeah. Ernest Hooten of the Peabody Museum, who worked with 
William Leo Hansberry said that William Leo Hansberry couldn't get a PhD in African history because there was no one that had more knowledge than him. So no one could supervise him because even PhDs didn't have the knowledge that William Leo Hansberry had of it. And again, this is sometimes the problem that we find ourselves in, and I think that our children find themselves in the classroom because a lot of times our children are more intelligent than the teacher in front of the classroom. And so it becomes a problem when the student is smarter than the teacher because then you make the teacher feel a little insecure. And so all of a sudden, I think we need to call someone in to evaluate that child. Yeah, right. And then we're going to put them in what they call special ed. We have to understand who it is we are as a people. And we have to understand the primary source of what has been laid down to us by our people that we can pick up and begin to look at. And we have to start to, uh, to begin our own educational institutions and the ones that exist we have to begin to support. And in saying this, I would be remiss if I did not bring attention to our system clean. No. <laughs> for students who walk me up. Because it would be remiss not to do that because I don't want to talk about a school that's run by an African-centered mindset and not at least identify that you can sometime either this evening or some other time visit the school, talk to the sister, how can I support you? In what way can I do this? We, this is what we have to start to do. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but if a sister has something, let's start to think of having our children go there. Let's start thinking about any way, whether it be, because you see, I'm going to tell you something. Our institutions need money. You know, I know people say that's the root of all evil. And, you know, the idea of, of wages of sin. But, but like the brothers say, wages pay the rent. Yeah. <laughs> and too many times, great ideas go under because we do not financially support them. Yet our churches get 10% of what you make. And sometimes more. Are you happy? Nothing wrong with that. There we go. Walk away. Watch that. Nothing wrong with that. That's your business. I, look, I don't have nothing to say. I know in the back of my mind what I'm saying, but I respect all people's right to do what they like to do. But I find it interesting that we can open up a church and a liquor store on almost every block. And both institutions deal with spirits. <laughs> Yet when it comes time to develop a school, then all of a sudden, we have a problem with the money. So I encourage you to reach out to these types of institutions and the institutions that you know and just ask. I ask also that you put aside parts of your money for the vendors that are in the street. <coughs> Those that, have, uh, that are in the block, whatever it is that they're selling, if we just put a little bit of something aside, throw it to them, give it to them, get their wares all along Flatbush, all along Fulton, all along 125th Street, in Queens, wherever our vendors are, support them. Maybe you don't have enough right away to do something, but put a little bit aside and say, well, this is for that brother, that's for that book, or the DVD or whatever it is. Support them. These are the little things that we can start to do that's real for our community. Because all this theory has its place, but unless we start practicing, really start practicing, freedom retreat. Mm. Wow, what an idea. What an idea. And as I look around, I see the brothers that give up their time, the sisters that give up their time to spend with the children, and the children that go to the freedom retreat. You know, the times that I've gone up there, you know, it's there for us. Yeah. What are we going to do about that? Are we just going to let it go by, by the wayside, and then when it goes to the wayside, we say, well, you know, we need, well, we got it. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been doing it for a number of years. And the way I know how old it is, is because it was born the year that my son was born, and my son Haru is turning 14 tomorrow. So that's how long I know it's been. Brothers and sisters, these are real things that we can start to do for our community. This is really a curriculum. A curriculum is far more than just sitting down in a room and learning something. 
It's, it's, it's about putting in motion a dynamic action that makes things happen. There's a word in ancient Kemet, Heka, which is defined by them as being magic, but to African people is defined as will. To will something. Our ancestors on the plantation willed their freedom, and they got it. Attorney Alton Maddox willed a camp, a retreat for our children, and he got it. Marcus Mosiah Garvey taught us, rise up, you mighty race, you will accomplish what you will. We have examples of this throughout us. And the more I study our history, the more I fall in love with us. Because we're such a wonderful, powerful people. And we really are. When I think of all the things that we may have been exposed to, and despite, in spite of that, still we rise. I remember Dr. Richard King was talking about the ideas of all the different human beings that would rise. Dr. Diop, in his book, Civilizational Barbarism, talks about the beginnings of humanity in Africa. And he called it Australopithecus robustus. And then Australopithecus robustus created itself, brought itself to a higher level, and then came Australopithecus gracile. And then what the human family did was so powerful and so real in the development of tools, Australopithecus gracile rose up and became homo habilis, human of ability, the tool maker. The human that looked and ate a watermelon. Yeah, I like watermelon. Oh, yeah. I'm not ashamed of watermelon. Oh, this is the most perfect yeah. food you can eat. Yes, sir. I don't care. I, I eat watermelon and spit the seeds out. Oh, because I follow my ancestors. Because they spit the seed out, and all of a sudden, oh, they saw another one grow. That's right. And then homo habilis began to think and say, you know something? If I were to put my finger in the ground and then purposely put the seed in the hole, I would cut down the amount of time it took for the earth to engulf the seed. <laughs> Get watermelon quicker. <laughs> and then Homo Billis said this. He said, well, wait a minute. My finger get tired after a while. So if I took a stick and dug a hole, then I could put a hole, and I, I could put more because after a while my finger hurt. But if I use the big stick, I could do a whole lot of holes. Plant more seeds. Get more watermelon quicker. Feed a lot of other people. Homo habilis then said, but you know, if I took three sticks, put them side by side, stuck them in the ground, I could do it three at a time. Then he said, if I took three and then I dragged it along the ground, I could put seeds all along there. You see what Homo habilis is doing? The human of ability. The better you eat, the better you think. The better you think, the better you eat. And what began to happen was a relationship between as above, so below. You began to study the heavens. You began to learn the secrets of the earth. And then what happened was miraculous. Homo habilis who walked a little hunch, began to slowly erect. So that now, instead of always looking this way, they began to look that way, and then they perceived what the future held. So Homo habilis began to become Homo erectus. When Homo erectus stood up straight, there's a, there was a direct line of the cerebral spinal fluid from head top to shoe stop. That began a more perfect movement of the cerebral spinal fluid that allowed this human to think better, to be able to formulate better. And what began to happen was that the relationship of the light and heat energy began to go into the pineal gland of this human and sent the electricity through the body that began to create a relationship that the head and the thinking process began to change. And it changed to the point where Homo erectus began to travel around the world. The evidence of African life starting in Africa is the fact that the first three forms of humanity can only be found in Africa. 
Australopithecus robustus, Australopithecus gracile, and Homo habilis can only be found in Africa. And, can, and there's such a gap between a habilis and erectus, it didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. This erectus began to travel, the first human to travel. This, as they traveled, they came in contact with things that took Homo erectus and morphed them into a thinking human, which Dr. Dia calls Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. Homo sapiens began to think on levels that rose up to higher levels, and then Homo sapien got so deep with his thought, Homo sapien became who we call Homo sapien sapien, creative thinking man, or human. And don't let them tell you that, yeah, life started in Africa, but it perfected itself in Europe. <laughs> because there's evidence of every wave of Africans going into Europe, because whoever brought the Ordinacean tool making was the one that brought civilization into Europe and that can be traced to Africans. In fact, the only real remnant of Europeans is the fact that we do believe that some Homo sapiens and Homo, some Homo sapiens sapiens live side by side. Yes. Homo sapiens are Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. And why they, the reason why they act the way they act is they still got a little bit of that caveman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Dr. Richard King tells us that in Africa, in many parts of Africa, as they related to nature, there were some Africans that raised themselves to such a level of thinking that Homo sapien sapien became Homo perfectus, which is a seventh form of humanity that took thinking to a whole nother level, that was able to come one a unicity with their God. Mm -hmm. Which was why the Creator created us in the first place, because all your holy books will tell you that God knew not Himself, so He created creations in order to know who God was. Mm -hmm. If that be true and Africans reflected on themselves, then they would be who I told you before, who you are, who we are, because we are God having a human experience. Mm -hmm. We are the God for us. And how you honor your God is how you honor each other. Mm -hmm. That's true. Absolutely. So on one level, you're talking about how you love God, and then on the other level, you're blowing up your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Or you're saying that God told you to blow up. God don't tell you to blow up people. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a time when Malcolm must come up out of you. And that you speak in the language that you've spoken to. Mm -hmm. But even that, in ancient Kemet was known as Heru Kuti. Heru Kuti is a righteous warrior. Heru is the inheritor of the earth. Heru Kuti is a righteous warrior who does battle with evil. And so, we wrap all this up by saying that we are the best of the best. We are homo perfectus. We are that essence that can learn from all the other things that, because I always believe that Europeans do have a, a purpose on this planet. Oh, yeah. They do. Their purpose is to teach us that the highest of the high can fall by the lowest of the low when we forget who we are. Yeah. We must stop fighting amongst ourselves. Oh, yeah. Dr. Clark taught us the only difference between a Puerto Rican, a Dominican, a Jamaican, a Haitian, a North Carolinian, a Bostonian, Chicagoan, is a both side. Right on. Right. Soon, we're one people. Different languages, but we're one people. Whether we embrace it or not, whether we accept it or not, you are what you are. You can run, but you can't hide. It is what it is. Brothers and sisters, we shall overcome by any means necessary. We are a mighty people who will rise by the will of our wills because Bob Marley has taught us that no one can curse who job is blessed. We are blessed. Okay.
wonderful presentation, and uh, we hope we can have him again. Um, uh, Brother Jeffries, would you like to say a few words to us?
Sister McLean is doing a great job, but she doesn't have the support to manifest the greatness that she's doing in touching our children's heart and soul. We have to figure out a way of raising money so that it relieves her of worrying every day. Do you know what it is when you have to worry every day whether your door is going to stay open, whether you can maintain the teacher, whether you can get the books, etc. We have to find a way of creating wealth so that we can support the institution. I, every day I go through hell and heaven dealing with these women in New Jersey who have that complex of schools and institutions, of women in support of the Million Man March. Because they have been so successful that white folks intend to snatch what they have done. You can't have this type of success. Where did you get this vision? Where did you get this ability to sustain yourself and carry on like this? And so they're working night and day to snatch those institutions that they put together. But I'm on the board. So even if I have to sacrifice everything I got to keep them afloat, they're going to stay afloat. And the institutions that they do, the biggest institution is a block off of Central Avenue in Newark, New Jersey. I was born on Central Avenue. You know, my grandfather's house that I own is a block off of Central Avenue. And so for these women to have created an institution of, of African learning, uh, I have to support them. But we've got to find the magic of raising money to support each other. Clark House. It's a shame to have an institution like that, where it's a base, named for Dr. John Henry Clark, housing the Board of Education of people, Board for the Education of People of African Ancestry, having the vision of Region Adelaide Sanford to create it, having the support of, of important people like Una Mozek, who we've forgotten, uh, even Reverend Butts and his good mind of support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, Gil Noble. And, and, Marcus Garvey, uh, uh, his brother, uh, Julius Garvey, and uh, uh, Joseph Fleming, my great attorney, all of us are together, Betty Dobson, of course, and her family. But we're still scrounging for money to pay the telephone bill, to repair the roof, uh, to keep that open. And we should not be in that situation except as Booker, as Kappa was trying to say, we don't save. We don't know what saving is. When, when money comes into our hands, we have, we've already spent it triple time. We, we, are, we are the most consummate consumers of garbage in the world. The trillion dollar black men and black women of America, if they became an African, using that wealth to create, could transform their, their whole global family. So we have to have a mission in terms of how do you use wealth. And then also, how do you control and manage it? And then also, how do you keep the predators away from it? Africa is such a beautiful place and such a rich place that predators are thinking about how do we get it, keep it from Africans. You're not going to get a richer place in the world than the Congo. But it's an utter and complete chaos because the African mind of the Congo which was one of the first scientific minds noted by science, the Ashango bone. Going back 10,000 years or so, Africans using mathematical formulations, etc., and they found it on, on a bone carved out. And so it, we have the ability, but if you've been programmed against yourself, no matter how much ability you have, no matter how much potential you have, you can't make it operate for you. And they program us through the educational process, through the cultural process, that has us worshiping white folks yeah. instead of understanding appreciation and worshiping ourselves as we should. So UAM is about all of that. I'm trying to be about all of that. Brother Kava and his family about certainly uh, my partner, uh, Queen Mother, uh, Don Abibio, also called Dr. Ralph and Jeffries, is about all of that. In fact, but we've got to hook it up. We gotta keep it in a, as a family field. We gotta help it build institutions, et cetera. So those of you who wanna keep honoring me and the work that I'm doing, which is the work of Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben and all those who went before us, uh, we will be gathering at Clark House next Saturday. Uh, we'll be there between four and uh, eight. That's before we leave to go to Alton at the Cotton Club to be with the family uh, and to uh, support what our brother's doing. 
And uh, those of you who wish to be a part of the seminars on economic development and systems analysis, uh, call me at the college, leave your name and number, and we'll get back to you, 212-650-8651. 212-650-8651. If you lose it, just call the college and ask for Dr. Jeffries, and they'll give you my number. And uh, a brother just called me, and his name is Kevin Jones or something like that. And he says, Dr. Jeffries, I want to be a part of your seminars on critical thinking and systems analysis, and me and my daughter. So what Alton got started with those seminars and those workshops uh, is it, spreading around. And so uh, we need to continue it. So, brother, I just came up, busted my back. Would have been here earlier, but I made the mistake of calling uh, Los Angeles and speaking to uh, Queen of Zinger, she's the president of ASCAP, and we hadn't talked in a month. And so I tried to, I wanted to tell her, I'm trying to get to UAF, and she had more to say. I'm trying to get to UAF, she had more, more to say. And uh, uh, so I just couldn't put the phone down and run here. But as soon as I got in my, my car, I looked over here uh, just, to, just to stand with you. Uh, but I need to, need to sit at your feet. Because see, these youngsters under us have taken this knowledge. <clears throat> and his brilliance is that he can relate to PhDs and great scientists, but he has the genius of relating to our young people. And that takes a special understanding to translate and excite young people into moving with this knowledge. And in the Bronx, he was a master teacher in getting the knowledge out to our people. So I'm glad to see his growth and feel it and to be a part of it. I just want to thank all of you. Uh, I want to thank my sister for stepping in. And But don't be stepping down here. Then these people don't have no insurance to cover Africa, to cover Africa. So when you fall, fall with the white folks where you can get a million dollars or two. No? <laughs> thank you all for coming out and being a support of your family. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey. Okay, um, just... Um, Minister Brown is going to close us out, but I just want to make one announcement. The International African Ministries Ubuntu, IAMU, uh, Professor Kaba will be speaking there on Sunday, January 13th. Close us out. Brother Gates, how are you doing? All right, all right. Thank you very much. Again, let us give uh, Dr. Jeffries and Brother Kaba a hand. Uh, Waka. And don't forget to visit him at his table in the back. Let us all stand. Hold oh, somebody's hand. Let the spirit flow from hand to breast, and from breast to breast, and heart to heart. Feel it. Feel one another. Brother Cabo was right. We are unified, we're one entity. And he mentioned Dr. Oibo and the work of Professor Oibo. We really need to put that on our hearts and minds because the universe is working. I've been watching what's happening around Obama, I really don't understand it. I'm not sure if he understands it either. And I'm not sure anybody else understands it because the universe works in some strange and mysterious ways. But who knows? Maybe Obama will reach out to Professor Ebo and they'll have a new world. That's really all that needs to happen. Is that the funding uh, that can bring forth that institution and set that institution in a way that we can begin to materialize what the universe has brought to us through his work. So we have the ability to will things into being. Up, oh, you mighty people, you can will what you will. What we will, we can bring into being. Because we are the universe. So repeat after me. We're an African people who gave the world its first understanding. Its first understanding.
first knowledge, first knowledge. the foundation of all knowledge, the foundation of, all knowledge. Of, mathematics. of mathematics, of science, of, science. of religion. religion. The greatness that we see is ours. The greatness that we see is ours. And we have come to claim it. Up, oh, you mighty people. Up, oh, you mighty people. You can be all that you dream and see. God bless you.